Welcome back, everyone. I hope your wintry goings-on are treating you well. This year's Christmas special is yet another compilation of old stories. Yes, yes, I know. You want new stories. Hey, don't throw your shoe at me. I'm working on it, I promise, but this fatherhood thing is kicking my bulbous buttocks. So enjoy this super long episode, and I'll be back soon with scary Wendigo stories or mountain monster encounters. Whichever I receive more stories of first. Just send those stories to me at darkstories.org. <laughs> now shall we begin. Oh, and Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and for the love of God, keep your shoes to yourself. Quick clarification. These are not only Christmas stories, but christmas -y stories. So they're stories that involve the holidays, winter, snow, blizzards, and all that. Enjoy. Christmas Close Encounter From Miller Location Washington, D.C. This took place last year. I work overnight for an IT company in Washington, D.C. I commute to D.C. from a small place between Fairfax County and Loudoun County, Virginia, called Stone Ridge. It's a pretty easy 45-minute commute. I had recently found out the weekend before that I would be working Christmas Eve with just myself and one other guy. Needless to say, my wife was not happy about this. So the week goes by and it's finally time for me to go to work. At the time, we were in the middle of a windstorm that had blown siding and shingles off our roof and a few other homes nearby. Before leaving, my wife asked me to take the Christmas reef off the door so that it wouldn't get blown away or damaged. So I opened the door and I placed the reef on the floor a few feet away from the entrance then closed and locked it, then went to work. Our work that night was pretty easy, with only a few calls asking us to reset passwords and account lockouts. Around 2 a.m., my wife calls. She's freaking out, demanding that I come home right away. I'm trying to get her to calm down to tell me what happened, and she explained. She had been upstairs asleep with our one-year-old son, when she heard a loud bang downstairs, followed by the cat running down and starting to mew loudly. My wife got up to grab him, thinking he was thirsty, as he had a bad habit of drinking from any water faucets around the house. When she got downstairs, she found that our front door had been forced and broken open, and what she could only describe as something like a large dog or bear standing on two legs in the front doorway with the cat hissing and keeping it at bay. She quickly grabbed the cat and ran back up the stairs, not even stopping to look back. She locked herself in the bedroom with our son and the cat, locking the door behind them. After my wife told me this, I told her that I was on my way home right away, that she should call the police right away. Needless to say, I was speeding my entire way home, thinking if a cop started chasing me, he could give me a ticket in my driveway. I managed to get home without incident and found four cop cars surrounding the house. I identified myself to the police and went to check on my wife and son and cat, who were thankfully fine, though my wife was incredibly shaken. She told me that after she had hung up with me, she heard what sounded like heavy footsteps walking through the house and the sounds of things being moved. We then went to see if anything had been stolen, which everything was still there, thankfully. However, the reef that I had put beside the door had been moved to the living room and placed on my son's toy box. Several of his presents had also been moved from our living room to the kitchen. The police stated that our house was one of five homes to have been broken in that night, and it had been blamed on the wind opening the front door. Although wind wouldn't explain how the reef and presents had been moved. That day, I went to Home Depot and reinforced all the doors and windows. Whatever this animal was, the next time we meet, 
I'll be behind a 12 gauge and I'll be ready to protect my family. Christmas Eve Stranger from The Goth Mistress 13. Location Unknown. I've been with my fiance Austin for three years. We dated for maybe two months before moving in together as I was still 17 and in high school. A month before the end of my senior year, he moved in with my parents and I due to a falling out with his brother. Then about four days before my graduation, we got our first house together. It wasn't amazing or beautiful by any means, but it was ours. It wasn't in the best neighborhood, but it was cheap. The roof on the place was really old, the basement leaked, and all the windows were busted out. Not to mention the siding along the driveway had been spray-painted. But we slowly repaired it and made it much more livable. About six months into living there, that's when the weirdness began to happen. I told myself at first that it was just the house settling, or I was getting spooked because I was in a new place. Some mornings, my clothes that I had laid out on the dresser were in a pile on the floor, or scattered and thrown about the room, and when I'd be home alone, I would hear the floorboards in the hallway creak like someone was walking on them, and it would only happen when I was alone. Multiple times, I thought I would catch something out of the corner of my eye, and when I would turn to look, it would be gone. I never said anything to my fiancé, because I thought he would tell me it's nothing. Until one day, I saw him staring at the dark bedroom from the middle of the hallway, and I called out to him. He jumped and looked at me with fear in his eyes. Where did you just come from? He asked me, his voice a bit shaky. I came inside from the back porch. Why? I just saw you standing in the dark in the bedroom. When I asked you what you were doing, you just stood there and didn't even acknowledge me, he said. Then, when I heard the back door shut, I looked that way. But when I looked back toward the bedroom, you were just gone. I watched him suddenly glance back to the darkened bedroom. Babe, I swear I was outside, I told him. Plus, you know I'm a bit afraid of the dark. I wouldn't just stand in it for no reason. I inched closer to him and hugged him as I said that. When the next horrifying incident happened, it was only a week before Christmas. Now, I'm a very festive person, so there was always some sort of light on in the house, whether that's just one of the house lights or some decorations inside or out. Specifically, I had laid out some lights down the hallway to illuminate the path to the bathroom. One night in particular, I was super exhausted. I had just gotten home from work. I was settling in on the couch to watch some videos on YouTube, but I ended up passing out only a few minutes in. Suddenly, I woke up to a deep silence in the house. I always had some sort of fan or white noise on in the background to relax myself, but for some odd reason, it was now silent in the house and all the lights had been turned off. I tried to use my phone to illuminate the area, but as I pressed the home button, it showed that my battery was at zero. Great, I thought, realizing the situation I was in. All the clocks in the house were digital, so I didn't even know what time it was, because, again, the electricity seemed to be off. I was too scared to move at this point, it was too dark, dark enough for something or someone to hide right next to you, and you wouldn't even know it. I stayed still, breathing slowly and trying to listen to any sounds around me. After a few minutes, I began to hear the creak of the basement stairs. Crap, I thought, I don't think I locked the basement door when I made it home. I didn't wait to find out, so I bolted for my bedroom, slamming and locking the door as I heard the basement door suddenly slam open, followed by fast footsteps going down the hallway. I pressed my body against the door and sunk down, gripping my phone to my chest and trying to control my breathing. 
Whoever it was had gone into the other bedroom first and was now scratching on the door. Shortly after, I heard whoever it was banging around in there. Then it went quiet, but not entirely quiet, because I could hear something creeping over to the door, the door I was leaning against. I clapped a hand over my mouth, muffling a cry or scream, when suddenly something banged right against the door. It was scratching and beating against it. It or they knew I was in here. I could hear something in my mind telling me that if I let this thing inside, I would never see my fiancé again. I kept myself pressed to the door for what felt like hours. Finally, I heard that creeping sound again, but it seemed to be walking away, creeping back to the basement. Suddenly, the glow of the hallway lights beneath my door appeared. The lights had come back on. I looked down at my phone and the bright Apple screen came up. It was powering back on. Its battery was nearly full and I had a ton of missed calls and messages from my fiance, wondering why my phone was off and what was going on. It was only 1 a.m. He was still at work closing up. I turned on the flashlight on my phone now, standing up and carefully opened the door. I was horrified to find there was nothing, absolutely nothing, like it all had gone on in my mind and not in reality. I grabbed my vape, my phone, and a knife from my purse, and I sat outside in the cold until Austin came home. I told him, and he didn't believe me. I was terrified to be in that house alone anymore, but unfortunately that night did not mark the end of my suffering and torment. On Christmas Eve, I waited in my car as long as I deemed it necessary until I had the courage to enter the house. It was completely black inside again, and I was scared. I took my flashlights I had near the door and turned them on facing the kitchen. Three candles were lit and placed on the floor next to me, and I held Austin's air rifle in my hands. With every noise, I would pump the air rifle and mentally dare anything to come out. At about 11.55, I heard something start running around outside the house, banging on the windows and doors. I had intentionally left a door unlocked in the kitchen that led outside, prepared for whatever came for me through it. Suddenly, the back door burst open and a figure raced into the kitchen. I fired the air rifle. The figure tripped and fell on the floor groaning, and only then did I realize it was Austin. He had come home from work early to surprise and scare me. He lay on the floor groaning, cursing me as I helped him up. This time it was him and I was so relieved, but when I asked him about banging on the windows outside, he said that it wasn't him that did it. From now on, I'm determined to be ready for whatever that thing is. Creepy Christmas Burglar from Elise Location, England. It was Christmas Eve of 2012, and it was just a normal yet exciting day for me, only being seven at the time. I lived with my mom, dad, three older sisters and one younger sister, and my dog. We lived in a small town in England, so everyone pretty much knew each other, which sort of makes this story a bit more creepy. So it was Christmas Eve, and me and my family had settled down for a quiet night filled with Christmas movies and candy. You know, the sort of things that make you feel Christmassy. It was around 9 p.m., and me and my older sister, who was nine at the time, couldn't sleep out of excitement. Being so young, we were the types of kids who loved Christmas and always wanted to see Santa whenever possible. We stayed up that night, giggling and smiling and determined to catch a glimpse of Santa. Time passed and me and my sister were both getting very tired. We were starting to doze off. By then, I couldn't be sure what time it was. I was asleep in my sister's bed when I was suddenly shaken awake by her. I was surprised by this and I was kind of annoyed as I was in a deep sleep already. 
but my sister shushed me. I asked her what she was doing, and she said she had heard someone downstairs. My eyes widened. I was beaming with excitement now, remembering it was now Christmas Day, so my seven-year-old self knew it just had to be Santa. When I suggested to my sister that it must be Santa, she also widened her eyes, as if to say she agreed. I told her quickly we should go downstairs to see, but my sister insisted that if Santa saw that we were still awake, that he would take back our presents. I was a little annoyed at this, but I reluctantly agreed. So we sat there waiting in suspense to hear him, and sure enough, we heard what appeared to be footsteps coming from downstairs. I got a little shiver of excitement at this, so me and my sister crawled under the covers and quietly laughed in happiness. But that's when things got weird. My oldest two cousins slowly in the dark came into our room with my little sister. Their faces were ghostly pale and told us that we had to go and play hide from Santa in the bathroom, which was attached to our bedroom. I was confused, but again I agreed thinking it was so Santa wouldn't know we were awake. When we got into the bathroom, my sisters went into the airing cupboard, placing quilts into the bath and told us to lay on them and get some sleep. So confused but in a tired state, we proceeded to do so. We woke up in the morning in my parents' bed, which was even more weird. But even weirder, my parents were awake at the edge of the bed. I woke up and exclaimed, Merry Christmas. This made my parents jump. I quickly woke up my sisters and proceeded to nag my parents before they finally took us downstairs to the living room to open our presents. Everything was normal that day, and we had a fun time. But a few days ago, I remembered this encounter as Christmas is in a few weeks from writing this, and my mom decided I was old enough now. Old enough to know. My mom began to tell me that me and my sister had really heard something else that night. My older sisters were awakened by the same noise. Being older, they knew something was wrong. So quietly, my older sister wanted to check out what it was. She slowly snuck down to the stairs and peered into the front room, where she saw a figure who was standing by the tree messing with the gifts. My older sisters, being shocked, snuck back upstairs and grabbed us and rushed us into the bathroom to protect us. That's when one of my older sisters rang up 999, our version of 911, to get help. She was too afraid to go get my parents, thinking that the stranger downstairs would hear her. Only when she heard police did she go to wake up my parents. My dad ran downstairs to see police handcuffing the man. But it wasn't just any man. It was my neighbor, an odd neighbor, that always looked at us with a weird expression. My dad was so angry at this, he pressed charges. I'm very thankful for my brave sister, and I'm glad my younger sister kept me from going downstairs that night. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here. Santa is in the basement. From Jessica M. Location unknown. This happened when I was 12. It was late December, Christmas time, and my parents and my aunt were on a vacation to Hawaii. But my cousins, Elijah, Castile, and Blake were at my house with me, all of us having a big sleepover. By 12 that night, everyone was asleep, except for me, Elijah, and Dean. Dean is my twin. We were watching the night shift on Netflix when Dean said he needed to go use the bathroom. I told him that the one across from mom and dad's bedroom was broken, so he'd have to use the one upstairs. He grumbled a bit, but said okay. Nobody really liked using the upstairs bathroom because it's next to the door that goes to the attic, and the attic is quite creepy. After he went to use the bathroom, Elijah then got up and made some popcorn. As the other two were now gone, I decided to get my laptop from the dining room. After I got my laptop, I looked over toward Elijah. I saw him standing there, just staring out the window. I went over and asked him what was wrong. 
He said he saw somebody walking towards the basement door. He said that they had walked inside. I began to panic, but I didn't want to frighten everyone, so I just told him it was okay. I said I'd go get Dean, and I brought up that the door from the basement inside the house was locked, so he couldn't get further than the basement. There should be no way that anyone was getting inside. Elijah and I ran up the stairs to the bathroom and pounded on the door. Dean opened up and asked what was wrong. I explained to him what Elijah saw. Dean told us to just go into the bedroom with the other kids and lock the door, and that he would join us soon, or just stay in the bathroom. After grabbing a couple of flashlights, Elijah and I had a very bad and childish idea. Before going to lock ourselves in the bedroom, we were going to take a peek at who was in the basement. We were kids. I don't think we really grasped the danger of this situation. So we went to the top of the basement where the door was. Slowly, with the flashlights on, we opened the door and peered down to the bottom of the stairs. And there, we saw someone looking back at us. And I swear to God, he was wearing a Santa costume. We slammed the door locked it back, and ran up the steps. We locked ourselves in the room with everyone else and prayed that the man could not break out of the basement. We could hear him pounding on the basement door. I don't know how the others were still asleep through this. We suddenly hear a breaking sound, and the next thing we know, we hear footsteps coming toward the bedroom door. So someone hops on the phone with our Uncle Drew, he said that he was at a long shift at the hospital nearby, and if he left right away, it would take him half an hour to be there. He said instead he was going to call Rick. About 10 minutes and dozens of bangs at the door later, we get a call from Uncle Rick, and he said he had just talked to Drew, and that he'd be there in moments. So he must have been speeding because they live half an hour away as well. In literal seconds after the call, we hear Uncle Rick pull up in the driveway. The sounds from outside the door had stopped, and I believe the man may have been spooked from someone pulling up in the driveway. So I look under the crack beneath the door, and I see that the hallway is now empty. Taking the opportunity, we all rush downstairs and into the driveway, piling into Uncle Rick's car. As we were pulling away, being taken back to Rick's and Drew's place, I found out that the guy, the stranger in the Santa suit, had not been spooked away because he was now running up the driveway like a maniac. Of course, we outran him, and within half an hour, we were back at Rick and Drew's house, preparing to go to bed in his guest bedroom after an exhausting and terrifying night. Rick said he'd be working on getting a police report filed as soon as possible. If Uncle Rick hadn't come over, if someone didn't make it in time, I don't know what would have become of us because that basement door did not hold and that bedroom door wasn't going to hold for long either. I'm glad I'm still here in one piece, but now my Christmases have been tinged. Christmas Time Tragedy Submitted to and read by Swamp Dweller from... Cheyenne L. I've been dreading sharing this story as the memories, they're really hard to relive. My family and I were involved in a shooting. It was December 20th, 1993 in Berwick, Maine where these events happened. They lasted until about the 21st or 22nd. However, I was 14 when this happened, and my father was no longer in my family or my life. To give you an idea of the layout of where we lived, before you walk into our apartment, you have to go into a room with a staircase that leads up. Our door is the last one on the right when you're facing the front entrance. When you first enter our apartment, you will start in the living room, followed by the kitchen. To the left is the bathroom, and through a doorway past the kitchen is my brother's room. Through my brother's room and another doorway is my room, while in the back of my room to the left is the back exit out of the apartment itself. Now that I've got a setup out of the way, I'll explain the story itself. It was Christmas break, 
and it had been snowing rather heavily. We just finished having my brother's birthday party, and as such there was my mom, three brothers, myself, and our neighbor's son, we'll call him Johnny. Johnny and I were the same age, went to the same school, and he had a crush on me. All the kids were in my brother's room working on a puzzle when I wanted to ask my mom a question. She was in the living room. I should also add there's a window above the kitchen sink which will be important later. And I headed in before asking my mom something. I soon noticed a sound as I walked by the kitchen but I ignored it. I soon head back to my brother's room when I hear the noise again. I turned to my mom and asked her if she heard the noise as well. She confirmed it and she had me being the dumb 14 year old I was at the time and I wanted to go see if it happened again, I walked to the window. I walked by and again we heard the noise. Curious, I asked my mom what she thought the sound was. She told me it was probably just kids playing around with firecrackers. She just asked me what I thought it was and I told her I honestly had no clue. I then shrugged and kept going towards my brother's room at which point I heard that firecracker sound several more times. I turned back and asked my mom if she still thought it was firecrackers as I thought it sounded more like a gun at this point. She told me whoever was making the noise was going too far, and she'd go to her friends to use their phone to call the police, as we did not have a phone at the time. I was instructed not to leave or open the door for anyone except for her, but i know it was her because she'd knock twice and give me a signal. It was at this point she locked the door behind her and headed to her friends. My brothers must have known something was wrong because when I saw them again they had a worried look on their faces. I instructed them and Johnny to crawl to the bathroom and once I grab my one year old brother I'll join them, locking the door behind me. I figured things would be safer this way as there were only two tiny windows that no adults could fit through in that room. We stayed quiet and listened outside. It had only been a minute when I heard several more popping sounds. My brothers began crying and I'll admit, although I kept a brave face, I was absolutely terrified on the inside. I couldn't shake the thought of my mom being out there and was worried that she could be shot or worse right now. Worried about my mother, I handed my little brother to Johnny and said I'd check on my mom. I peeked through the windows of the kitchen and didn't see my mom which led me to believe I might have overreacted about the entire situation. Just as I was about to calm down I heard knocking at the door which made me jump. Johnny gave me a look as though asking of what we should do. I wasn't sure what to do. The knocking continued and I know it wasn't my mom. Johnny came out and stood next to me as another knock came at the door. Johnny finally asked who it was, at which point a deep male voice said, It's me. Johnny, unsure of who it was, asking him who the hell was me, the voice said again, It's me, Kevin. I turned to Johnny and said it was okay as Kevin was my stepdad. Johnny opened the door at which point Kevin asked if we were hearing the popping sounds. We said yes before Kevin told us to go with him to their place until my mom got back. We agreed and just as I was about to leave I saw my mom's friend Bear out in the street. Assuming that meant things were okay, I told Johnny to go with my brothers and rushed out to meet Bear. I asked Bear if he had seen my mom at which point he said yeah, she's on the phone with the police right now. I hugged Bear before standing slightly to his left at which point I noticed he was eyeing a house near the garage. What happened next gave me nightmares. I heard the sound of a gun. Bear grabbed my right arm and then I heard another sound and blood splattered on me. Bear told me to run as he fell to the ground screaming in pain. He'd been shot in the left cheek. I, I ran and busted through Johnny's door, crying, shaking and hyperventilating. I'm asthmatic. As I fell to my knees crying, this was when I met Wendy who would become my best friend. She asked me who the hell I was before I started screaming about being her neighbor and Bear getting shot in the face. Wendy hung up the phone she was on and her parents came into the room. Everything after this is a bit hazy on the account of my being in shock and traumatized from witnessing someone get shot in front of me. Wendy took me upstairs to change clothes and was trying to say something to me, but I just couldn't hear her for some reason. Everything was like muffled. My mom showed up at the neighbors before bringing us home but I don't remember when or how. I remember my brother, 
whose birthday it was, throwing up in the toilet in our apartment. The paramedics were trying to get to us at one point, but they couldn't because the shooter was shooting at anything that moved at the time. I was rocking back and forth staring into a mirror, shocked when I noticed a man in the mirror. The man looked to be in his 40s, somewhat heavy set, messy hair down to his ears, brown eyes, and appeared unshaven. We were in the bathroom for hours. I'm not sure how many, but the police kept calling, which is how my mom found out the ambulance couldn't get to us. I also heard they searched Bear and reached him. He was still alive, but in critical condition. This calmed me somewhat, terrifying all of us. I was, I was just so afraid that he might not make it. Suddenly, the door burst open and creeped us all out. It turned out to be SWAT, thankfully. Although afraid, I began feeling safer knowing it was all finally going to be over. We eventually snuck to my bedroom before the gunman began firing again. The police kept us safe, again. We were pinned for what felt like hours. At some point, the sun came up. I had no concept of time at this point as I was very much in shock. Trauma makes everything feel like a dream. It's the best way I can describe it to anyone who's never been in this situation before where they're traumatized and there isn't anything you can truly do. It's actually a defense mechanism of the brain, I guess. It can lead to PTSD, among other things. My mind had checked out at this point. It only snapped again when I watched a tree shatter when a bullet went through it. Honestly, part of me didn't want to believe this, and part of me pondered on how many guns the gunman had. The family was scared, and I was, I was definitely scared as well. My mind just wasn't fully processing it at the moment. I held my one-year-old brother singing to him and reassuring him it'd be fine, and we wouldn't let anything happen to him. Eventually, my brother drifted off to sleep. And sometime after, I'm not sure how long, the police told us they would be moving us to Town Hall, which was close by our apartment. The cops informed us to stick close to the vehicles and them. They said to keep low and move when they did. After some time, it was finally time to move. The moment we all moved in unison with the police, the gunmen opened fire again. I remember the police firing back and the sound of bullets whizzing by from the police and the gunmen. I remember being terrified and numb all at once. At one point, we got behind some vehicles, and as bullets ricocheted, we heard one hit the tire and pop it. As we approached Town Hall, I saw news reporters and people looking afraid. I forgot about the blanket the police had put around me before leaving our home, and tripped over it in chaos. I didn't get up immediately and remember people freaking out, thinking I'd been shot. The truth was, I was embarrassed by tripping, and I'd hit my head pretty hard on the fall. A police officer eventually picked me up and began running. We eventually were cornered by the media who was trying to talk to my mom and I, and it was a little overwhelming, but I remember feeling some semblance of safety again. In time, we made it to the paramedics, and I remember someone of some importance reassuring us that we were safe now. It could have been the mayor. He was dressed sharply enough. Once we arrived at our SIP, shelter in place, they had gym mats out, and after our pizza, some attempt at play, and the eventual sudden downing of things, I crashed. My sleep wasn't uninterrupted as I woke up any time I heard gunfire, but once the gunfire lessened and eventually stopped, I felt an array of feelings and exhaustion overcome me. We were finally, truly safe. I cried myself back to sleep and a nightmare woke me up and eventually we went home again. There was a heaviness in the air when we returned to our apartment. We hadn't fully processed everything that we had went through yet. The apartment never felt the same after that day. I remember being irrationally pissed when I went back to my room. It was a mess, the door had been kicked off the hinges and never truly shut right after that, even when fixed. My curtains were destroyed and everything was trashed. I found out later that the police had used my room as a staging ground of sorts. Bear thankfully made a full recovery from his injuries. Well. The physical ones, anyway. I found out years later that he was never the same after being shot. Then again, I'm still not the same today myself. I don't blame Bear one bit for being messed up. Remember the man in the mirror? I described him to Wendy, and she explained I'd given the description of the shooter to the finest details. I don't recall having seen the shooter at all, but perhaps maybe I did. 
The mime would do strange things to you while in shock. When the break was over and we went back to school, the kids kept asking us questions about what happened. We couldn't deal with it, and I went to the office, called my mom and left. The school told us to take as long as we needed, and we took months off as a result. When the information eventually came out that it turned out that our neighbor across the way was the shooter, his name was Patrick Wood, he was ex-military and the police had thrown tear gas into his home, but he had not left. Later on, they realized he hadn't left because he had a gas mask on. Inside his home, they found tons of weapons and ammunition. He dug a tunnel out from his house to his shed, where his weapons were, and he'd used that to restock and reload when he was completely out of ammunition. The man also had several medications strewn all over the place. During the time I was with Bayer, I heard a whirring sound on the first bullet. It turned out that it was the sound of a bullet narrowly missing my head. I'm lucky to be alive to share this story with you. Patrick was terminally ill with cancer and his wife left with their kids. I'd imagine that's why he did what he did. I passed no judgment on his wife. It isn't her fault she snapped. I believe she had good reasons for leaving with their kids. It's going to sound crazy, but please hear me out when I say I empathize with Patrick in a way. He'd lost everything, and placing myself in his shoes, while I probably wouldn't have done what he did, I do see things from his perspective. Some part of me feels if the guy wanted me dead, he wouldn't have missed me with the headshots. I don't think he actually wanted me dead, and I can only speculate it might have just been because he thought of his daughter maybe. It's only speculation and we'll never know, as he was shot and now he's dead. Patrick was amazingly the only person to die during the shooting. I feel bad he died, and since the events of that day, I feel safe nowhere. Any loud popping or sudden sound send me into a panic. Sometimes I feel a cold sweat or hyperventilating. I only leave my home when I have to. I'm suspicious of anyone I come across, and I'm always looking over my shoulder at people. My insomnia is a lot worse, and I'm an introvert since that day. All of this is a result of PTSD. I've had several years of therapy, but it's never completely solved the PTSD issue. It has helped me process things to a degree, but I'm still messed up and mentally broken as a result of my experiences. This is something you can't unsee. This is something you can't see on the outside, either. It's internal, and I try to put on a brave face around people. I believe you can outwardly show fear to people as some people will immediately see you as prey. Thank you for letting me share this with you all, and thank you to anyone who listens to it. Please be safe out there. The Boiler Room Submitted by Rob Hobgoblin I've lived in this house for three years, and I hate going anywhere in it, except for the living room. It's an eerie place, and even still, it bothers me. Anyway, my aunt every year sends me presents through the mail as she travels the country. Sometimes I get it early, sometimes late, but on this occasion, it arrived the day before Christmas Eve. Inside the package itself, the gift was wrapped. It was lovely, with beautiful, tessellating wrapping paper, the kind you don't want to rip into and would rather keep for yourself. Now, keep in mind that my aunt, when she's traveling, gets all these weird things from yard sales from all over the country, and I never really cared. It wasn't just getting someone's yard sale scraps. I was a big believer of the philosophy, one man's trash is another man's treasure. So my aunt's gifts were always exciting. So let's get back to me unwrapping it. I tore away at the beautiful wrapping paper, and as soon as the inner box was exposed, a mildewy stench reeked out of it. It made me gag, but I kept going. Trying to get over the smell, I began to open the box to reveal an old porcelain doll. It had dark, curly brown hair with blue eyes, it came with two separate outfits as well. One was an old tattered blue dress with flower designs on it, with lace trim and a straw sun hat, as well as a light blue ribbon on the hat. The other one that looked newer 
with less faded colors, was a pair of denim overalls and a light pink plaid shirt. She had also come with shoes, two pairs in fact. One looked newer than the other. The older ones looked very well worn. Her face was dusted with dirt and was chipped around her pretty little lips. I ran upstairs and placed her on my dresser. Somewhere she'd stand out. She had a very antique look to her and I enjoyed that, so I wanted her to be displayed out in the open. Then I went back stairs to text my aunt to thank you and to catch up a little bit. Later that day, I slipped over at my friend's house. Now, no matter what holiday it is or isn't, me and my friend are usually over at each other's houses. But she'll never sleep at my place because in her words, which I have to agree with, she says it has weird vibes to it. Anyway, my mom dropped me off that night and I slept over at her place. The next morning, my mom came and got me. When she took me home, my mom said she had found my doll in the boiler room, which was attached to the bathroom laundry room on a completely different floor. And I said, that's strange. I put it in my bedroom before I left. Maybe the cat dragged it there. She does have a history of dragging things where they don't belong, and my mom just nodded in agreement. It was Christmas Eve, and wouldn't you know it, my parents had to work that day. I couldn't tell you how much bull that was. So in the evening, I was alone at home, watching TV in the living room. My cat was in my lap, when my dog suddenly started barking at the door to the bathroom. That door was always shut, unless I had to do laundry and kept coming back to it. I yelled at my dog to get him to stop barking, but he didn't stop, so I decided to get up and check it out. I looked over toward the bathroom, which I knew I had previously shut, and the light should have been off, but now the door was hanging open slightly, and the light was on. I walked right back to my spot on the couch in the living room, because I was immediately scared by that sight. Being alone in this house freaked me out enough. Now, strange things were happening. When I gathered enough courage to go back, I was slow, and my heart was beating incredibly fast. I just ran into the bathroom, quickly, like ripping off a band-aid. You don't want to do it so you might as well get it over in a flash. Sure enough, I saw it, and I nearly screamed. My doll was sitting next to the metal door that leads to the boiler room. I grabbed it right away. I found the box, and I put it back in. And luckily, the box had latches on it, and I made sure to contain it completely. Instead of putting the thing away in my closet or something, I refused to let go of it. I wrapped it in my arms, making sure that the doll couldn't get out, not while I was alone at least. Once my parents were home and I wasn't scared anymore, not as much, I went outside to the shed and I threw the box inside, not caring if any of it broke. Then I shut the shed door. I hesitantly turned back toward the house and I went inside. That wasn't the last time I saw that doll. There were several other times where I found the doll trying to get into the boiler room for one reason or another. I wanted to believe it was my father pranking me, but he wasn't the man to do these things. He was quiet, maintained. He'd never pranked me before in the past so I had no idea what was really going on, why that doll, if it was alive, wanted in the boiler room. This strange activity didn't stop, not until I took a hammer and broke its face. I didn't even bury the pieces in one place. I scattered them around the area in different holes, and luckily, I haven't seen the doll since, and I hope it stays that way. My recent checkup, submitted by Barrett Doolittle.
This story goes back pretty far. When I was in sixth grade, we moved into what is my current house. I was being homeschooled at the time. Because of that, I had to get a new pediatrician. We'll call her Dr. S for privacy reasons. Physically, I was pretty healthy, so I didn't always go to my yearly physicals because they were unnecessary most of the time. The only times I ever did was to be sure to get my vaccinations. Dr. S was okay, I guess. Because she was a pediatrician, she was used to working with younger kids than myself. So when she would ask me questions about my health, she would say it funny, asking things like how my boom booms were. It was extremely childish and to my liking, to be honest. Over time, I found her to be quite reactionary. In eighth grade, like a lot of teenage girls, I had very low blood pressure and was passing out a lot. I had a checkup with Dr. S. When I told her about what was going on, she flipped out, saying I must see a cardiologist right away to get my heart scanned and monitored. My mom knew it wasn't heart problems because the week prior, we went to Italy and we had climbed to the top of Duomo in Florence and the Tower of Pisa. I figured if I had heart problems, I would have known something by now or I wouldn't have been able to do something like that. But I still went to a cardiologist and it turned out I had low levels of sodium. After that, because I didn't need any vaccinations for a while, I didn't need to see Dr. S for a long time. During middle school, I dealt with severe anxiety, which led to depression, which then led to my thoughts of self-harm. When freshman year rolled around, it got so bad, I thought that taking my own life was the only way to stop my anxiety. I was always terrified of my surroundings. I would randomly wake up in the middle of the night and I would be unable to fall back to sleep because the anxiety seemed to be rushing through my veins. I was always really struggling with my social life. I was having trouble communicating with people. Because of this, my mom took me to a psychiatrist. I took several different tests and I was diagnosed with anxiety and Asperger syndrome, which is a minor form of autism. I was then put on Prozac, which shortly after, started giving me extreme headaches. I was then switched to another kind. I don't remember what it was called. It helped me with my appetite, my sleepiness, and eventually my thoughts of self-harm went away. Shortly after being put on the second medication, I entered public high school as a sophomore. I was able to blend in pretty quickly with all kinds of amazing people, people I now called friends. The homework load would stress me out a lot as I was taking advanced classes and all. I must point out that all my life, I've never been good at handling stress. So this led to a lot of anger and other things. Soon the side effects of my meds caught up with me and I gained 30 pounds in two months flat. I told one of my teachers that I was going to hurt myself and I got sent home by my counselor that day. I went back to the psychiatrist, who then took me off those medications, and oddly enough, I haven't dealt with any anxiety since then. Here's where the story takes a turn for the worst. Winter break came, and I had to get more vaccinations, so my mom arranged a physical with Dr. S. When I was there, I was given this survey where I had to answer questions about how I was doing mentally. Before that, I noticed that Dr. S had been giving these hateful glares to my mother. When we were alone in her office to take the survey, she said some off-putting and weird things to me. I want to make sure you're safe, she said, running her fingers through my hair and staring straight into my eyes. I know what's going on, she whispered. I tried to ignore it, and I began to answer the survey. Now, I didn't realize it was asking about my current state of mind, so I answered them based on my past feelings 
A way to sum it all up, as this was the first time we'd been back to her office in a long time. For example, where I'd asked if I'd ever attempted to hurt myself, I of course answered yes. I took the whole survey thinking like that. When I was done, I hesitantly gave it back to Dr. S, and when she saw it, she began to cry. She looked back at me with tears in her eyes. She bit her lip and then stormed out of the room. She confronted my mother, barraging her with questions and accusations, screaming things like, this is your fault. You're unfit to be a mother. She deserves better. I could do better. Now, parents aren't allowed to see the survey or the child's answers, so my poor mother had no idea what was going on. My mom told her we were going to therapy this whole time, seeing doctors and psychiatrists. And at the time, as I watched it all unfold, socially awkward me had no idea what to do or say. When we were leaving the office, storming away from a screaming and shouting Dr. S with this maniacal look in her eyes, I saw that my mother's face was both scared and worried. She told me that on those surveys, they found something suspicious and apparently Dr. S reported it to the police, apparently for my safety. This only made me more anxious, more worried. Only a few days later, it was Christmas Eve, and I couldn't even enjoy myself. For one, I was worried about what Dr. S was going to do, and two, the way she'd been acting towards me. It scared me. I saw her face in my mind when I tried to sleep, and it just creeped me out enough to keep me awake. Anyway, in the middle of the day, my dad answered the door with a Merry Christmas and let the person inside. It was a woman who worked with CPS, as well as Dr. S herself. These were the people who were notified due to some supposed medical neglect. The whole time Dr. S was there, she was pointing fingers and accusing us of different things, all the while staring at me with all too wide eyes and a toothy, lipsticked grin. Luckily, the agent there was very calm and collected. She asked my family a lot of questions, and my parents answered honestly. And by the time it was over and done with, she said that there was no need to keep going, concluding that my parents had been doing their jobs, and that Dr. S needs to calm down and let parents be parents. Dr. S was still wearing that smile, and I could see her eyebrow twitching. She started to scratch the top of her hand as they both left our home. What in the world? I shrugged off that weirdness, happy that Christmas was basically saved, that I wasn't going to be taken away from my home on Christmas Eve, which was what I was afraid of. My parents were upset about the situation, but not with me, thank God. I know this isn't really scary, but it is very messed up, especially if you put yourself in that kind of situation. My parents have never done anything to let me suffer, and they've always been there for me when I needed help. Even still, I can't get over what happened, partly because my mom wants me to tough out one more physical with Dr. S, even though I can barely face her anymore and partly because not too long after Christmas, I learned that Dr. S had lost her child, and I understood then that what I was seeing in her face, it wasn't only loss, that woman had become unhinged, something had snapped inside of her, rather than someone who was completely worried about a child. I'm just ready to get the next vaccination over with, The Ghost at Target, submitted by Raphael J. I've worked at Target for about two years now. The one I work at is less than a mile away from a newer one, isn't that crazy, that opened up in about 2007. Mine, of course, is much, much older, 
and I've been told that the place is, in fact, haunted. A haunted target, would you believe it? Even I didn't, at first. But lots of weird things have happened, like people hearing voices over the talkies at night, or seeing things after closing. But nothing major had happened to me, besides a light I'd just turned off switching back a few seconds later. See, I've worked all over the store, and at the time I was working as one of the cart pushers. You would think something creepy would have happened late at night in the dark parking lot, but me, I have that hostile look on my face nearly 24 seven. It's just the way I am. So I wasn't very approachable, not even to the people that might have been the creepiest and worst kind of people. But the moment Christmas was only a few weeks away, they put me back on the cells floor, back face to face with people. A few days before Christmas, when everything was crazy and hectic, we were finally getting ready to close after a long day. It was that point in the night when the announcements came on to tell the guests to make their final selections because we were closing. Soon we were locking up the front doors and once we do that, we patrol the store and check the aisles, making sure everyone was really gone. Only a few of us were left to get that done. Most of the crew had already gone home because they're not really required. I checked the bathrooms and the area I'd been working in, and I went to report to the LOD, or leader on duty, named Jin, to let her know my areas were all clear and that we could start zoning the store. Just as I walk up to her and a couple of other coworkers, we suddenly hear something echoing from the back of the building where the lights had already been turned off. It was laughing the sound of kids playing and laughing. We all looked at each other, and my friend Juan and I decided we should make sure we didn't miss someone, because it sounded like we had a couple of stowaways. I played the stealth card and moved fast along the back wall, checking each aisle, while Juan decided to call out, using the intercoms to say, if there's anyone still inside the building, please, we're closed. I searched and searched, but I couldn't find a single soul. So I went back to Juan and I told him. It must have been the ghost, man. I joked and laughed. Whatever, he replied. As we made another lap along the racetrack of aisles, searching once more before meeting back up with Jin. Again, we didn't find anyone or anything. But just as we were sure that we were just hearing things and about to leave for home, we heard something else get again. Get out, get out, this time get out, it was clear get out. As day. Get out, get out, get out, get out, get out. The voice boomed from the back of the store from the very same spot as before. And the moment we heard it, all of us jumped and my body was covered in goosebumps. It was so sudden, so terrifyingly low and loud that I was left shaking in fear even after the store went silent again. We left in a hurry after that. Later that week, I come in for my shift and I run into Jin. I joked with her again about the ghost of Target, although I was still racked with nerves about what we'd experienced. I think joking was my way of coping. She forced out a fake laugh and said with a stutter, it was just probably one of the team members having a bad night. Uh, someone was just trying to scare us is all. I don't think I believed her. On Christmas Eve of that year, we were open until noon. And when the store was closing, I was closing again. I was walking the cells floor, once more making sure that we were guest free. I walked past an aisle and I could have sworn I saw someone. I turn around and I go tell them that we're closing and that they should be heading out now. I reach the aisle that I just saw someone walk down and the aisle is completely empty. And as I stood there, staring down an empty aisle on Christmas Eve, I felt the breathing going down my neck. It was cold, colder than the chilly weather from outside and it paralyzed me. 
all at once. In a quick burst of flimsy courage, I turned around to see who was behind me, but no one was there. I closed up the store at a record speed, and I left. I still work there, and I hate closing more than ever. I see things out of the corners of my eyes, hoping that it's just someone still shopping at our store. But I know better, and I dread the day that I hear that voice telling us to get out again. Almost Taken on Christmas Submitted by Emily R. As a child, I never once believed those cautionary tales, those scary stories with meanings. I always thought they were just that, just stories, that nothing would ever happen to me. I was very, very wrong. When I was 15, I was an experienced hitchhiker. Yeah, I know it sounds dangerous, but I never really ran into problems, and it was a fun way to meet new people see new places. Of course, I did have the occasional run-in with weirdos, but my experiences were nothing, nothing compared to the stories I've been told. And that was until the day that changed my mind forever. It was Christmas Eve. I'd spent the day with my best friend at her house in the next town over. Since she lives a fair distance away, I usually take the bus home but on this day in particular, I stayed later than usual, and I ended up missing the last bus back home. I didn't want to intrude on my friend's family, so I decided to go ahead and leave, despite missing my bus. I began walking in the direction of my town. I knew I couldn't make it all the way home, so I held my thumb out to every car that passed. Most of them passed me up without even a second glance. Most people do that. But after 20 minutes of walking, I finally caught someone's attention. A black car slowed to a stop beside me. I couldn't tell you the make or model. The passenger window rolled down as I approached. I peered through the now open window to see a nice looking elderly man. Since he appeared non-threatening, I climbed into the passenger side. He greeted me with a sweet smile and asked me where I was headed. As I had some experience with hitchhiking, I knew not to give my exact address, so I gave him an address on a neighboring street. He began to go off in the direction of the town I lived in. The ride was going well for the most part. He told me about his life growing up to make conversation, serving in the military when his country needed him, and some other tidbits. He genuinely seemed like a good guy. He was just a little lonely. He began talking about his wife, how she had recently passed. He even said that I reminded him of her. At first, I thought it was a sweet sentiment that he was able to connect with someone and reminisce over his late wife. It made me happy that I could bring him joy over it. However, after a few moments, the conversation took a turn for the worse. He began talking about how young I look, how tight my skin was, how sexy I was. I was a bit put off by those statements, but decided to just let it go. That was until I felt his hand on my thigh. I was completely mortified. I heard him whispering to himself. It sounded like he was saying a prayer. He was thanking God for leaving me on the side of the road, where he could find me, his little gift from the heavens. I pushed his hand off of me, which caused him to grow angry and impatient. He squeezed my thigh hard, making me shout in pain. He then told me to be quiet, to be a good little girl for Christmas, which only made him appear more psychotic. I was scared beyond belief, what had I gotten myself into? At this point, I was mentally freaking out, trying to think of some way to get out of this situation. I looked out the window to see where we were. I recognized the area, realized we weren't far from the school that I attend. 
We were still a fair distance from my house, so I decided this was my best option. Bracing myself, I threw open the door and rolled out of the car, crashing onto the ground hard. The impact knocked the breath out of me, but with a rush of adrenaline, I took off down a narrow alleyway toward the school. I could hear the man slamming on his brakes, and he was yelling for me, but I didn't dare look back. I ran the two blocks to get to the school, praying that he wouldn't see me. No one in this town really drives this late, so whenever I heard his car engine, I assumed it was him, and I dove into the nearest bushes, gasping for air as quietly as I could. I'd never been more scared in my life, and all I could think about was what was going to happen to me, that if I had just listened to the stories of what happens when you hitchhike, that I wouldn't be in this situation. When I reached the school, I ran around to the back. I knew there was a little closet there that was always unlocked that held janitor's supplies. I hid inside and I stayed still and silent. I knew my mother would be worried if I didn't return soon, but I was far too scared to try and make it home. I ended up falling asleep in that janitor's closet because I waited there so long. And the next day, I was startled awake by one of the worried custodians. When he found me, he took me inside the school to the guidance office. Both my mother and the authorities were called. I told them what happened the previous night. The police had me come into the station and file a report. I gave them every detail. After a while, they told my mother to take me home. As we were leaving, I overheard a conversation between two of the officers on break. Apparently, the house at the address I originally gave the man had been broken into. The woman who lived there and her three kids all had to be hospitalized. I had never felt more guilty. Luckily, the woman and her kids all recovered with no serious injuries, but I think we all needed a bit of therapy. To this day, I don't know what became of the man, and part of me is worried he's still out there, hunting for a new girl that may look like his late wife. Don't go hitchhiking if you can help it. From now on, if I have to, I'll be walking home. Aunt Dolly's Ghost, submitted by Abigail. My family always believed that my auntie's house was haunted. It was sort of an inside joke, though we were kind of serious. Things often occurred there, paranormal activity and such, so it was no surprise to see what happened to me. It was Christmas 2014, and we were at my auntie's house in Queensland. My family and I had spent Christmas with my father's family in Bow Desert. We had just calmed down from all the excitement and fun we had that day. My sister and I were sleeping in the back room, and that night it was terribly hot, so I opened my window and sat on the windowsill. As I did this, I felt a sudden but gentle touch on my right shoulder. Something was rubbing my skin back and forth. Keep in mind, the room was pitch black, so even when I looked, I couldn't see much. I complained to my sister, telling her to stop. My anger grew with every word, thinking she was being a weirdo and trying to annoy me. At my sudden yelling, she jumped out of bed and ran to the light switch turning it on, and I was left looking confused. Because I'd still felt the sensation the moment before the light came on. And now that I could see, I saw that nothing and no one had been around me, so who was touching me? I hoped it was some sort of weird bug on my shoulder, even though it didn't make any sense. The next night, my sister and I were up late. It was just about one in the morning when I jokingly decided to start taking pictures. I said if this place was really haunted, maybe we could catch something on camera. I've always been kind of interested in these things, and joking about it made me feel a little easier on the subject. 
I first took a picture of my sister sitting in her bed, and using an app, I placed a fake ghost in the picture in the windowsill to fool my cousins, but they knew better. It looked pretty fake anyway. We both laughed at the picture and thought it'd be funny to show my cousins in the morning. But before turning off my phone, I noticed a white smudge on the screen. I tried clearing it, but it didn't budge. And I realized it wasn't on the screen. It was something in the picture. Specifically, it was placed on top of the mirror in our room. I got up and walked over to the mirror. Then and there, my heart seemingly stopped. Everything went quiet, quiet enough to where I could hear my own heart pounding. My attention focused on the picture, the picture on my phone. Then I threw it and hid it under my blanket. My sister said, what? What did you see? She took my phone and unlocked it. Now able to see the picture, only to throw my phone back at me and quickly crawled into bed. The next day, I took another more calm look at the picture, and what I saw was amazing yet scary. In the background at the window was what looked like a little schoolboy peeking from behind the curtains. I swear there was no one with us that night as we were the only ones awake. A lot of things happen at my auntie's house, and there are plenty more stories for another time. Dude in the Woods, from Sin Among Us. I am a truck driver. I work for a certain water company that is located in Michigan. The route that I drive for this company takes me as far as the Upper Peninsula, down to central Michigan. To give an idea of where this creepy experience took place, I was near Roscommon County. This was way back in late January when the night would come as quickly as 5 p.m. I was driving down a rural highway around 8 p.m., and a snowstorm was picking up. Now, the trucks provided by my company, I can't say they're in the best condition, but we have to drive them anyway. As I was cruising down the highway, my truck began to sputter and shake. With a sigh, I pulled off to the side of the road, turned on my hazard lights, and put the vehicle in park. I've been dealing with this all day because of a coolant leak in the heater core. I have to fill up the coolant reservoir, which takes about five minutes. Dressed in nothing more but my regular clothes and a baseball cap, I exit my truck and I enter the snowy January night. I unlatched my hood and pulled it up. The sound of it opening was the only sound to be heard. It was very quiet out there at the time, except for some blowing wind. The night was overcast and very dark due to the storm. My only light was from the hazards on the truck and a small flashlight in my mouth. The thick line of woods is about 100 feet away from each side of the road, and I was parked along the shoulder on the side of the highway. As I began to fill up the coolant reservoir, I heard some rustling in the undergrowth, about 150 to 200 feet deeper in the woods. I thought nothing of it, due to the fact that deer are common even during winter. But the strangest thing was the rustling was quite loud, like a lot louder than animals would usually be. I mean, the wind was blowing decently hard, but I could still hear the rustling in the woods. I was wondering what could be so loud when I heard a loud crack and a soft thud. Now this noise really got my attention. It didn't sound like a deer anymore, it sounded more like a person stumbling around. Humans are very loud in the woods, and no animal would purposely make a noise to give itself away like that, especially that loud. Yes, there were bears, but it wasn't a big concern for me in that area. Now, a real concern I had was that the last house I saw was about 10 miles away, and no cars had passed me by yet, and somehow there was some dude walking around out there in the woods in the middle of a snowstorm. Still cautious of the guy walking around, I finished refilling the reservoir. I locked the hood down and began to enter the truck. 
Before exiting the truck, I had the windows down. I kept them down due to the fact I could still hear the guy out there. Then, as soon as the crashing around the forest started, it just as quickly stopped. That put me on edge. I felt the air around me grow thick and heavy, even though the winter air was dry. I turned the key in the ignition. A loud beep resounded from the truck dash, therefore allowing me to turn it on. The truck roared to life, and I started to pull back onto the road to continue driving. As soon as my truck started rolling, I heard the crashing start up again, but at a loud and quickened pace. By the sound of it, whatever it was seemed to be making a line straight for the truck. I thought this guy was dumb or something, but it still freaked me out, so I pushed the truck to go faster. With the hazard light still on, I could see the outer edges of the semi. And then, I saw them. There was a person running near the rear passenger side of the trailer. The creepy part about it was that I was traveling at about 15 miles per hour and pushing it, still climbing, and the guy was fast enough to keep up, and he was closing the distance to my cab. Now, with the cold sweat, I pushed the truck into a higher gear, and the engine roared louder. I was pushing 25 miles per hour, and this guy was almost to the cab, when all of a sudden he just disappeared. It seemed he was so focused on catching up with the truck that he failed to notice and hit the guardrail on the side of the road. Though it still freaked me out, I continued traveling down the road, ignoring the speed limits until I got to the hotel I would be staying at. That was just one of the creepiest moments on the road. Watching me in the dark from Gus. I'd like to start by saying I'm not religious, but I've experienced things, things that I can't explain and can only attribute to the supernatural. This story takes place when I was in my junior year of high school. I'm 21 now. It was almost Christmas and my parents asked me if I'd like to visit my family in Mexico this year and spend Christmas there. Of course, I said yes, so off I went for two weeks. I went with my cousin's family by car and got there in about three days. We made it and my family and I hugged. They cried for finally seeing me after such a long time. It was great. Around four days later, one night, we were all outside telling scary stories. I'll be honest, it did creep me out, but I tried not to show it. When it came time to go to sleep, I was kinda nervous, because it's super dark at night, and especially because this is a village near the mountains. And yeah, it's pretty poor there. They have street lights, but they're not that bright. My grandmother was sleeping next to me in a different bed, and my cousins and their parents were in the next room with no door. Around 2 or 3 in the morning, I woke up. I felt cold. When I looked down at my feet, my covers were at my knees, so I got up to get them. But then I looked up a little, and at the end of the bed was a shadow. It was darker than the room, and easily seven feet tall. Now, I'm not trying to act cool, but I wasn't scared at the moment. I didn't move, though. I was just staring it down trying to figure out what it was. When I moved a little, it began to sink into the ground. It was so fast, I didn't know what to do. But somehow, soon, I went back to sleep. The following day, I kept quiet and didn't tell anyone. Thinking back on this experience, what scares me isn't the shadow being itself, but the thought of how long it may have been there and what it was doing before I woke up. Most importantly, why? Why me? It's all so weird. The Creature at My Company From Zappy Back I am a 17-year-old guy who lives in a rather small city in the Netherlands. Our school system works a little different than most countries, as we go to primary school for about 8 years until we're 12. 
and then head on to secondary education from age 12 to 16. I was an early student, so at the time I had just turned 17. As I had just finished my exams, I had winter vacation about four weeks earlier than the rest of the country. Now, at the time, I had no job, and seeing that almost all my friends had four more weeks of school to attend, I thought it would be smart to get a job. I started work at this small company where we shipped out artificial grass to customers. The company was basically two large warehouses next to each other, connected with a very big door at the end of the hall. The room I worked in was connected on the right side of the big hall. It was a rather small room, but seeing as we only created small artificial grass samples and did some small tasks on the side, we didn't need that much room. The two warehouses were used to store the actual big grass rolls people ordered to lay in their yard, for example. There was also a small canteen where we could eat and drink during our breaks. The canteen was also connected to the main hall, and you almost always went through the canteen to get into the main hall. Lastly, there is some sort of attic in the back of the main hall. This attic is used to store failed grass rolls or grass rolls that never had a chance to be delivered. Basically, all the junk was thrown in the attic. This attic had no walls, so when you would stand in the main hall, you could see right into the attic. I didn't work on the shipping crew. No, my job was to create small artificial grass samples by gluing a small piece of grass to a piece of information paper. Then we'd ship out small boxes with one to four pieces of artificial grass so our customers could choose what grass they wanted to buy. We delivered to the Netherlands, Germany, and Belgium. On a normal day, we'd have around 300 boxes shipped out in total. And seeing how most people wanted at least two grass samples, and some even four, I had to make around 800 artificial grass samples a day, together with a colleague. Thursdays were different though. Thursdays were very busy, and sometimes we'd have twice the work compared to a normal day. Sometimes we would start way earlier than usual on Thursdays, since we had so much work to do. Normally, we'd start at 7, but if you wanted to start earlier, you could. Sometimes we'd start at 5 a.m. on Thursdays. So it was a Wednesday, and I asked my coworker if he also started at 5 the next day because it would be a Thursday. He said he'd like to, but he couldn't. He had a day off to spend with his family. He said if I wanted to start early, I could, but I would be the only one until 6 a.m. That would be when the shipping crew started. He said that I had to discuss this with the boss and see if I could get the keys. After talking with my boss, he said I had a great attitude and happily handed me a set of spare keys so I could let myself in the next morning. I couldn't be happier, since I made my boss happy, and I got to work more hours, and I would have some alone time the next morning to listen to music or something. The following morning, I arrived at work around 4.55 a.m., and I let myself in to start work. I went to the canteen to make myself a coffee. After all, it was still 5 a.m. in the morning. I scrolled a bit on my phone and forgot the time. I then saw it was 5.07 a.m., I grabbed my coffee and went to my workspace. Now, on the outside of the walls of the room I worked in were almost all the light switches. The light switch of my room was there. The one of the main hall and the second hall were there too, as well as the light switch of the office located above the canteen. The only one that wasn't there was the canteen itself. So I flicked on the light switch of my workspace in the main hall. But when I did, no lights came on. I was still listening to music, so I went ahead and flicked it back off. The hall was so dark, I couldn't even see the huge scaffolding where the grass rolls were stored, located all along the left wall of the main hall. At one point, I tried the switches again, but nothing happened. By chance, I knew how to reset the power if it was ever cut. I overheard my coworker saying how to do it for another colleague of mine. The fuse box was located all the way in the back of the main hall. But the hall was so dark, I almost couldn't see my own hand in front of me. The weird thing was the light in the canteen worked perfectly fine, so there was some light illuminating the beginning of the main hall. 
The power to the canteen must have been connected to a different set of earthing switches, I thought to myself. I needed the power not just for the light, but if there was no power, there was no way to heat up the glue guns to glue the grass samples to the information paper. I also couldn't open up the huge rolling door because it was still dark outside and it would help very little. I walked back into the canteen to think over my options. I remembered I of course still had a mobile phone with a flashlight I could use to find my way to the fuse box at the end of the hall. It was my only choice, so I made my way back into the main hall, turning on the flashlight on my phone. When the light came on, I came to a big discovery. One of the scaffolding had been knocked over. This was next to impossible, as these things were at least 10 meters high, and there was no way a human being could do it. The only way one of these scaffolding could be knocked over had to be with a forklift, we had two forklifts we used to pick up the grass rolls and put them into a truck to deliver the grass to customers. But if this happened yesterday, the crew would clean the mess up instantly. So when did it happen? I considered calling my boss, but I wanted to turn on the light first. After glancing one last time at the mess of the fallen scaffolding, I turned and made my way to the back of the main hall. But when I pointed my light to the end of the hall, it illuminated a big part of the attic as well. I got the biggest shock of my life as I looked to this astounding and disgusting creature standing in the attic on the edge of the floor. I could see the creature almost perfectly, even though there was still no light. This creature looked distorted. It looked so wrong. It sort of looked like a man with legs bending backwards and hooves as feet. Its fingers were at least 30 centimeters long, and it had the brightest yellow eyes I'd ever seen. Its skin was rotting, and in some places I could even see bone due to the skin that was coming off of its body. Then the creature began to speak to me. I couldn't believe I was hearing anything coming from an animal that looked like that. The creature spoke in a low, angry, and distorted voice. I stood there in full disgust. The creature screamed at me. It was such a deafening scream I could hear my ears ringing inside of my skull. It was then that I made a break for the canteen. When I turned away, I could hear a loud thump on the ground. I didn't look back, but I suppose it was when the creature jumped down from the attic onto the ground. I ran through the canteen into the hallway, then out the door. It was still so dark outside, and I had no idea where to go. I heard this creature crashing into the huge rolling gate. I got my senses together and I hid in a descending path for unloading trucks at the company next door. This took me about 10 seconds. When I got into the place, I could hear another loud crash into the door. After that, there was dead silence. Then the huge rolling door began to open. It went slower than normal, but maybe that creature had broken something, causing the door to rise more slowly. I could see the pure black hooves slowly being revealed as the door proceeded to open. It amazed me at how the creature got the door open. The only way to open the door was by pressing on a small button with an up arrow on it. When the door was far enough open, it stepped out onto the street and into the moonlight. I could see it looking around and sniffing. This thing was at least three meters tall. It felt like an eternity passed before the creature stopped sniffing. Then it ran off, and it never came back. I got back inside as fast as I could, which wasn't the smartest thing to do. I closed the rolling gate, and to my surprise, the power was back on. All the lights were turned on, and I could see everything perfectly fine now. I never told anyone about this story, and I told my boss I had no idea how that scaffolding got knocked over. One week later, I quit my job there 
and in that last week I never started my shift early. The Mysterious Man from Albert S. I was about 24 when this took place. I used to haul anything with my old 79 Peterbilt, which leads up to this story. It was getting dark quickly since it was December, and I was trying to get to my destination before a snowstorm hit, so I was going a little over the speed limit. I had only seen a single other rig on this lonely road. It was probably 8 p.m. when something I'll never forget happened. I had gotten a decent look at a cop earlier who had pulled me over, so I recognized his face. After a while of lonely driving, I saw something on the road. I began to jake break to slow myself. I would got up close when I realized it was the cop again, but his car was nowhere to be seen. I reached down to get my old camera to take a picture, but when I looked up, he was gone. By then, I was a little freaked out. I then realized ice was on the road, so my truck couldn't get moving again, which meant I'd have to get out. So I grabbed my 12 gauge and got out to put chains on the tires to move, which takes a minute if you're new to trucking. I deliberately put the chain on in a way it would come off, since at that point I didn't want to get out of my truck anymore, so I let the chain fly off by itself. When it did fly off, I heard it hit the trailer, but then I heard this mysterious screeching sound. When I looked out my mirror, I saw something hanging off the deck in between the trailer and the cab. At that point, I was so freaked out, I hit the gas even harder. As my truck sped up to nearly 100 miles per hour, I had hit a patch of ice causing my trailer to dogtail around a corner, which did save me from rolling. But then I spotted a car. Realizing my trailer was still dogtailing, I swung my steering wheel to the right, causing my truck to roll over and go down into a gully. That's where I saw him again. Wide-eyed and smiling, he walked to the hood of my truck, which surprisingly stayed on. I used what strength I had to grab my shotgun and fired seven rounds into the man. He let out a scream and fell to the ground. After I climbed out of my rig, I left on foot, but I never saw the body of the man. There was absolutely no trace of him. But if you want to avoid running into him yourself, keep an eye out on the roads between New York and Montana. Drumming in the Snow From Silver Bullet 54 in the winter of 2014, I took a trip to a cabin with three of my friends, Chuck, Andy, and Terry. We had decided to go to Terry's own cabin high in the Appalachian Mountains somewhere in Tennessee. I believe that's where it was. She said it was a great place to see animals in their natural habitat. Well, after arriving there, one morning I woke up to a thumping sound. At first, I thought it was snow but when I looked out the window, there was no snow falling at all. The thumping got louder, so I told the three of them to stop fooling around. Terry came into my room as pale as printer paper. You hear that? She asked. I nodded and said it was probably Chuck or Andy playing a prank. However, Chuck and Andy were still sleeping. Terry and I looked at each other. Then we quickly woke up the other two and told them to barricade the door. Andy obeyed, but Chuck didn't seem very concerned. He took out his golf bag that he had. He was on the high school golfing team and said he wouldn't be scared with his equalizer in hand. He slowly pulled out a rifle used for hunting. He took aim at the window close to him, ready to shoot at the slightest movement. The thumping was so close, all four of us realized it was a drum. The sound went around the cabin twice, then faded away. Terry, Andy, and Chuck were silent. Finally, I said, That's it. I'm done. But Chuck told me they had paid a week-long price, and we still had two days left at that point. 
Well, day six passed without incident, thankfully. On the final day, we had just finished lunch when we heard a familiar sound. Thump, thump, thumping. The drumming had returned. All four of us ran outside, each of us carrying a weapon of some sort. I had a plank of wood, Chuck his rifle, Terry a chain used for snow tires, and Andy one of the golf clubs that Chuck kept in his bag. We all listened as the drumming went around and around in a thicket, so we couldn't see who or what it was. After what seemed like hours, the drumming faded away. All four of us split up, but found nothing. No footprints, no boot prints, no broken branches, nothing at all. We all decided that enough was enough. We packed up and left. Once we had calmed down, Chuck spoke up. You know, we're in an area that saw action during the Civil War. Do you think... Uh... We all knew what he didn't say. I decided that we must have been hearing a reenactment of someone doing their duty. They had drummers in the 1860s. Those drummers could be as young as 12 in some cases. I don't know who we were hearing... I didn't bring it up at the time, but we had all left gear, like our winter hats and gloves, back at the cabin. As far as I know or care, maybe they're still there. As for the drummer, he's probably still there in the mountains, drumming into a battle that ended over a century and a half ago. The Thing Haunting Me and My Grandmother From Jasper O2 I'm 18 and I live with my two grandmothers. My dad works out of town. We have strange things happen almost every day. It's been going on for five years. Me and one of my grandmothers are trying to figure out what's going on. Now, of my two grandmothers, one of them has some history with hanging out with bad people. Her name is Jenny, and I'll share some stories that she told me. So Grandma Ginny was friends with her assistant counselor, whose name is Molly, and they would share personal things and secrets with each other. Molly would later tell my grandmother she was a witch. One night in the year of 2014, my Grandma Ginny and Molly were talking and having some drinks. Then my grandma compared Molly to Molly's mother, but she didn't mean it in a bad way. Molly got mad and tried to attack my grandma. She threatened to go upstairs and attack my other grandmother, Joanne, who was my grandma Ginny's mother. Ginny then kicked Molly out of the house during a snowstorm, and they never talked again. A year later is when the paranormal stuff happened. Grandma Ginny told me that she found out the reason Molly was a witch. Molly's mother was a witch and was raised in a coven of other witches. Now, when I started visiting my grandma Ginny's house in 2015, I didn't notice anything paranormal for another year, not until she told me the story of Molly and the things she had been experiencing. I should mention that Ginny has two cameras on the first floor of the house we live in. She watches them down in the second floor in her room for any signs of movement. She has security alarms almost all over the house that she will turn on when everyone goes to bed. Then she'll turn them off in the daytime. She often hears footsteps and sometimes voices coming from the first floor through the camera, but it won't trigger the alarm. When I started to hear noises, it was only footsteps at first, but it eventually got worse. Beds were starting to get messed up after they were made. People would feel as if they were being watched. I have a few terrifying moments of my own. I was walking out of the bathroom one day when I heard a woman's voice saying something. I couldn't tell what it was saying, but I didn't care. I ran back into the bathroom and slammed the door behind me. I didn't come out until I couldn't hear anything. On another occasion, I was trying to fall asleep under my covers when I heard what sounded like a man growling over me. I was too scared to look for a moment. So I waited a few seconds and looked to see, but no one was there, 
and there was nothing next to my bed. After years of these paranormal events, I decided to investigate and to find some answers. I remembered the story my grandma Ginny had told me about. The story about Molly who used to be her friend, the witch. I believe Molly may have brought a bad spirit here because she hated my grandma Ginny for kicking her out of the house in the middle of a snowstorm. We also heard weird noises on the camera, like growling and moaning sounds in the attic. My grandma and I have gotten random bruises as well. There's a lot that I want to share, but these are the most important ones I wanted to mention. This is probably the only time I'll share something like this, but I might give an update in the future. But thank you for taking the time to listen to my story. I Thought He Wasn't Real Submitted by J. Riley I grew up in Maine, in a small coastal town that always smelled of fish no matter how far from the harbor you were. But being raised there, you don't really notice the smell. Not unless you go on vacation for a weekend and come back. Then it's like a fist to the face. Anyway, let me just jump right in. My family has always had a weird fascination with the Krampus legend, an old piece of European folklore about a mythical beast that's the opposite of Santa Claus. He carries switches or sticks around to beat children with. Children who have been naughty and don't deserve gifts that Saint Nick brings. This was my Santa Claus, basically. Instead of offering me a reward for my good behavior, my parents instead reinforced me with, if you're bad, Krampus will get you. If you're bad, Krampus will beat you and give you coal. To be pretty honest with you, I believed what they said for half my life, but I'm 23 now and I know better. Well, I thought I knew better. I moved away to the state of Washington with my aunt until I could afford my own place. This was after a very dramatic feud with my parents over some disagreements concerning my college major. Well, to heck with me for wanting to pursue my passions, I guess, not the long, expensive career paths that they wanted for me. I said some things I shouldn't have. It was back in 2010, when I was 16. Then in 2016, just last year, they invited me back for Christmas, offering me apologies and a good time with no drama. I missed my family, but I was still angry at them, so I decided to fly to Maine for Christmas weekend, but I was not going to apologize for anything that I'd said. On December 23rd, I arrived. I gave my parents awkward hugs and expected the worst, but they were different. My parents didn't nag me or try to start drama. They actually cried when I showed up. They hugged me tighter than ever, it was nice, but it wasn't enough for me. I held on to that grudge like a lifeline. The next night, Christmas Eve night, arrived soon enough, and my parents and uncle and I were hanging out in the living room, sharing stories about everything I'd missed while I was gone. And then, of course, came the talk of Krampus. I hope you've been good while you were away, my mom teased me. My father joined in with, mm -hmm. I've noticed some tree branches missing around here lately. Probably just Krampus preparing for quite a busy Christmas around here. My uncle laughed at this, but I rolled my eyes. It was pretty funny, but it was just their way of joking about the past. It helped make everything more lighthearted around here, and I welcomed it. But that night, I couldn't sleep. My mind was racing, I felt guilty about my parents. Maybe back then when we argued, they just wanted a better future for me. Maybe that's why they were so upset with the future I had in mind for myself. At around 1.30 in the morning, as I lay there staring at the ceiling, I began to hear something from just outside my door. It was breathing, heavy, raspy breathing like some sort of oddly tall and old hobo was standing outside my bedroom door, wondering if he should knock or just walk right inside. 
I got up, figuring my dad was playing a prank on me. I walked right over to the guest room door and swung it open. The hallway was empty, but I could still hear the breathing. Apparently, it hadn't been coming from just behind my door. The breathing was instead coming from the living room door and was so loud that the breathing itself echoed through the hallway. I suddenly felt insanely cold. That's when I figured someone had left the front door wide open. Maybe the snowy wind was getting inside. Maybe that's what I was hearing. I walked down the hallway, which opened up towards the living room, and for the first time in a decade, I felt hesitant and a little creeped out. I couldn't figure out why. Surely no one had broken in, right? We didn't live very close to other people. When I reached the living room, I saw that the door was actually still closed, locked up tightly, but the breathing was definitely there, just outside the front door. Now, this is the creepiest part. There is a telephone pole with a light on it, just 20 yards away from the front of the house, overlooking our driveway. It often cast clear shadows of guests that walked up to the door. And on that dark, cold night, I could clearly see the shadows of thin legs being cast underneath the door. It was then that I was certain someone really was outside. I swallowed hard, nearly choking on my own spit. I covered my mouth instinctively, afraid to let whoever was outside hear me. I should have told my parents then and there so that we could get some help, but my curiosity took over, and sure enough, I began walking toward the door to peek through the peephole. I closed my other eye and slowly looked outside. I jumped back, nearly screaming, when I saw those teeth, yellow, rotting, sharp teeth, and then they knocked. I was panicking then. I didn't know what to do. I'd never been in a situation like this before. Little did I know it was about to get much worse. Riley. Somehow, they knew my name. Open the door and receive your punishment. I'll never forget that voice, not for as long as I live. By some unseen will, I quickly stood up, jumped over to the door and unlocked it, throwing it open. The entire time, my mind was screaming, what in the world am I doing? The door was wide open now and I could see everything, the light pole, the snow dropping lightly down in front of it, and an empty front porch. But there were footprints there, more like hoof prints, actually. I woke up my parents immediately and I showed them the prints, but they began to laugh at me. You can't be serious, Riley. My father put his hand on my shoulder. You're too old to believe in Krampus. Just looks like a goat or deer, I guess, my mom said, as she leaned down to observe the odd tracks. Yep, definitely a deer or goat with hooves twice the thickness of my own hand. Sounds about right, mom, I thought. They went back to bed and told me to lock up the door, and I did as they told me, but I stayed in the living room trying to watch TV to take my mind off of things. Yet, I kept glancing to the door, waiting to hear that breathing again. Yes, I apologized to my parents on Christmas morning, even if it was mostly due to my creepy experience. And I still went back to Washington after Christmas, back to a place I'd never seen Krampus before. Let's just say I don't hold grudges any longer and I don't answer the door at 1.30 in the morning to a heavily breathing stranger. Night of Krampus by Sterling. This was a quick yet scary experience I had one December when I was a child. 
It was maybe 30 years ago at my old brick home in West Virginia. We were very broke back then. My family couldn't afford much more than rent and food each month. You'd think I'd be happy growing up in that kind of situation. I mean, grateful at the very least. But that particular Christmas, I wasn't having it. I was going through a sort of phase. I threw a number of temper tantrums leading up to Christmas. It was almost a nightly thing, my screaming and shouting and wanting what my parents couldn't afford. My parents must have hated it, and I feel bad for it now, but back then, I just didn't stop. About two weeks into December, there was a night my brother was fed up with me. He tricked me into playing hide and seek in the forest near our home. I was bored at time and angry, so I was easily convinced to join him to take my mind off of things. We were outside, and I was chosen to be at first, of course, but as I counted, he just went back inside and locked the door. I probably deserved that. When I was finished counting, though, I began to seek, completely oblivious to his trickery. I looked behind trees, over hills, in bushes, but nothing. It didn't take long for me to realize that I had been duped. I began walking back to my house, crying and ready to throw another fit. But that mood soon changed when I heard the sound of snow crunching underfoot, and it wasn't my footsteps. Immediately, I turned around and saw that figure. It appeared to be some man, cloaked in a near pitch black hood. But what was enough to get me absolutely paralyzed with fear were the horns coming from his head. I saw his breathing forming clouds in front of the hood, and I knew I needed to run. I made it back to the front door in seconds flat, and I was pounding on the door, screaming in tears for my parents. I heard the breathing getting closer and closer behind me, that huffing deep breathing. Suddenly the door opened, and I fell flat on my face. I stumbled to get back up and I latched on to the nearest waist I could find, sobbing into someone's shirt. What's wrong, dear? It was my father. I turned and looked out the open door to see a still and silent woods. To this day, I don't know what it was I saw or if it was even real, but if I had to make up a wild guess, it was probably Krampus giving me a warning. Straighten up, or he'd give me a reason to cry. Krampus at my house, submitted by Michael L. I have two brothers, Kelvin and Andy, and at the time my mom was getting dinner ready for us, since it was Christmas Eve. In the time being, we were outside having a snowball fight. We were all around the age of 12, if I remember correctly. I was barely the oldest of the three of us. After a while, my mom finally called us in for dinner. We ate quite a feast, but in the midst of it, my brothers began arguing about what presents they would get. Then Kelvin said that he deserved more and that his brother was being terrible this year, which caused Andy to throw some food. And thus, that began the food fight on Christmas Eve. At that age, even I joined in, not because I was angry, but I was too young to pass up a food fight. My mom wasn't even a little bit amused. Immediately, she sent us to our rooms and we were forced to go to bed early. We put on our pajamas, then sat there angrily. Soon enough, we couldn't keep our eyes open, and we fell asleep. But all three of us woke up at the same time from something we heard downstairs. Everyone was in bed at the time. It was really late. I remember looking at the clock, and it was around one in the morning. We all three looked at each other and thought, no way, it's, it's Santa. Even I believed it, and by then I'd stopped believing in Santa entirely. 
but hearing such a strange noise in the middle of night on Christmas Eve of all days, it really puts things into perspective, you know? All three of us slowly followed each other downstairs, opening doors so slowly that no one would hear it, then tiptoeing extremely quietly to the staircase. We couldn't be heard, not if we really wanted to see what was going on down there. We saw the Christmas tree, and we saw a bunch of presents that hadn't been there before. And again, we assumed it was Santa. We didn't even think that my mom and dad may have put them there after sending us to bed. We began to race downstairs all at once, if only to just shake our new presents and guess what they may be. But halfway down the stairs, I froze. My brothers seeing me paralyzed like that, they looked at me and stopped as well, asking me in whispers, what's wrong? Did someone see you? I shook my head and I pointed at the window at the thing I was watching. The noise hadn't been coming from inside the house. There was someone outside our window, which was a few feet away from the Christmas tree, something clawing at the glass pane. We saw a pale, bearded face from outside and fingers with nails so long, they almost looked like they could reach us from here. Luckily, the window was closed tight, but unluckily, whatever that thing was saw us and instantly turned its eyes to our faces. I covered my mouth to hide my scream, and the three of us ran back to our bedroom, throwing ourselves under the same cover on my bed. There we waited and shook, listening to every single sound we heard for the rest of the night. In the morning, everything was normal. My family was cheery and ready to hand out presents and have Christmas breakfast. Everyone but the three of us were all smiles, but we couldn't stop looking out the window, fully expecting to see that face return. And before that, it took us a long time to be urged to get out of bed. Even on Christmas Day, we were hesitant to come downstairs. We didn't want to face that thing again, whatever it may have been. For years after that, whether it was Christmas or not, I had off and on nightmares about the figure we saw and the face it made when it looked at us. I'm 18 now, and I still get a very chilly feeling when Christmas comes around. My Krampus Encounter, submitted by Bugs the Redneck. It was Christmas of 2014, and it was Christmas Eve to be more precise. During this time, me, my dad, and my grandma's boyfriend wouldn't celebrate like a normal family. Usually we'd party the hard way if you catch my drift. Enjoying some of Johnny, my grandma's boyfriend's Happy Jack, as he'd like to call it. Now I know what you're gonna say. You were probably out of your mind and hallucinating, but I assure you this is not the case. None of the things we were taking affected us in that way. We'd done it several times before, and this year we were taking it more easily than usual, doing less than half the amount we were used to. Anyway, my mom, grandma, and little brother had already turned in for the night, leaving the three of us guys sitting by the fireplace in the living room. Now where I lived back then, it was just your usual suburban style neighborhood, so that should help you visualize where we were. We were all sitting by the fireplace when all of a sudden, we heard a loud banging against our ceiling right above where we were sitting. We all looked up, then curiously at each other, as if we were all asking one another if we heard the same thing or not. Smiling and choking down a laugh, John said, guys, I think Jeepers Creepers is coming for us. We all laughed and returned to what we were doing before it happened, as if there wasn't anything to worry about. After a while, as I was sitting right in front of the fireplace, closer than the other guys, my face was getting blazing hot so I decided to move over to a different seat, and this one happened to be right next to our massive living room window. A few minutes later, I suddenly got this huge urge to look outside, and today I regret it still,
probably always will. When I looked out, I saw thick blankets of snow, a random snowman in our front yard, and in front of that, a very tall, hunched over figure. At first, I didn't really focus on the black figure. Instead, I was wondering how we went from barely any snow to about four or five inches of it. I began to look around, and that was when I began to pay more attention to the strange silhouetted figure that was now closer to the house than it had been before. It did strike me as odd, so I just stared at it. I stared at the thing for at least five seconds before I could finally make out a face. A dark, wrinkly, old face and a bright white beard that seemed dirty and unkept. In other words, he looked like an evil and out of his luck old man. Because now he was so close that I could see his face reflecting the living room light. Immediately, I yelled for my dad and John to come to the window to look outside at this strange man. As soon as they looked out the window, they seemed to be just as flabbergasted as I was. Dad took off, going to get his 22. He came back, stumbling as he tried to load the thing. When we were all looking back out the window again after prepping ourselves, the figure was now gone. Dad was at a loss for words, until he finally asked me, boy, why weren't you keeping an eye on the thing? But I just ignored him, still staring out the window. Everything was the same, except for the figure being gone, and one more thing that took me a long time to notice. The snowman had dozens of sticks and twigs pushed through its torso like blades. John and my dad both noticed at the same time I did, because when I saw it, I heard them say behind me, what in the world? Dad then ran outside in his stupor and began to knock down the snowman, and I couldn't help but get goosebumps, expecting that figure to return, that massive hunched thing. Ever since then, we've repeated this very creepy experience to our family members, especially when Christmas comes every year. It's a good story, but it still sends chills down my spine, and I wonder to this day what exactly we saw. So, to my supposed haunting by Krampus, I hope I don't see you again next year. Krampus, submitted by Dirty Cavmain 420. My family was never much into the holidays. I wouldn't quite say we didn't believe, but we certainly never celebrated religious holidays. I was probably the only one that had any faith. My grandparents were Catholics, so I would go to church with them all the time when I was young. Until 13, when they had been hit by a driver who had been drinking, whose father got him off the hook because they were rich but I'm getting off topic. After this, I renounced God, saying if God were kind, he wouldn't have let this happen to me or my family. That Christmas, I didn't decorate a tree, I didn't write a letter to Santa, and I didn't pray. All I did was try to get over my depression. It was Christmas Eve, and I was on my PlayStation raging at a game and decided it was time for bed at around 11.30. I headed upstairs, took something to help me sleep. Now, when I take this stuff, I sleep like a rock. So needless to say, when I suddenly jolted awake at around 12.30, I was confused. I lied in my bed for about 30 seconds until I suddenly heard a crash in my living room. I grabbed a baseball bat next to my bed and began to walk downstairs. Upstairs where my room is at, there is a long hallway with my parents' room, my own, and my sister's room, along with a bathroom and storage room. So after I creep my way down the long hallway, and I began to walk downstairs, I saw a silhouette down below in our living room, playing with ornaments on the tree, as well as handling the gifts under it. Now, in any other situation, I would scream, knowing that it was an intruder, someone who broke into our home. But in this situation, 
scene was very bizarre and different because it's not every day that your intruder is covered in fur with goat-like horns. All at once, so many ideas and thoughts came into my mind. Thoughts like, must be a prank? Thoughts like, that's probably just my dad trying to scare me. That's probably the reason why I couldn't control myself when I blurted out one word. Dad? And the moment I made the sound, it shifted its head up towards me in a crooked, creepy fashion. As its neck rotated, it made the sound like old and ancient creaking wood underfoot. Its mouth was wide open, like a black hole, and its face was wrinkled and disheveled. It was then that I knew that this was not some normal intruder, nor was it a man at all. Frozen to my spot, I watched the thing playing with the presents. It put one of the presents down, continued to stare at me, then walked back through the living room door where it must have entered. Soon enough, it was quiet again, yet extremely cold in the house. I plopped down on the top step of the stairs, staring at the spot where the creature had just been, and I couldn't blink, let alone think straight. Several hours later, my family was up and about, and they found me on the top step. Despite taking something to help me sleep, I stayed wide awake, hardly blinking the entire time. Never have I ever been in such a state of disbelief or fear, and I'll never forget that night. I asked my dad about that prank, but he didn't know what I was talking about, and how could he have been in his room if I was on the stairs the whole night if he was the one in that creature suit? I don't know. Nothing really makes sense to me anymore. And I pray that it was all just a hallucination, a side effect to the things I was taking for my sleep and depression. The Shoe Shoe Wisp from Darren During the Christmas holiday of 2017, I had to work. Considering I was in the middle of a bit of a family feud, I didn't have anyone to visit and therefore welcomed the idea of working for triple time pay instead. I worked for a national park service in the Midwest. No, I wasn't a ranger, I was more like a groundskeeper. My primary duties included picking up trash, maintaining decorative plants along pathways and walkways, cutting down dangerous trees or branches, etc. If the woods needed maintaining or cleaning up, it was my job. Now, the national park I worked at got particularly busy around holidays, but would always be empty on the holidays themselves. Basically, this meant trash would be at its highest point just before everyone left for home to spend time with their families. That year was no exception, and as I walked outside alone into a light flurry that evening, I began my hours-long onslaught of picking up other people's refuse. I started at 2 p.m., and by 5.05 p.m., it was dark out. By then, I'd finally cleaned up the primary walkways around the souvenir shop and the visitor hub. I packed in my tools and headed back to the employee building as the wind picked up. I couldn't help but be reminded of how bizarre it was that that time of year it would be pitch black by 5. The early dark was a bit creepier than normal darkness, if you ask me. I jumped when my phone rang. I pulled it from my pocket and read the caller ID. Uh, it was my boss. I cleared my throat and swiped the green icon, then spoke. Hello? I winced when I realized how tired I sounded. Darren, it's Bev. We're gonna need a tree cut down along the hiking trail leading into the northeast campgrounds. Things about to fall down. Don't want it to crush any visitors. Nope. I agreed. Inwardly, I was a little irritated. Depending on the thickness of the tree, it could be a monumental task, and I was scheduled to clock out by 8 p.m. Hey, I had nowhere to go that day, sure, but I didn't want to work all night in the freezing cold dark cutting down some tree alone. Get that done ASAP. Probably no campers tonight, but I don't want to risk it. Good night. 
and uh, Merry Christmas. She then hung up. I tucked my phone back in my pocket and entered the employee building, putting back my wool gloves and a box of extra trash bags, exchanging them for heavy duty rubber gloves, some orange tape, and the biggest saw I could find. Then I took off on the walkway leading to the campgrounds. The campgrounds were northeast of the building and lie deep in the woods, so the walk took me about 15 or 20 minutes. Once there, the hiking trail starts at the east of the campgrounds. This was another 10 minutes of walking. At first, I wasn't sure there was actually a dead tree on the trail. My boss may have been wrong about where it was located, but eventually I found it, an old pine tree decrepit and crumbling. It was no longer that healthy woods brown color. Instead, the trunk was gray. Yep, looked like this thing could fall at any time. And unfortunately for me, the sucker was about 44 inches around, pretty thick for something I was gonna have to cut down by hand. With the sigh, I began to tape off the trail so that no one could hike beyond that point. I would be angling the tree to fall onto the trail itself, as that was the direction it was hanging anyway. In fact, having it fall in any other direction would have been difficult or impossible. I took out my saw and got to work. But first, I laid the lantern down about 10 yards away or so, pointing at me. Those things were extremely bright, so it had to be pretty far back or it would have blinded me. As I saw it at the trunk of the tree, I was quickly getting winded. And speaking of wind, it was picking up even more, making the tree strain a bit. Wouldn't it be nice, I thought, if the dang thing just snapped and got it over with. I sat down for a while after sawing for about half an hour. I was already sore, not to mention I hadn't seen hide nor hair of another person since noon, so I was sure no one would be venturing through here. I was taking a break, sipping on a tin of coffee that had already gone cold. Gross, but it kept me energized. As I screwed the cap back on the coffee tin, I froze, and my eyes widened. A strange sound blew along the air, coming from further up the trail. I wanted to encourage myself that it was just the wind, nothing to worry about. But this didn't sound like wind. It sounded like a moan, long-winded and deep, coming from some sort of animal. Because I'd be damned if that sound was coming from a human being. What the heck was it? I'd worked in the woods for a few years now, and I'd never heard a sound like that. And as the sound grew louder, the wind itself seemed to grow stronger. The trees around me were bending and creaking, slapping against each other and straining under their own weight. Sure. It continued. As confused as I was, my interest was beyond peaked. I was curious and was not ready to go back to sawing that tree. So I picked up my lantern, pointed it up the trail, ducked under the tape, and began to walk along the path. With each step I took, each turn that I rounded, the shoo-shoo sound swelled. I walked for about a hundred yards up that trail, until the shoo-shoo sound stopped, and the wind died down completely. It was quite disturbing when the wind stopped in a split moment, causing the strained and bending trees to stand upright again, all at once, all around me, as if they had become conscious and aware of me. I stopped as well, but not because of the wind and noise dying down, but because of the tree that stood in the middle of the trail. Right dang in the middle of it, a thin and frail tree. This freaked me out. If this tree had been here before, I would have heard about it. I would have been made to cut it down ages ago. I took a step forward and shuddered, because I swear I saw the tree shake. Another step forward, and I heard a single shoo. I swallowed hard. That sound... I was certain it was coming from that tree. With another step, my lantern better illuminated its form. 
what I thought was a tree trunk suddenly lifted itself off the ground and joined another stump-looking form. These two things weren't stumps at all. They were legs, tall, extremely thin, and covered in ridges that resembled bark. I couldn't breathe, but I managed to lift the lantern and angle it upwards, revealing more of this non-tree creature. Its entire body was covered in these fake bark ridges. It was a gray-brown color. It had two legs, two arms, a torso, and a neck that went up and crooked back down like an oblong checkmark. Every single inch of the creature, appendages, neck, head, and body alike, they were all the same thickness and were entirely featureless, like some sort of seven-inch thick stick figure made of wood. Sure. The sound protruded from what I thought was the top of its wooden, featureless head. I watched this massively tall thing take way too slow steps and disappeared into the woods to my right. As soon as its steps became a distant echo, I tripped, gathered myself, and ran for my life, panting like an idiot. I ran past the tape and made for my car back at the employee building. I drove home letting Bev, my boss, know that I wasn't able to take the tree down by hand and would need some help with it. I didn't tell her that I went home early. I was planning on telling her that I just forgot to clock out that night. I worked there for another year or so then transferred to a different park where I've yet to encounter anything sinister or unexplained. I like it that way. Normal. Normal is good and boring and exactly how I want it. Screw that thing I saw. Made me question everything. Made no sense at all. I wasn't ever able to bring myself to tell my friends this story. I mean, had I seen Bigfoot or a ghost, I would have told them in a heartbeat. Those are far more believable. As for that tree creature thing, I don't want to see it again, even if it's not dangerous, but who knows. They're still here, from Arya Jaeger. It was around Christmas of 2009, maybe 2010. On Christmas Day, some family was having a little get-together. My great-uncle David had bought a new house. This house was an hour and a half from our old house. He decided that that year he would host the party, so as to show off his newly acquired home, as well as his new wife. So we made the long ride there on somewhat clear roads, but when we got to the house, it looked normal. Just a cozy little place out in the woods with a very serene view. We went inside and were greeted with the sickly sweet family holiday greeting. A few of my cousins were there as well. My younger brother and myself said hi, making friendly chatter with our cousins, not long after deciding to play hide and seek downstairs with them. Before we went off, Great Uncle David warned us to be careful around the new unfinished portion of the place. Of course, we agreed. When we went down the carpeted stairs to the almost fully finished basement, we looked around, admiring the place. Half of it was carpeted. There was a sliding glass door leading outside to the backyard. The walls were painted. It had a nice stone fireplace. Basically, the works. Now, because the place wasn't entirely finished, there was some sealed plastic on the sliding glass door and on any other cracked areas. This kept out cold air and particles, sealing the warmth inside. The first half was warm and cozy, but the other half was just bare concrete, wood, and insulation. The hall looked like a skeleton with a bare wood frame. Obviously, they meant to put in a bathroom because there was a toilet in one of the square room frames that wasn't hooked up yet. At the end of the hallway was a heavy oak door, and on the other side was a large desk and chair. Despite the door, we could see past it. There were no walls on either side of it. It was just a wood frame and a door in its place. It was more of an aesthetic divider for the time being. One of my cousins decides to be it, 
so as she turned and counted, we all went to hide throughout the basement. The other cousin hid somewhere behind the sectional couch. My brother hid behind the toilet, a bad choice. As for me, I went in between the wood framing, hiding under the large desk in the room at the end of the hall. Then my cousin who was it announced the phrase, ready or not, here I come, initiating the search and chase portion of the game. It didn't take long for her to find the other cousin. Then after three more minutes, they found my brother. But as they continued to look around, they were having trouble finding me. We had a rule with our game. We weren't allowed to tell the seeker where the other people were hiding if we were found. So my cousin, who was it, deducted aloud that she didn't hear the door close, so I couldn't be by the desk. But before they could go upstairs to search for me, I revealed myself. They came over into the room I was in, and we checked out the desk anyway. I asked her if David bought it, to which my cousin said no. She then told us that she heard David already talking to my grandpa about it. Apparently, they bought the house real cheap, and it even came with a lot of leftover furniture that was left behind by the previous owner. They sold most of the stuff, but kept this desk because it was very nice. Mahogany desks are quite good looking, I think. All the renovation that was going on downstairs was already started, but David and his wife planned to finish it. Either way, it was cool, and we decided to move on upstairs to play some video games, accidentally leaving the door open. As we neared the end of the wood frame hall, we all suddenly felt freezing cold. As I mentioned before, the room was toasty and sealed deliberately. There was no way it should be this cold in here. The hair on my arms and neck stood on end, and I felt as if someone was watching me. My girl cousin turned around, and after a moment of pause, she told us to look behind us. We turned back to the door. Remember what I said about that door. The door was only a doorway, so you could see beyond it from either side. Well, as we looked back at the door, it somehow began to slowly move on its own. It moved a good few inches before it stopped. I remember looking back at my brother and then back to the door. That's when the door swung shut and slammed so hard it shook the frame, nearly breaking it. I nearly jumped out of my skin as all of us booked it back upstairs. When we made it upstairs, everyone was staring. Our parents asked us what was wrong and why we were slamming doors. My girl cousin was crying and tried to explain what happened. That's when I simply said that the door slammed on its own, that we were in the hall and watched it ourselves. David and his wife looked worried, then pulled our parents aside. While the four of us tried to listen to David's older brother telling us funny jokes, he seemed to be trying to comfort and distract us. But I was watching our parents talk with David. I saw my girl cousin's mom looking shocked and put a hand over her mouth like she just witnessed an accident. That cousin and I discussed that it was probably bad if she reacted like that. After that experience, time went on. We all tried to forget about the odd experience. But on another occasion, while we were in the car, my grandpa looked in the rearview mirror at my brother and I. Seemingly out of nowhere, he asked us if we wanted to know what he, my girl cousin's parents, and David discussed that night. Immediately reminded of the event, I quickly nodded, and what he said was this. The reason why David and his wife got the house was because they could not afford their old one. When they found this house in the market, it was a steal. They bought it from the bank because the owner had killed himself in it. He hung himself in the basement, right in that very room above the desk. A couple of years after this, we found out that David and his wife sold the house, leaving that desk behind. Turns out they too had some very weird experiences there and were terrified. They bought themselves a small shack in the country and they were doing fine for a while. 
All in all, I guess it pays to do some research about the place you're gonna buy before you get stuck in some sort of haunted nightmare. Never take things from old houses, from Papa. The house that my dad and his sisters grew up in stood in the center of a very large property, and it was owned by his parents and their parents before him. The house was big and old. Even the furniture that came with the place was old, but it was beautiful Victorian-style furniture. I remember the place vividly, my brother and I grew up in it. We would spend Christmas holidays with dad's family every winter. I only have fond memories of the place. There was this one bed in my parents' room that was huge and gorgeous. It had these elaborate carvings in the wood and mirrors along the headrest with drawers on each side. Just by looking at it, you could tell the bed was ancient. So after my dad's parents passed away, the property underwent many years of dispute between my dad and his relatives. As a result, it was uninhabited for many years. One year around Christmas, my cousin had newly constructed her house not far from the property. She asked my dad's sister if she could borrow the bed for some time while she waited for her new bed to arrive. My aunt agreed, and my cousin took the bed to her place. That night, while she lay in the bed, trying to fall asleep, she heard a knock, knock sound, which woke her up. A few moments later, there it was again. At first, she thought that it might have been a rat or some bugs chewing on the bed frame, so she didn't really react to it. When the knocking came around again, this time more fierce, she was so frightened that she ran out of the room and called her father. Her father came over to the house to give her company, as it was just my cousin in her new home at the time. Her father said that he would spend the night with her, and that she didn't have to be scared anymore. They both went to sleep on that same bed, but the knocking came again not too long after. It was very loud and aggressive. Both my cousin and her dad were so scared. They left the house and only returned in the morning quickly taking that bed out and bringing it back to the old home. My aunt shared this story with me, telling me that that furniture and other things do not like to be separated from old homes, so it's best to just not disturb them. My ex-stepdad's house from Anonymous Back in my hometown when I lived with my ex-stepdad, he and my mom were still married back then. I believe the house we lived in was built on land that was once a quarantine zone. As we had a lot of experiences of the paranormal variety there. These occurrences included anything from shadow figures to whispering and even things being moved from where you put them. This is a compilation of the experiences my family and I have had that we could recall. One day, my mom was taking a nap in her king-sized bed. This was about four or so feet off the ground and fairly difficult for any small person to climb up on. She woke up when she felt something moving around at the foot of the bed. She told me that it felt like a small child or an animal trying to crawl up into the bed. There were no small children in the house at the time, and the only animals we had were a toy poodle that was too old to jump and a teacup Maltese puppy, both of which were also too small to jump up there onto the bed without human assistance. On another occasion, my sister had been sitting on one of the couches in the living room while I was still sleeping in my room down an L-shaped hallway. She said that she saw something white and about the height of our mother, walking from my mom and stepdad's room down the hallway before turning the corner and walking down to the end of the hall. She turned her head just as the figure turned the corner, so she didn't get a great look at it. She shrugged and assumed our mom was going to check on me after taking a shower and putting on a white robe, but maybe a minute after that, our mother actually came through the kitchen door opposite the hallway. 
so that couldn't have been her. Something happened to my stepdad one Christmas. He had been getting out the Christmas decorations and was climbing up a ladder to get to the roof. When he looked up, he saw a white winged figure sitting on top of the house. When he looked directly at it, it looked over at him for a moment before disappearing in a splash of light. Around the same time one night, I was reading a book and ended up falling asleep deeply. After maybe a few minutes though, I woke up to find my bed shaking violently side to side. When I told my mom the next day, she said that it may have been a small earthquake, but when it happened, I looked at my dresser and saw that the only thing that was moving in my room was my bed. I believe this may have something to do with my sister's experience. You see, my sister used to dream of this pair of twin children, about 10 or 11 years old in age. This was pretty coincidental considering my sister and I are twins too. In her dreams, these twins appear with bright red hair and were always wearing the same clothes. The girl would be wearing a little dress and the boy wore overalls with a frog or toad in the pocket. In her dreams, the boy would always be hiding and the girl would keep trying to get my sister to find him. These are really the most notable experiences we've had. We would also hear static and whispers at night, as if a TV was on in another room, only to see that everything was off for the night the next morning. Not to mention small objects would go missing for a while, only to be found where we'd already searched for them. Things went bump in the night, and I got used to them. The Glowing White Eyes from Anonymous I truly do believe in the paranormal. I believe my house is haunted and that there are other beings on this earth. This is why I'm not too scared when weird things go down. I've come to terms with it now especially after seeing and feeling strange things in the middle of the night. One Christmas, I'd been trying to find my Christmas stocking that I'd had since I was six years old. Not even thinking about it, I ran my fingers through my hair, and I instantly noticed that I felt rather greasy. So I went to my older sister's bathroom, getting ready to have a bath and wash my hair. I was listening to music and turning on the hot water when I heard a faint tapping sound. I listened for a moment, but then passed it off as the pipes shifting in the walls from the heat of the water. Then it happened again. I then looked over to the window and saw two white glowing spots outside the bathroom window. Immediately, my blood ran cold. I called out to my sister to check that she was still there. What do you want? I heard her grumpy voice shout. She hadn't left her room yet. I looked back to the window and the eyes were still staring. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Those eyes seemed to blink as well. What did they belong to? I wondered. The more I stared at them, the more details I made out. I could see the top of the thing's head and the faint outline of a smile. Suddenly, as I was about to give in and run out of the bathroom, the security light in my neighbor's driveway turned on, and I saw the head of the beast turn away. I heard a scraping of plastic, as if it was sliding down the drain pipe. I got out of the bath, and I went to my bedroom. I then went downstairs and acted normal. I've used that bathroom plenty of times prior, but never saw any eyes. There was no way that what I saw was simply light from the bathroom or a reflection. There was definitely something outside my sister's bedroom, something watching and moving around through the window that night. I've even dreamt about it before, had nightmares of its wrinkly skin, deep sunken eyes and yellow teeth. I've no idea what it is. I hate the thought of this thing watching me. There's no telling what it wants, but to say the very least, I am never, ever using my sister's bathroom again. I'm just not gonna risk it. 
Christmas Tree Ghost, submitted by Dr. Mistroff. It was a week before Christmas. I just decorated my room for the season. I lived on my own back then, and I didn't have much money to spend. In that particular year, I really wanted a real tree, and not one of the fake ones. So I spent the day going around town to find a tree that was my price. At the normal stores, the trees were very expensive, but luckily, I knew a tree farm just out of town, a place I remembered going to as a child. I took my old car on a short trip. It was almost dark by then and extremely foggy on the road. After a 15 minute drive, I was at the local farm. I followed the sounds of chainsaws until I found the farmhouse. There, the farmer, a friend of my father's, was there. After a bit of catching up, he gave me a tree at an unreasonably good price. He even helped me getting the tree in the car. I paid him and drove back home excitedly. I felt like an adult for some reason. I felt like I made a good purchase this year. Back at home, I began to decorate the tree. I had a bunch of Christmas lights and red glass ornamental balls. It was very lovely. After decorating, I watched one of the Harry Potter movies. They always aired around Christmas for one reason or another, but I loved Harry Potter. But after half an hour or so, I was already falling asleep in front of the TV. I woke up in the middle of the night. It was really late, I don't know when exactly. The TV channel was now only airing those late night infomercials and music. When I stood up, I noticed something strange. The lights on the tree that I had just put on, that I had just bought a few days ago, weren't coming on properly. I walked over to the tree to try to fix it. At the tree, I was facing one of the ornamental red balls. It reflected my face like a mirror. When I was younger, I always loved looking into them. You always got a funny, rounder, and off-color reflection of your own face. But this reflection, it wasn't fun at all, because I saw my face as you would expect. But behind me, in the reflection of that ornament, I saw a man standing there. What details I could gather showed me that his clothes were ripped and torn, and he seemed to be missing his right arm. That was all the details I could gather before I was forced to jump and turn around to face my intruder. But when I turned, I saw that there was no one there it was still just me in the living room with the TV on and the volume low. Speaking of the TV, a few seconds after I'd turned around, the channel just clicked off, replaced with one of those white noise fuzz screens. And with it, the white noise seemed to jump up in volume until it was so loud it made me jump and cover my ears. I ran over, still covering my ears, and quickly used one of my hands to switch off the TV. By then, it was dark and quiet, and I was covered in goosebumps. The hairs on my body were standing on end. I went to bed in a hurry. I locked my bedroom door, even though I lived alone, and I didn't get much sleep that night. Instead, I lied awake wondering, can trees be haunted too? Masquerade Ball Horror, submitted by Forbidden Planet. This happened not too long ago. Believe it or not, when I was 22, I was an amateur model in New York. I started out in shopping catalogs and eventually even was lucky enough to participate in some of the latest and hottest runways it was the time in my life I believed that I peaked, and I was extremely happy that I had achieved so much. Though I was so young, I was a very grateful young woman. But when you work with your physical form like that, you're bound to get attention that's not warranted. The first time I noticed somebody interested in me in a very negative, stalking way was when I was driving home one night. 
someone in a black minivan was following me in my car, almost all the way back to my apartment. I knew the van was tailing me, and the way they drove, it seemed like they were trying not to be noticed. They gave me plenty of space at all times, but even when I made turns that I didn't need to take to test them, they turned every time with me. I knew that they were following me. When this realization hit me, it sent shivers up my spine. Before returning home, I had one last idea to try to lose them, but it might be risky. I turned on my emergency lights and pulled over to the side of the road. I wanted to see if the van would stop. If they did and someone got out, I would floor it down the road. But as soon as I pulled my car over, the van kept going. Smart move by them. As they passed, I unfortunately couldn't see inside because of how tinted the van's windows were. I was sure they could see me, but I couldn't see them. Anyway, I breathed a sigh of relief. I got back on the road after they disappeared and I continued home. I wondered who they might be, why exactly they were stalking me, but I soon almost forgot all about it as business began to pick up. And a week or so later, I met a gentleman named Tom, someone I soon began to date. Tom worked an office job in the city and we could see each other pretty often. He was a romantic guy, taking me out to dinner every weekend. But one of these weekend evenings, it was dark and raining, as Tom and I were coming out of a restaurant after a nice hot meal. We were walking along the street when I saw a huge shape following us. Again, I wasn't sure if they were following us or if it was a coincidence, but the man's shape continued to grow closer and closer until I was scared enough to tell Tom about it. Tom did a very unnoticeable sideways look and agreed that the person was indeed following us. At one point, we even crossed the street and headed back down the opposite direction. But when we looked behind us again, the man was even closer now, still coming. Eventually, we got in a taxi just to get away from that weird man. Unfortunately, the whole time we couldn't see his face. He was wearing a black fedora, long black coat. He was holding an umbrella and wearing a scarf that covered half of his face. And since it'd been raining anyway, we really didn't see much of him. At the end of that year, I had a great Christmas with my family and Tom. And a few weeks before Christmas, Tom mentioned that his company was going to have a masquerade ball for New Year's Eve and asked me to go with him. And I said, of course, because that sounded insanely fun. I'd never been to a masquerade ball. The party was more grand than I thought it would be like some sort of expensive setup out of a movie. And of course, everyone was wearing masks of different kinds. It was as mysterious as it was exciting. The idea was to take off the masks when the clock struck 12 to introduce the new year. In the meantime, Tom and I were dancing and drinking and mingling with the other office workers. I then began to dance with Tom once more. In the midst of our fun, Tom told a joke and I started laughing. And the moment I closed my eyes to rear back my head for a big guttural laugh, someone grabbed me by my arm and yanked me back. Within moments, I was 10, 15 yards away from Tom, who I could see in the crowd still, glancing in every direction, trying to find me. Hey, let go of me, I said, and then I turned around to face the figure the same towering figure that had been following us that date night. For a second, my breathing stopped. Then my heart rate ramped up. What do you think you're doing? I said to him. Under his mask, he didn't turn to look at me. Instead, he hurried through the crowd before he got noticed. With all the noise and excitement and people around us, nobody noticed that I was being dragged away by some menacing stranger. When I finally could move on my own, I began to kick and scream and push at the man, but he was far too strong to let go, and no matter what I did, it didn't even make him flinch. I was praying that someone would notice 
that someone would put down their glass of wine and look in my direction. With my free hand, I threw off my mask and screamed a life or death screech at the top of my lungs. Instantly, the party goers stopped. The man stopped as well. He turned to look at me with his mask still on. By then, everyone was looking towards us. In one quick second, he let go of me and began to race out of the building. People rushed to my aid and Tom ran toward me, asking me where he went. I pointed in the direction he ran off to, but I wasn't able to say anything. I was too busy crying. The man wasn't apprehended. We still had no idea who he was or what his motives were. And after that night, I was left with this fear in the back of my mind that I was being followed at all times. Someone was trying to take me. After that, I had trouble going out alone anymore. I had trouble sleeping alone. I ended up moving in with Tom a bit early, just so I didn't have to be alone anymore. I can't wait until this nightmare is over. Even a few years later, now, it still feels like it's going on, even though I haven't seen that man again. I guess I can't feel safe until I know he's behind bars. I'll never forgive him for the way he's made me feel. The Man in the Window, submitted by Lynx4455. It was Christmas Eve, and we were just beginning to open up a few early presents. My grandmother had come along for the occasion and had brought a few gifts of her own. She bought my mother a new blender, and she brought over a few little toys for the younger children. I'd gotten a handbook for a game I was obsessed with at the time, Resident Evil 5. My younger sister had never really played with dolls, but always eagerly asked for them and saw them as acceptable gifts during the holidays. Today was no exception. My grandmother had brought over a badly used doll she was clearly giving away in an attempt to flush out clutter and junk. The doll wasn't wearing any clothes, exposing the moldy blotches that stained its belly. The doll's abdomen was made of soft fabric, while the limbs and head were made of aged yellow plastic. Its hair was crimped and blonde, its lips bent in an awkward smile, and its eyes were fixated eerily, as if it was just staring into space. Although the most notable feature was its robotic-looking arm, Apparently, you were supposed to shove a pencil in its hand and press a button or something. The doll would then scribble something on the paper placed in front of her. Our doll, being considerate of this stage of use and decay, had lost that feature due to either overuse or neglect. That robotic arm had all the cloth stripped of it, so many of the mechanical parts below were exposed. To add insult to injury, the hand was missing. All in all, we were left with this creepy doll for Christmas Eve. For whatever reason though, my sister adored it and went upstairs to fix it up right away. When she finally returned, the doll was fancied with a nice little outfit and its hair was neatly brushed. It wore some tiny flannel underneath navy blue overalls she had even put together a little cast from toilet paper to wrap around the disfigured arm. I never was really a fan of dolls or anything meant to mimic a human being like that. Hearing the legends of Robert and Annabelle the dolls kept me far and away from those kinds of things. Things didn't really start to get weird until a few weeks after the Christmas party when my sister lost interest in the thing as I expected her to. The doll was just kinda set there at the top of her dresser, untouched. Being in a room with that doll, or any doll in general, it always made me feel uneasy, which is why I get irritable when my sisters play with junk outside their room and don't put it back. I was binging Gmod and Don't Starve with a friend of mine. It was the weekend, and we were allowed to stay up as long as we desired. It was around one in the morning, and I was getting tired by then. 
My friend and I said our goodbyes and parted for the evening. I was caught in that eerie dead of night scenario. Our house, which is usually full of rambunctious and loud children, was painfully quiet. Not a soul was awake. Now on my dresser next to my computer, I have a large TV set up there. It gives off a very clear reflection and pretty much exposes everything behind me. I often use it to check my paranoia to see if someone is creeping up behind me. So when I did it this time, however, it only made me feel worse because that doll was in clear view of the reflection propped up against my bed frame. It somewhat startled me. It had creeped me out even more that I hadn't noticed it sooner. I rose up from my swirling chair to deal with it. I held it in my hands, not knowing what to do with it. I was originally going to return it to my sister's room, but I feared entering the pitch blackness downstairs. I instead tossed it in a bin at the foot of the stairs, filled with other forgotten toys. I was fairly creeped out at that point and couldn't really sleep. I turned on a movie to take my mind off of it. Around halfway through the movie, I heard something outside my room. It was like a child's laugh, but only if that child had a hole in its throat. That's the kind of noise I was talking about. I ignored it at first, but the sound continued. I paused the movie and advanced outside of my room, my phone flashlight in hand. My heart was racing now as I surveyed the area. I then heard an odd laugh coming from the toy bin. Now stay with me here. I know you're probably rolling your eyes, but believe me, the majority of the toys in the bin were activated, like someone had pushed all of their buttons at the same time. And Susie Scribbles, the doll, lay at the top, worming her arm, mechanical arm, around. Other mechanical dolls around her stomped their feet and shook their heads. Beneath her came this distorted laugh. One of the doll's voice features was going off, but it was low on batteries, so its intended voice didn't come out quite right. I was creeped out of my mind. I was tempted to alert my mother, but I, but I hesitated. I chose to ignore it, knowing there wasn't much I could possibly do at the time, especially in the middle of the night. I shut my door and resumed my movie. As the movie came to a close, I alerted my ears of any sound and there was nothing. It was quiet again. I was relieved. The dolls had finally stopped. I felt safe enough to go to bed, but let's just say I didn't sleep very well. When I told my mother about the incident, they were just as creeped out as I was, but they took no action against it. We just kind of swept it under the rug. We had been out and about doing chores and errands that day and returned later that night. When we got back, we decided to sit down and relax to the remaining Christmas movies that were still airing. What happened the rest of that night was anything but relaxing. For whatever reason, our dog was extremely agitated. He's a tiny chihuahua, so he always gets on edge when we have company over. But unlike those other times, we didn't have any guests that night. He took a stance and began to bark frantically at something downstairs. A little on edge ourselves, we pulled our tiny dog away and set him on the bed in hopes of calming him down. We closed and locked the bedroom door on the way back, but to no avail, he just hopped off of the bed and continued to bark at the now closed bedroom door as if someone was out there, someone who wasn't supposed to be here. We all just kind of sat there and looked at him, confused and unnerved. Then suddenly, he let out a whimper and hid under the bed. We attempted to retrieve him, but we were only met with vicious bites and growls. Even my mother knew something was off about our dog's sporadic behavior. My mom decided to check it out, walking out of the bedroom, and then she walked downstairs. Shortly after, she came back upstairs, saying that there's no one else in the house, thank God, but that she did find this. She was holding that doll. 
She said it was at the bottom of the staircase. That night, I woke up from a nightmare, only to hear crying coming from outside the bedroom door. It was my baby brother. I stumbled out of bed to see what the fuss was about. My mother was already on the scene, cradling him in her arms. Between distraught breaths and cries, he would mumble, there was a man outside my window. This honest to God scared me really bad. When she saw me listening and seeing my brother act like that, she shooed me away, saying that she had it under control. I went back to bed but just laid there, my brother's cries still audible outside my room. After that night, I never felt safe. I always checked the darkened windows, expecting to see something spooky to pop out, always expecting a man's silhouette to be there. The next day I found out that my mother has been waking from very stressful nightmares as well, but for a longer time than I'd been. Strange things came and went after that, such as our kitchen cabinets opening and closing when no one was in the kitchen. At the time, I thought I was getting used to it. After a week or so, I stopped being as scared as I used to be. On one morning, when I awoke early to water the sunflowers in our garden, I was very happy. The trees in the backyard were beautiful as they twinkled. The birds chirped loudly and clear as I rose from my bed. I was eager to leave the house, eager to get outside for the first time in forever. As I was slipping on my socks and shoes, I soon noticed something moving outside my bedroom window. I saw what confirmed my fears of looking out of a window. It was a brown, slender figure stumbling across the window's view, as if they were injured or melancholy. Honestly, it reminded me more of the Redeads from Zelda than anything. I was frozen, eyes completely wide open, my heart pounding. Before seeing that, I was finally coming to terms that, that what my brother may have been crying about was just a nightmare. But waking up and seeing that out of my window, I didn't feel like going outside any longer. One night, we had decided to get rid of that doll. Things only started acting up once we received it. Something we should have done a long time ago was get rid of the dang thing. It was just plain out ugly, and most of my family blamed it for the strange occurrences that had been happening. My grandmother stopped over one night for dinner. We chatted and left all our problems behind us. I retrieved the doll at one point from the laundry room and tossed it out on the front porch. It lay there, face down, on the chipping wood planks. It was out of our house, ready to be taken away. Dinner soon came to an end and my grandmother was just about to leave. My grandmother and mom began to chatter for obnoxiously long periods of time, as they always did. They both stood outside as I patiently waited outside on the porch, staring down at the doll, making a statement. That's when I noticed it was moving. The doll was shaking. I stood up, my heart rate elevating by the second. I didn't see it coming. The doll rolled over and repositioned itself onto its back. It seemed to stare at me with those cold blue eyes. In response, I just mumbled, screw this. I ran over to inform my mother and both of us being spooked, we basically shoved it to my grandmother who took it and said goodbye. My grandmother was soon pulling out of the driveway, taking that doll with her. And that was that. The haunting stopped, the strange occurrences were no more, and the dog was finally calm again. I don't know the history of that doll, but when I get a place of my own, I'm not gonna let a doll like that come anywhere near me. Even still, to this day, I'm wary of windows, because I feel like every time I look out of one, I'll once again see the man in the window. The Shadow, submitted by Amber. I used to live in California in an old two-story house. I loved that house, 
and when we moved out, I was sad. But hearing my family telling their creepiest experience from that house for the first time, it doesn't make me miss it as much. All of their stories were creepy, but my sister's was the worst. It was Christmas. My parents were working that day, but they were set to be home early because it was a holiday after all. My sister was home wrapping the gifts up until she realized she ran out of tape. So she called up a friend to see if she was available to go to Walmart. She said that she could go, but they would have to wait for her sister to come after they were done shopping. They arrived at Walmart and bought whatever they needed. After that, they waited outside for the friend's sister. It took a while because she had some things to do first. My sister, getting impatient, said that she would just go ahead and walk home. She had plenty to do and didn't want to be kept waiting. When she got home, she opened the gate and was about to walk in until she saw something. Now, we never have our backyard light on, but our neighbors do. So my sister was able to make out the shape of a man sitting down with his legs crossed, looking forward. My sister looked back and forth at the light bulb to the shadow to see if there was something weird making that shape. Then the worst part happened. The shadow itself turned its head towards my sister's direction. She jumped at the sudden movement and ran for the door. My sister pounded on the door, hoping that someone would let her in to save her from this horrible experience. Eventually, my grandma opened the door and let her inside. That night, she couldn't go to her room and sleep because her room was above the place she saw the shadow, so she slept in my brother's room. The floor was better than her own bedroom, where she might see that shadow thing again. It was only after we moved that my parents told us that anyone that moved into that house never really stayed for long. Disappearing Santa, submitted by Christina. This story happened when I was eight years old. It was the night before Christmas, and I wanted to spend the night with my cousin, Beth. We lived next door to each other, so my parents said it was okay as long as we woke up and came straight home so that we could open presents and have Christmas breakfast. I agreed, and then got my sleeping bag and went on over to my cousin's place. Now, I must tell you, my cousin's house was rumored to be haunted, but at the time, at that age, we didn't believe it. That day, nothing really happened. We played and watched TV until about 9 p.m., then my aunt told us it was bedtime. Beth climbed into her bed and I laid down in my sleeping bag. We talked a while about what we thought we'd be getting for Christmas the next morning. I must have fallen asleep talking because the next thing I knew, Beth was shaking me awake. Startled, I sat up and asked what was going on. Beth had this deer in the headlights look. She seemed to be panicking and pale. She pointed to the living room and said, I just saw someone, there's a man. He looked around my door at me and saw that I was awake. Now I was definitely scared, but logic kicked in. I told her she must have been dreaming. Then we heard what sounded like someone washing dishes. We heard the clink, clink, clink of dishes. We looked at one another. I got up and tiptoed to the door of her room, then looked out. There was nothing. I waved her to come with me and we slipped out of her room quietly. We went down to the living room where we had a good view of the kitchen. I still can't believe what we saw that night. There was a tall man wearing a Santa outfit standing in her kitchen and there was a woman getting plates and cups out of the dish drainer and placing them on their table. We were absolutely shocked and then the tall man looked in our direction. Half of his face was gone, just hanging off of what did remain. The woman stopped what she was doing as well and we could see that her throat was opened up. Beth let out this scream, but I couldn't do anything as I was completely frozen. When Beth screamed, 
both the woman and the man just disappeared, like into thin air. Beth's parents came running and asked what was going on. I was still too scared to speak, but Beth was crying and screaming and telling them about the man and woman. Finally, I found my voice when I realized I was safe again. When Beth settled down, we both told her parents what we had seen, and amazingly, they did believe us. My aunt went to clean up the broken plates while our uncle took us back to Beth's room. He told us to try to get some sleep, and they would talk to us in the morning, but sleep didn't come for either of us. The next morning, my uncle told us that we had seen some ghosts and that their house was indeed haunted, but he didn't believe that they were there to hurt us. I never believed it. I went home and told my parents what had happened, and needless to say, I never went back to Beth's for sleepovers. Instead, she would have to come to my place. I've never seen something so horrid in my life. I saw a dinosaur at Christmas from Arsenal R. 15th. It was Christmas Eve night. My family and I were watching the Polar Express, as we usually did every year. When the film ended and the credits began to roll, my mom asked me to go and blow out the candles on the windowsill. I did as she asked. I blew out the candles and I reached up to close the blinds. But just before I could close them, I stopped and just stared at what I saw. Outside in the front garden, rolling around in the snow, were four animals that were no bigger than a house cat. They were covered in white feathers except for their faces, hands, and feet. They had slender snouts, three clawed fingers, and three clawed toes, except one toe was curled to look like a sickle claw that are seen in raptors. Their skin was gray in color, but I couldn't see their eyes. They playfully snapped their jaws at each other and tackled each other to the ground. I didn't know what to say or do. I just stared at them in wonderment. Was I actually seeing dinosaurs? I was so focused on these creatures, I didn't notice that my dad was speaking to me. All I heard was, Hey, what are you looking at? From my dad. I didn't take my eyes off of these creatures. I whispered to him, You need to see this. My dad got up from the couch and walked over to me. I pointed out the window and he looked in that direction. I watched his face as his eyes widened at the sight. Are those what I think they are? I nodded in agreement. Just then, my mom walked over to us, asking us what we were looking at. My dad turned his head, facing her, and putting a finger to his lips. He made a hand gesture for her to come over. My mom walked over to the window, and she gasped at what she saw. We were all awestruck. We couldn't believe it. Real dinosaurs. Millions of years of supposedly being extinct, and yet here they were in our front garden. I couldn't help but smile at what I was seeing, until I heard my dad gasp. What is it? I asked. He pointed to the right and I saw what he saw. Emerging from the forest was what I could only assume to be the mother. It must have stood about 1.8 to 2 meters tall and about 5 to 7 meters in length, and it possessed the same features as the babies, white feathers and skin exposed on the head, feet, and hands. It walked out of the forest and into our front garden where the little ones were. The baby raptors cocked their heads as their mother approached them. The mother raptor then lowered her head and nuzzled at the babies. This was truly an amazing sight to see. Just showed that even some of the scariest creatures in nature are also caring parents. We all watched in amazement as the mother raptor raised her head and began to walk forward with her babies following behind her. 
The mother raptor then walked in front of our porch. Then the porch light lit up our front garden. The mother stopped in her tracks and looked in the direction of the porch light. She seemed to snarl at it, revealing razor-sharp teeth. Then the amazement of the raptors turned into terror as the mother raptor looked in our direction. Unable to move, we all just stood there frozen in terror at the sight. The mother raptor hissed at us before turning her direction towards the woods, running off with her babies following after. I sat in bed that night, unable to sleep from the experience. I mean, how could anyone sleep after seeing real dinosaurs alive? It must have been 2.45 a.m. Christmas Day, when I swear I could hear the sound of snow crunching outside. Someone or something was moving around out there. Quietly, I moved over to my window and looked out at the front garden, and I saw her again, the mother raptor. She was in the front garden again, but this time her babies were not with her. She had returned on her own. The large raptor walked over to the window my parents and I had been at before and peered inside. I grabbed my phone and turned on the flashlight to get a better look. That was a big mistake. It caught her attention. She was now looking up at my window. Quickly, I pulled away from the window, and I ran to the corner of my room. My heart was beating out of my chest. I nearly had a heart attack when I heard the scraping sound outside the house. I think it was trying to climb up. I could hardly breathe when I saw its silhouette lit by the moon as the raptor reached my window. I heard a snarl and claws scratching across my window. Unable to withstand the pressure, the glass burst, shattering all over the floor of my bedroom. The creature pulled the upper part of its body into my room, letting out an ear-piercing roar. I screamed in response. Then, my door swung open. My dad stood there with a pistol in hand. He aimed and fired at the creature several times. The beast snarled again before yanking itself backwards out the window, landing with a thud in the snow before darting off into the woods. It's been a few years since this happened to me. I still live in that house with my parents, and I always wonder when Christmas comes around if maybe I'll see those raptors again, because every so often I swear I can hear roaring and snarling coming from that forest. My Dead Best Friend Submitted by Jake Let me start off by saying that this is my husband's story. I will call him Jake. These are true events taken from him and his mother. The story starts in 1996. At the time, my husband would have been around five. He lived with his mother and grandmother in a small rural town. His mother, who worked at the local gas station at the time, was friends with this woman. Let's call her Stacy. My husband's mother is named Pam. Stacy and Jake's mother hit it off instantly. They were the same age, they worked together, and they had everything in common. And they both only had one child. Stacy had a son named Chris. Chris and Jake also became best friends. Their mothers would take them on playdates and sleepovers all the time because both mothers were single and still living with their parents. Jake and Chris were even chicken pox buddies as Jake caught it simultaneously from Chris. They attended school together and they even went to Cub Scouts together. When the boys were around seven years old, Jake and his mother moved from her mother's house into a town about an hour away. So after that, Jake and Chris didn't see very much of each other. In fact, the last time they saw each other was for Jake's seventh birthday. Not long after that birthday, though, is when tragedy struck. Chris and his mother Stacy still lived with their parents. And one day, while Stacy was at work, his grandfather was watching him after school. They were in the garage. His grandfather was fixing up his car. But he ran into the house real quick to see if he could find his wrench, and he left Chris alone in the garage for only what seemed like a minute. When his grandfather came back into the garage, he found Chris under some large metal poles that were in the corner of the garage. 
I don't know much past this part, only that he must have been playing too close to the pipes and they fell on top of him. The grandfather called 911, but he was pronounced dead when the ambulance arrived. But that's not where the story ends. Pam decided to take Jake to Chris's visitation to help him process his death. My husband says he was too young to remember much. All he can really remember is the funeral home, the flowers, and the sadness. Not long after the visitation, Pam noticed that Jake had an imaginary friend, a friend who he began to call Chris. His mother didn't think much of it, she asked other parents about it, and they all said it was just children processing death their own way, completely normal. Well, time went on, and his imaginary friend did not go away. They eventually moved back in with Pam's mother because Pam was going through a rough divorce. Things began to calm down and half a year passed. However, the imaginary friend named Chris, he was still there. One day before Christmas, Pam and her mother took Jake to Walmart to look for lights and decorations for the Christmas tree. They made a short stop down the toy aisle, and of course, Jake went crazy, like all seven-year-old kids would do when they go down the toy aisle. As they traveled down the Toy Express, Jake noticed a plastic electric guitar that would play songs with the push of a button. He asked his mom to grab it so he could play with it. Pam, of course, being five foot two, could not reach the toy herself. It was on a very high shelf, so Pam and her mother looked around the corners for a Walmart associate. Then they heard Jake say while they were searching around the corner, it's okay, Chris said he would play it for me. Pam and her mom both rolled their eyes as they walked on to find a sales associate still, when suddenly, the guitar lit up from the high shelf and began to play the long, exaggerated guitar rhythms. Pam and her mother stared at Jake in disbelief, because there was no way in hell that he could have reached it, let alone them. They paused for a moment, and then the guitar fell from the shelf and onto the floor. Jake looked at them, grinning, I told you Chris could do it, he can do anything now. Pam and her mother were extremely terrified. They left the aisle immediately, still in disbelief of what they had just witnessed. To this day, my husband only remembers bits and pieces of this, and he has absolutely no recollection of the incident at the store. Jake's mother recently told me this story. She also told me that she spoke to Chris's mother, Stacy, about five years ago only to learn that Stacy had also been experiencing the same type of events. She said that Chris had never left. Stacy gave birth to a daughter in 2002, and soon enough, her young daughter started to experience the same things. She eventually got an imaginary friend. It was a friend she called Chris. I sometimes wonder if that's all possible. See, I'm a big skeptic of ghosts myself, especially the ghosts of children, because I was born and raised Baptist but my husband believes the story without a doubt because he remembers his imaginary friend here and there, but he says to me that it wasn't so imaginary for him. It started on the night before Christmas. Submitted by Kid. Something happened on the night before Christmas a few years ago. My sister and I were in her room putting up clothes as we share a closet. While I was busy hanging them up, I heard what sounded like the toilet lid slam shut in the bathroom, and of course it shocked me, it was very loud. So when I finished hanging the shirt I was on, I went to the bathroom to check out the noise, and the toilet lid was down. This was creepy because we were the only ones in the house. So I yelled back down into the hallway, asking my sister if she had left the toilet lid down, she said no, she hadn't used it since I had last. I figured maybe she just forgot or maybe it was just some sort of gravity or temperature thing, but it's never done that before. I've always believed in the paranormal, so this kind of freaked me out. As I walked back into the hallway towards her room, I glanced over to my doorway and the light that was on just flicked off and not a second later, we both heard a loud crash come from the kitchen. Quickly and without a word, we together went down to the kitchen to check it out. Nothing was out of place and there was no one there. So I made a joke about it, just being the ghost of a Christmas witch, though we were both pretty creeped out. Tasteless as it was, we went back to her room with my head focused on the floor and on the way back, I saw a shadow move in the doorway. Now, embarrassingly, I let out a bit of a squill as it had really surprised me and my sister looked at me like I was weird. I asked her if she saw that and she said no. It was all just so bizarre. Even still, me just asking her if she saw something seemed to creep her out even more, 
So we ran to her room and closed the door, and we called our parents on the phone, but they didn't answer. Then we tried my sister's phone, and they actually answered that time. We told them what we heard, and I could tell they were getting worried. So I told them that we could tough it out until they got back. I both wanted to rush them, and I didn't want to be rude. I was scared, and I didn't want us to be alone any longer. Yet they were a county over, and that was 15 miles away. So we waited about 40 minutes for them to get here. Luckily, that was it for the night, yet there were other events all during my Christmas break that were very creepy, and I didn't get any good sleep until Christmas break was over. On multiple nights, I had set up at night with my light on and the door open, just waiting, and I had this horrible, palpable feeling that something was watching me. On the worst night, my aunt and mom were talking across the hall in my mom's room. I had my back turned to the door and had a sheet covering me. Then all of a sudden, that feeling came again of someone watching me. I started to get scared again, and I heard a footstep in my room. It was unmistakable coming from my room, yet I was the only one in there, and only a few moments later, I felt something jump onto the bed with me, and my bed began to shake, and my bed doesn't shake very easily, and just as quickly as it happened, it all stopped. After that Christmas break, nothing big has happened, and I'm pretty glad for that. I don't honestly know what's up with our house and why it only happened during the Christmas break, considering it never happened in the past, and it hasn't happened since. But so long as it's quiet, I'm happy, and I hope it stays quiet. I don't wish this kind of feeling on anyone, that strong sense of helpless fear. I can't wait to get out of here. Submitted by French of Fire. I moved to my current apartment less than a year ago. I live in a busy student city in Europe, and I had almost given up on finding a new reasonably priced apartment when I got an offer from one of the housing associations that I had applied to. I went to see the apartment and nearly couldn't believe my luck. It was recently renovated and spacious. The area was a dream and the rent was way lower than I had expected. I would have gladly accepted a much worse offer in order to not have to live under a bridge, so I was more than happy to accept this one. I got the keys and I moved in two weeks later. The first few weeks went nicely. I was still on Christmas holiday, so I could just enjoy the peace and quiet from my new apartment. I was happy to notice that there was apparently no extra activity in the house. You know what I mean. Having lived my whole younger life in places that were more or less riddled with the paranormal crap I had grown used to, I had never enjoyed it. Unfortunately, I was very wrong. I'm no writer, but I'll try to list some of the most significant things that happened that have led me to considering searching for a new place to live. It turned out to be a very creepy Christmas holiday. One day, I was walking to the small hall of my home to take something from the wardrobe. The moment I stepped in, I felt a very weird presence right behind me, and in a matter of seconds, this wild and irrational sense of horror and threat just surrounded me. It froze my nerves to the point I had a hard time walking back to the kitchen. This messed with my mind pretty bad. It just literally came from nowhere. I was shaking and tearing up and actually had to call my mother to get over it. Now, I'm not a sensitive person in the least and I have no history of anxiety or panic disorders or any other mental problems. And I wasn't even thinking about anything fear-inducing. So this was very out of the ordinary. The same pattern repeated itself a few times after that too. One time I came home and the whole hallway smelled like aftershave and leather. The smell was so strong that it irritated my nose. As soon as I got past the hallway, it just disappeared. I don't know where that smell came from. All the windows were closed. Another time, my bathroom suddenly started smelling like expensive perfume in the middle of the day. I know old smells can stay for a long time, but this wasn't it. I mean, it came one second as strong as a scent can, only to completely disappear a few minutes later. After the first incident, the atmosphere of the house changed pretty clearly. Those intense feelings of a presence somewhere behind me and things looking at me got worse and worse. It was similar to the feeling you get when you catch someone looking at you, except I was alone in my house. It felt like I had a terrible sixth sense. The next weird thing happened while I was lying on my bed, playing on my phone. It was noon and I was alone. The way my house is set up is my bed is an alcove and only a long wall separates it from the hallway. So clear as day, I heard someone walking through my hall. 
and if that wasn't bad enough, I heard them clearly press the bathroom door close less than five feet away from me. That door is broken, and it has to be pressed with force or it doesn't click shut, but something did. Something I couldn't see clicked it shut itself. Maybe 10 seconds later, I heard paper bags in my kitchen start to rustle around, like someone was crumpling them in their hand. Needless to say, I was petrified. After that, I would occasionally be reading a book on my bed or something like that, when I would start to hear footsteps in the hallway. They sounded more like animals than people, and I could hear the clicking of nails. At first, I tried to convince myself that it was the house settling, that I shouldn't be such a scaredy cat. Once, the footsteps sounded like they were moving in a circle in my hallway, and I had the guts to go check it out. The moment I peeked my head out of the doorway, there was nothing there, and the footsteps stopped, and only a moment later, they started coming right at me and stopped maybe one foot away. I said nope, shut my door, locked it, and went back to my book, trying to forget about it. Just writing about that experience made my hair stand on end. I don't know what I would have done had I actually seen something in the hallway. A few nights after that one, I woke up suddenly in the middle of the night, and I was full alert. I sat up in my bed feeling disturbed, but hesitating to look around. After some time, I finally did, and immediately I wanted to cry for my mom, because on the corner of my sofa was a man sitting and watching me. It was like he was waiting for me to wake up. I can still remember him clearly. He was leaning back, legs crossed, head slightly tilted, and dressed in a dark suit. His skin was black and his hair was shoulder length. It was braided into small braids and each one ended in a red bead. He had crossed his hands. I looked into his eyes and I swear to God, he looked back at me. He saw me. The moment our eyes met, there was something of a connection that comes when two human beings lock eyes and you're one of them and you know the other one can see you as well. I can't really explain it beyond that. Anyway, I was frightened and the fact that this man did not seem surprised or scared in the least, it only added to that feeling. I know I said I'm not a sensitive person, but I swear I'm quickly becoming a nervous wreck. I looked away for a moment in fear and it was that same fear that made me face him again. But when I turned back, he had disappeared. I stayed up the rest of that night. I slept with the lights on for the next few weeks. I never saw the man again and hopefully I won't. Not long after that last incident, I would start waking up regularly with the worst feeling of paranoia. It was horrible. I've never felt anything like that before or after. I was sure there was someone else in my apartment. I couldn't move, I was so scared. There was a period of time I would go around my house every night and every morning and check everywhere in case there was someone else living with me. Of course, there wasn't. It was around this time that I talked to my neighbors and I learned that the previous tenant, an old man, had died in my box only a month before I moved in. That might explain something. The last thing worth mentioning is that my bed began to get made on its own. The first time was two months ago. I was out working, and when I came back, my bed was suddenly made. I'm a filthy person, and I never even make my own bed, so I know it wasn't me. It's an impossibility. Of course, right after, I checked my cupboards and the like again around my house to make sure it was all empty, to make sure I was alone, or at the very least, to make sure nothing had been stolen. I even called the service center of my area, but they hadn't sent anyone to my house since I hadn't asked, and entry was prohibited without permission. Only a few weeks later, it happened again. This time, my duvet had been crumpled in a big ball at the end of my bed. I actually have a photo of it. Because I'm an idiot, I still continued my denial game, and I didn't even call the police or the service center this time. Anyway, the third time it happened was only a week ago, and I was at home myself. I left my bed unmade and went to the bathroom. While I was doing my makeup, I heard what sounded like a hand sweep the door lightly from the direction of the hall. I didn't think much of it, because I thought I had just imagined it. But when I went back to my room, my bed was once again made. Pillows were piled and a book I had been reading was hidden under the duvet. I never left the house, I was alone. I've spent the last few days searching for a new job so I could move out as soon as possible and leave this house and whatever insists on living here with me behind. 
I'm pretty sure I've managed to conjure up its wrath now, and my remaining time here is going to be a living hell or something. Again, the worst of it happened on my last Christmas holiday, and I'm scared it'll spike up again on this Christmas. Well, thanks for listening. A Christmas Scary Story Submitted by Caitlin Growing up, I never really had anything to do with clowns. Not that I was scared of them, my parents just never did anything clown-related, so I never thought much of it when I was young. I thought my parents didn't want me to be one of those kids who were needlessly scared of them. I can recall when I was maybe eight or so, my parents were sitting at the table with some friends. It was a cold night, maybe a couple of days before Christmas. I remember feeling the holiday spirit all around. Throughout the night, I could tell by my dad's look that he was stressed out about something. He looked to have something very painful on his mind. Sure enough, later, I heard him telling a story. And once I walked into the room to listen, he stopped and he looked at me. He was quiet for a moment before picking me up, kissing my head, and we went to go watch a movie together. I wondered for a bit what it was that scared him, but I was eight and I was waiting and excited for Christmas to come, and it was right around the corner. So dad's story quickly was off my mind. But it wasn't until 2015, almost a year after my dad had passed away, my sister told me what story he had been telling everyone that night about the memory that rose back to the top of my father's mind during that pre-Christmas get together. Alcohol can really bring up the past. My father was born and raised in Chicago. In 1977, he was about 18 or 19, and he went to a gay bar with his friend Ronan, who was 19 at the time. They wanted to score some drugs. A man came up to them offering not only drugs, but a job working on his house. My dad got a bad feeling about the man, and he said no, but his friend Ronan took the offer. Later on, Ronan's body was found in the crawl space of the home he was supposed to be working on, the home that belonged to John Wayne Gacy. The Worst Christmas Submitted by Freddy P. With Christmas right around the corner, I figured it would be a nice time to share this experience I had with a very creepy creature. For some backstory, I was 15 when this happened and I lived in West Virginia. I lived with my parents and I had a German shepherd named Zelda who just recently gave birth to five pups. It all started three days before Christmas and the first strange thing that happened was when I let Zelda and her pups outside so that they could run around and play in the snow. We lived in the middle of the woods so I didn't have to worry about them going into other people's properties. Maybe about 10 minutes later, I heard Zelda barking and growling, so I looked out of my window and I saw her running into the woods. I ran outside and I saw the puppies just staring at the woods and looking confused. I noticed that there were only four pups, so I brought them inside where it was warm. I told my mom that Zelda ran into the woods, that one of the pups was gone. She told me to wait and that they would come back on their own. But about 30 minutes passed and I started to worry so I told my mom that I'm going to go look for them myself. At first she said no, but I argued with her and I ended up going anyway. I put on my coat and hat and I headed outside. I walked into the woods and I went the direction that I saw Zelda go. I spent about two hours looking for them without any luck. It was starting to get late, so I headed back home hoping that they'd be there. As I was walking through the snow, I thought I heard footsteps, so I looked around me hoping that it was my dogs but there was nothing there, nothing that I could see anyway. I looked around the area some more, and that's when I heard a strange and very disturbing sound. It sounded like moaning or wheezing, and it really freaked me out. I'm not the one to investigate stuff like that, so I just hurried back home. When I made it back, I asked my mom if they had seen the dogs. She said no, and I just sat on the couch, worried. I didn't say anything, and my mind began to race. What if that moaning and wheezing sound I heard earlier was Zelda? Maybe she was hurt. I quickly put my jacket back on and I ran out there. I tried to find the spot where I heard the sound. I waited for a while, hoping that the sound would come again, but it didn't. I sat down on a rock and just kept waiting. It started to snow, so I got up and started walking back. And that's when I heard this blood curdling scream and it sounded like a woman screaming for her life but behind it, there was this wheezing to it. I knew for a fact 
that this was not my dog, so I ran as fast as I could back home. When I got back, my dad was there and I told him about Zelda and the pup. He told me it was late and snow was coming down, so they would look for them first thing in the morning and said that I shouldn't worry. At about 10 that night, I was trying to watch TV in the living room and I heard scratching at the front door. Immediately, I ran for the door, thinking it was Zelda and her pup, but then I remembered that scream earlier in the woods. I was about to go get my parents, but then I heard the whimpering. I knew it had to be Zelda, so I opened the door and was so happy when I saw her. Pretty quickly, I noticed that she was bleeding and I called my parents. My mom said that Zelda probably fell or something and got all scratched up. We cleaned her up and Zelda just went to go lay in the corner. I remembered about the pup that was missing and I didn't know what to do. I wanted to go back out to search again, but it was too late. And if Zelda couldn't find it, how could I? I couldn't sleep that night knowing that the poor pup is probably dead. And Zelda couldn't sleep either. She was whimpering all night. The morning came and I got up and fed the pups who were too young to know that their sibling had gone. I went over to Zelda. She was still in the same corner that she was in last night, and I scratched her head. I filled her bowl with food, but she never ate. I could tell that she was depressed, so I sat with her the whole day and I read books. Nighttime came, and I got ready for bed. I slept in the living room that night with Zelda. Something woke me up at two in the morning. I heard something outside the window. At first, it was footsteps. Then I heard the same moaning and wheezing sound that I heard in the woods. My heart sank, and I noticed that Zelda started to whimper, and she got away from the window. I was too scared to even move my fingers. I waited for what seemed like hours for that noise to stop. When the wheezing finally went away, I was still so scared to get up, so I waited until morning. The next day was Christmas Eve, and we were having a party. A whole bunch of my family came over and it got loud quick. I got tired of the noise, so I decided to go outside. But I couldn't get my mind off of that noise I heard last night. That noise that was just outside our window. Morbidly curious, I went over to that window that I heard it coming from. My heart sank when I saw it. Under the window, the missing puppy lay in the snow. It was dead, and the sight was rather graphic. Some sort of animal had definitely gotten a hold of the pup. I told my mom and showed her where it was. When she came out to see it, she threw up at the sight. I won't go into detail here, but it was pretty bad. Just looking at it terrified me. My mom told my uncle, and he said that he would bury it himself in the woods. That night, me, my mom, and dad talked about the pup, and that's when I told them about the noise I had heard. My dad got mad because I didn't tell him earlier and he said that he's sleeping in the living room with his gun to see if it comes back, whatever it was. That night, we all woke up to the sound of a gunshot, and my dad was rushing back into the house. We were all half asleep and surprised, and he told us that he heard the noise when he was sleeping, so he grabbed his gun and went outside to check it out. He said what he saw, he said what he saw was horrifying. He said that it was white, thin, and very, very tall. When he shone his flashlight at its face, it had very sharp teeth with pitch black eyes and long strands of gray hair. He had shot at it and it ran away. Since that crazy night, I've moved out. I took Zelda with me. Her puppies had already gone to new homes, but my parents still live there. I asked my dad last week talking to him on the phone. I wanted to know if he remembered that creature that he shot at that one night. He said to me, he said to me that the thing will haunt him forever that he could never forget a face like that. Stalker for Christmas Submitted by Moon This happened a few years ago. I'm going to give you the backstory first so you can catch up on this. I go to a school like every normal girl, but there's this guy. We started off as friends, and this is where it gets creepy. So lucky me met this guy, we'll call him Joe. We hung out a lot and we were getting close to Christmas. One day at school, as it was almost the end of the day, we were packing things up and I told him I wouldn't be able to text him so that I could spend most of my time with my family. I was raised and taught that family is the most important thing. It was a holiday after all. He nodded and said the same thing. 
and we hugged before me and my friend who we'll call Jesse went on the bus together. She was going to be spending Christmas with us because her parents were not the best. When all my family got there, it started off like any other Christmas. We talked and caught up, we got early gifts, and I gave my gifts to Jesse, and she gave hers to me. We started to get bored, so we went to my room and we talked about a few boys we liked, and that's when I got a text from Joe asking what I was doing. Seeing as I had a moment, I texted him back and we had a normal conversation. I replied to him, nothing, you? Just being bored, he said back. Man, that must suck, I replied. Jesse wanted to show me something on her phone, and so I got up and went over, leaving my phone on the chair. I don't remember much of what made us leave my room, but we did, and for a while. We decided we wanted to go for a walk and play in the snow, so I told her to wait for me while I got my hat and gloves, and that's when silly me remembered my phone. When I grabbed it, I checked it as I always do, and there were 40 or 50 texts all from Joe. It said things like, hey, hey, Moon, are you there? And from there, it got a little weird. If you're going outside, wear a coat, gloves, and hat, don't want you getting sick. That was kind of weird. How did he know we were going for a walk? Or was he just assuming? So I replied jokingly with, okay, dad. After that, I must have flipped my phone to silent and I shoved it in my coat pocket and went for the walk. I was pretty comfortable with Jesse, so as we walked, we sang Christmas carols. We were just being goofy and loud. Suddenly, Jessie got a call from a friend, so we sat down, she was on her phone, and I took out mine. It was another 50 or so texts, but not like before. In all caps, it read, MOON, PLEASE ANSWER. IF YOU DON'T, I WILL KILL MYSELF. My jaw dropped at how suddenly this guy freaked out. Why was he panicking over the fact that I wasn't texting him? And he was threatening to kill himself, what the hell? I tried to type in, Joe, calm down, I'm fine. And as soon as I did, Joe called. Getting irritated, I sighed and ignored it. And not too long after, I got a text. Why didn't you pick up? And then another. Are you okay? Is something going on? Now, at this point, Jessica's off the phone, and she's sitting down next to me. She asked me what was going on, and as soon as she did, Joe tried to call again. She asked if we should answer it. I nodded, and we put it on speaker. Hey, Moon. He sounded so calm compared to his texts. Oh, hey, are you okay? I asked. Jesse looked at me confused, and I pulled up the 100 texts Joe had sent me over the couple of hours. She looked just as freaked out as I did, so she grabbed the phone, taking over the phone call conversation with him, and began ranting and chewing him out. In the midst of our creepy drama, another friend of mine named Matthew walked up. Me and Matt were really close, and he knew Joe, but not very well. I told him what was going on, and again, he was kind of freaked out. Jess gave me back my phone, saying that he hung up on her. We shrugged it off and kept walking, and we let Matt join us. As we were walking, Matt and I held hands, and I smiled. I'd really liked Matt for a long time, and today we're even dating. But only a minute or two back into our walk, I heard the ding on my phone. It was another text from Joe. Tell Matt to get his hand off of you. I was instantly terrified so he really was stalking me. No, are you following me? I sent back without thinking. You are mine, Joe replied. That's when I had enough, and I blocked him like I should have a long time ago. Anyway, it was getting late. Jesse and I said bye to Matt, and we headed back home. After all my relatives left and everyone was in bed, Jesse and I were up talking. When another call came in, I was really on edge since that last text. It really creeped me out and threw me off my day. But I figured it couldn't be him because I had blocked him. I was wrong. It was a different number, same person. Hello? Um, who's this, I said. Jesse gave me a weird look and I put it on speaker. Merry Christmas, Moon. Don't forget, you're mine. And with that, the person hung up again and I recognized the voice. We both stared at the phone in horror. Then, another text popped up on the screen. Nice PJs, you look pretty sexy. Almost on instinct, Jessica and I both looked out of the window in my room, and sure enough, I could see the silhouette of someone running away into the woods near my house. We were horrified, and I told my parents immediately. I mean, the whole night he could have been joking, maybe with some friends, pretending to be a stalker to scare us. 
but now I felt both dirty and betrayed. Needless to say, it looks like I got a stalker for Christmas, and I hope he goes away. The Christmas Witch, submitted by Nicotine Queen. I remember this like it was yesterday. It was the last Christmas that we had as a whole family. By that I mean my dad, my mom, my sister, and myself. Because my parents divorced when I was seven, and this was right around that time. For some backstory, I had always seen ghosts, spirits, whatever you choose to call them. My mother and her mother do as well. So we began to think it was hereditary. I always thought of it as a gift, but they think it's a curse. Now, I grew up in a single wide trailer in a pretty busy trailer park in the lower thumb of Michigan. It was as cold a year as ever, and I recall playing outside with my friends that Christmas Eve. We went sledding down a makeshift snow hill near the playground in the center of the park itself. My friends and I stayed until it was dark, and then we rushed home to start the festivities. On the way home, I began to feel a sense of dread, which was so odd because it was almost Christmas. I tried to brush it off, thinking it was anxiety, which I had pretty bad at that age. I got home and I walked inside, and that's when things started to feel off for sure. I knew something was going on with my parents, yet at the time, I wasn't even sure what the word divorce meant. But my sister, who was four years older than me, did, and I think it was her vibes that had me on edge. Everyone and everything felt fake, like an act, like putting on a show knowing this would be the last. Fast forward to my sister and I getting ready for bed. At this point, I had forgotten or simply ignored the impending sense of doom and dread. I remember being in the bath, and I had my plastic critters in there for fun. I went under, and that feeling all but overwhelmed me. I couldn't open my eyes underwater without goggles, even non-chlorinated. So, eyes closed, I felt as if someone was looming over my bathtub. It felt like, at any second, someone could hold me down underwater and drown me. Terrified, I jumped up and I gasped for air. My mom heard it and yelled down to me, Kay, are you okay? I replied, yes, I'm fine, just got water in my throat. R wrong tube. Creepy as it was, nothing was there. I got out slowly, I can't explain it, but I felt that if I made any sudden movements or acknowledged the fact that something might be there, it would only get worse. After I was out of the bathroom, I walked down the hall to my family in the living room. This part is important due to the layout of the house. When you walked into the front door, you were immediately in the living room. To your right is the kitchen, and my mom's room was in the very front. If you looked left, it'd be the rest of the living room and then the hallway. The first room on the left was my room. My sister and I shared one. Then the washer, dryer, and then the bathroom. The very end of the house was our playroom. I couldn't sleep alone, so we didn't make the extra room a bedroom until I was 12. We sat down on the couch, which was next to the front door, and we watched a Christmas movie, ate snacks, until it was time to go to bed. I felt like I absolutely did not want to leave the comfort of my mom and dad, and I begged to sleep with them. I knew something was wrong. I just didn't know what. I would in a few hours, unfortunately. They said no, and now as a parent myself, I know why. So they sent me to bed and I dragged my feet the whole way. My sister and I had bunk beds at the time. I was on top and she had the bottom. To say I was a light sleeper would be an understatement. My sister, she could sleep through the end of the world. She was already curled up and lightly snoring by the time I was able to close my eyes and force myself to try to sleep. It must have been around two or three hours later if I had to guess. I woke up from a very deep sleep and my eyes shot open. I felt so cold. Everything seemed darker than normal. I was facing the wall and I slowly turned expecting to see my worst nightmare, but there was nothing. I sighed with relief and I shut my eyes. I tried to doze off. From my room, you could make out the light from the tree. At that moment, I heard something and I turned around. I thought maybe one of our cats was playing with the ornaments again. They would almost knock the whole tree over from doing that. My second thought as a kid was, it must be Santa. So I slowly got up, and my heart was pounding with excitement, which had totally drowned out my doubt and dread that was in the back of my head, yelling, stop. I had gently and quietly as possible climbed down the ladder. As soon as I hit the ground, it enveloped me. Fear. 
I almost ran right back up, but oddly, as I was scared, I knew I had to see. As I made my way across the room, I noticed the sound was gone, that sound of the ornaments being clanked together and moved. I reached the end and the doorway loomed over me like a gateway to hell. I peeked over the side, my palms sweating like it was 100 degrees in the house, and my heart felt like I was going to explode. I saw a figure, and I almost passed out looking at it. Because there, standing by my tree, with her back slightly turned to me, it looked to be an old woman. Well, what I thought was one anyway. From that angle, all I could make out was her long, stringy, grayish white hair that seemed to flow without wind. She was wearing a black cloak, which was hooded over her head, minus the hair that flowed from it underneath. She was staring at our tree. I watched as she grabbed an ornament. She looked it over and then placed it in an area of the tree it was not before. This is important later, for validation. Then I noticed something which made me sick. Her hands appeared to be rotten. You could see where her flesh was rotting off and her bones were poking through. I must have made a noise because she began to turn around in what felt like slow motion. I was frozen in place. When I saw her face, I thought I was going to die. She had this smile on her face that was clearly inhuman. It stretched across her face and it was making all her veins show. Her teeth were yellow and black, where she had them anyway, and her eyes were black pits with a hint of white far back in her skull. She motioned for me to come closer, and that somehow broke the spell. I booked it back into bed. I threw the sheets and blankets over me, and I cried. I must have managed to pass out at some point, because the next thing I knew, it was Christmas Day. I set up and looked around, and I thought I just had a bad nightmare. I slowly made my way out to where everyone was waiting for me, and we opened gifts. As we sat there playing with our new treasures, I happened to look up at the tree, and my heart sank. The ornament, the very same exact color and pattern, the one she had been playing with the night before. It was in the place she had left it, not where we had put it. My mouth hung open, and I must have went pale, because my dad asked if I was sick. I, I said I was fine, and I pretended to be for the sake of everyone else. Later on, I talked to my mom and explained what I saw. When I told her, she got this look on her face that made me scared, because apparently she had heard it too. She thought it was the cats playing with the tree again, so she didn't get up. When she realized I was about to cry, she immediately tried to change her story, saying I probably dreamt it after hearing the sound, yada yada. I told her about the ornament that had changed position, and with the face she always makes when she's telling a lie, she said that she had moved it. But even if she wasn't obviously lying, how would she have put it in the same spot as in my dream? I knew what I had seen was real. I had been awake, and I have no clue what she was, who she was, why she was there. Honestly, I've hated Christmas ever since, and I still get that feeling once in a while around this time of year, but I never saw her again. Something tells me one day I will though, and that's what I'm afraid of. Surprise. Submitted by Trouble Follows After. For a bit of context, I grew up in a very large house with my two brothers and a sister. I was seven, my sister Taylor was nine, and my brothers Matthew and Jonathan were four and 12 respectively. My parents loved throwing parties every Halloween, New Year's, and Christmas. This story takes place during a Christmas season, specifically on December 23rd. I was having a blast running around the house with Taylor and her two friends, Maddie and Emma, as well as my best friend, Lauren. We were eating junk food, chasing Matthew, comparing our hopes for Christmas, and sharing stories of Christmas as long ago. At one point, around 10.30 p.m., we were upstairs in mine and Taylor's shared bedroom, sitting on the window seat, overlooking the driveway. We were looking out at the lights displaying below when a dark-colored SUV pulled up in the driveway. I was confused because I thought all of the guests had already arrived, and my confusion was only increased when a figure stepped out of the car. He was carrying a package. It was too dark to tell if they were male or female. Intrigued, we ran downstairs to see who this person was 
but by the time we reached the door and flung it open, they were gone. In their place was a package, about two feet by two feet, and it was covered in green wrapping paper. The top of the label read, To the Millers, which was our last name. The space beside was blank. Puzzled, we carried it into the living room, and we set it under the tree. My parents were just as confused as us. My father suggested that it might be Uncle Bradley, because it wouldn't be unlike him to do something like that. In the end, we just decided to leave it there until Christmas and open it then. Christmas morning came, and Taylor, Matthew, and Jonathan were all up early, eager to open presents. Amidst all the commotion, I found the mysterious package, delivered last night. I tore off the wrapping paper. Beneath was a cardboard box, which I cut open eagerly. The first thing that hit me was the smell, that of rotting flesh, of decay, of death. Wrinkling my nose, I pulled back the tissue paper covering the contents within. Time seemed to slow. The noises around me blurred, and the only thing I could see was the thing inside the box. It was a puppy. Its pale gold fur clung to its withered corpse, and the smell overwhelmed me. I fell backward, and I screamed. The next few hours passed by in a blur. I sat on the couch, crying my eyes out, hugging Taylor. My father called the police, and they arrived, taking pictures of the poor animal and asking us questions about the SUV and the person that we saw. It's been 15 years, and we never found out who left the puppy on our doorstep, delivered to us all those years ago. It was a little golden retriever, and today he's buried in our backyard, beneath an apple tree with tulips at his grave. I don't know why they killed that poor dog, why they delivered it to us, but sick people like that deserve only the worst. Christmas Visit, submitted by Ginger Cat. I've always been able to see and hear things that other kids couldn't, from the times I could see shadows and heard voices to the time my doll stood up on my bed and laughed. But this was my first paranormal experience as a kid. I was around four or five. My dad had just moved into a new house after my new baby sister was born. I lived with my mom, but I was up visiting my dad this Christmas. I was really excited. I hadn't seen him in over two months. When we got there, the first thing I did was go and see my baby sister. I walked into her room and I heard laughing. But when I went to her crib, she was sleeping. Then I asked my dad if he or my stepmom had been laughing at something, but they said that they were outside the whole time, getting dinner ready on the grill. So I shook it off. i had always had an overactive imagination, so I figured it was just that. After dinner, everything seemed normal, so I went to bed hoping Santa would get me what I asked for, hoping that he could find our new house. I managed to sleep for a while, but I woke up really early in the morning. I walked out into the kitchen and saw that it was three, and I figured I should check on my sister and see if she was okay. I walked into her room, only to notice that she was not in her crib. I assumed my stepmom took her out and went to feed her or something. So I began to walk out of the room, but before I could reach the door, it slammed shut. I opened it and no one was out there. It really caught me off guard. That was when the laughter started again, except this time it was dark and deep, like really, really deep. I ran like hell into the bathroom and I locked the door and the laughing stopped. Then I heard a voice saying my name, Jordan. And that's when the laughing came back, growing louder and louder and it kept going. I began to scream and cry. My dad flung open the door and picked me up, saying it's okay. When we went together to check on my sister, she was there, but I swear she wasn't before. I'm 14 now and a freshman in high school, but I will never forget that night for as long as I live. My New Year's Sighting from This Is Carrie it was New Year's Eve in 2013. My parents and I pulled up to my grandfather's house in literally the middle of nowhere in Colorado. It was a few hours away from the beginning of 2014, but I groaned. We had driven three hours to get to the one place where I had nothing to do. Sure, I could play a mobile game or text my friends on my iPhone 5, but the signal was bad up here and even sending a simple text took a while. 
I walked into the house and instantly went to the living room. It was my favorite place in that house, because usually nobody was in there and it had a TV that may be playing something interesting. I entered the room and was immediately disappointed. Because I wasn't alone, my uncle was sitting on one end of the couch. Plus, I hated my uncle. He never hurt me physically, but he found it entertaining to mess with my mental health. I suffered from anxiety, and his constant name-calling and slandering comments didn't help at all. You could easily say that I should have just ignored him, but I took everything he said personally. That was just the way I was. The worst part was the fact that my parents had no idea. When I tried to tell them in the past, my uncle talked to my parents after the fact, and it was all dismissed as playful banter. But for now, I was in the living room with my uncle. Determined not to let him get to me this time, I sat down at the other end of the couch, and I watched the college football game that was on at the moment. I do remember that my uncle did make a few comments, but I shrugged them off. Eventually, I pulled out my phone and started texting. Texting your boyfriend? Asked my uncle smugly. You know I'm straight, I muttered back. You see, I have no problem with the gender that anyone identifies with. I have some amazing friends, a good number of which identify as many different genders, and I don't respect them any less than I would a straight person. My uncle, on the other hand, didn't respect people of other identifications. It just gave me another reason to hate him. Fine, are you texting your girlfriend then? He asked. Yeah, I replied, proudly. I'd started dating a girl named Alicia a few months beforehand and our relationship lasted for a long time. In fact, we're still friends today. Really? He asked. I didn't think anyone would date your adopted fat self. I looked up at him. What do you mean by that? I asked. Oh, sorry, said my uncle with a smirk. I guess you don't know. Don't know what? I asked. That you're adopted, he replied. Very funny, I said, turning away. Oh, I'm not joking he said. You're adopted, and I can prove it. He pulled out his phone and pulled up a picture of a document. It took me a second to recognize them as adoption papers that included my name and the unmistakable signatures of my parents at the bottom. I had watched my parents sign things with those signatures time after time, and I could see that they were accurate. I suddenly felt sick. I'm, I'm going for a walk. I walked out of the room and put on my boots. 11 p.m., the clock by the door read. I'm not sure why I remember that detail, but I do. I got outside, and I just walked. I didn't care where I went, I just wanted to be alone. I wandered into the woods close to the house with my phone's flashlight as my only source of light. I didn't care, though. I was upset. Very upset. Everything I thought I knew was a lie. I fought back tears as I picked up my pace into the thicker woods. I finally just looked up and realized I was in trouble. I turned in every direction, but the house was not in sight. I turned to my phone's map to try to find where I was, but I had no connection out here. Panic overtook my sadness, and I ran to try to find a way out. After running for a few minutes, I discovered a small clearing with a singular tree in the middle of it. I came to the conclusion that I was going to climb that tree to get a better view. But just as I began to climb, I heard a tree branch snap in the distance, and I froze. I heard the faint crunching of leaves getting closer. It could be someone else. They could help me. I don't know why to this day, but before I'd even seen what was coming, my body jumped into fight or flight. My adrenaline popped, and I quickly went into the tree line to watch from afar. I turned off my phone light, so my only light was the moon. 
I heard the crunches enter the clearing, and my curiosity took over me. I peeked out from behind the tree, and I saw the outline of something massive, but somehow I could tell it wasn't a normal animal. Just the way it was moving, it was walking on two legs, but its arms hung low. It looked about ten feet tall, and the only word that I can describe it with is unnatural. Suddenly, it screeched a horrible, horrible sound. Then it left the clearing. I was horrified. I ran as far away from the clearing as I could, and somehow, I found my way back to the house. My mom soon saw me and ran to me. She told me she was incredibly worried. Unable to tell her about what I saw, I looked up and asked about what my uncle told me. That was the night I found out I truly was adopted. My parents and my grandfather were furious with my uncle, and after that night they cut off all contact with them. New Year's proceeded as normal. I had just arrived in time for the countdown and everyone gathered in the living room to watch it. Slowly, as people got tired, they trickled out of the living room until it was just me and my grandpa. I couldn't sleep, and I knew I wouldn't that night. My grandfather suddenly turned to me. What'd you see out there? He asked. You wouldn't believe me. I replied. Try me. He said, scooting closer to me. I told him truthfully what I saw, and instead of laughing, which I thought he would do, he was totally serious with me. I've seen it too, he told me, a few times in fact, and I think it lives around here. Promise me you'll never go into those woods alone. I nodded my head to say yes. My grandfather stayed up with me that night. And even though he wasn't my true grandfather, we really grew closer. I loved that man, but he sadly passed away in 2018. I've been back to that house a few times since, but I've never seen the thing again. After my grandfather passed, someone bought the house. I hope they stay safe because they may not know what they're getting into. Nothing really changed between me and my parents, and I still love them extraordinarily, but the terror I felt that night will affect me forever. Wendigo in Indiana Forest from Flint the Dragon 1 It was January of 2019. My boyfriend asked me to reshoot a scene of a short horror film that we had worked on for his film class. I agreed to, because the scene we were reshooting was set in the forest about an hour away, so no problem. Then again, the past few times we'd been filming there, it was full of arguing, but we were able to hold together to make a bad short film. But I still enjoyed being in the woods for a change. The last time I'd gone camping at that point, I was seven, and I hadn't really been in a forest since then. I have lived in Indiana my whole life, and I was fascinated by cryptids. I knew what we saw that day. I was the lead actor in the film, playing a man who was driven insane during a walk in the woods with his best friend. The title of the film would become ironic, but I'll save it for last. There were three of us filming, our friend who was tasked with makeup and being the camera woman and with my boyfriend and I as the actors. The only prop we had was a paper deer skull mask, and as you can gather from the prop, the film involved a wendigo. As I said before, I enjoyed the last few visits to that forest, but this time, I felt uneasy. That entire shooting session, I felt as if something was watching us, but I didn't know what it was. Later on, I began to see movement through the forest. I couldn't make it out. 
I told my boyfriend about it, and he jokingly said I was seeing Bigfoot. I ignored his joke, but I didn't rule out Bigfoot as being what I saw. I wish it had been Bigfoot, and I wish our camera had night mode. After finishing part of the scene, we noticed it had started to get dark, so we did our makeup quickly. My friend who was doing the makeup didn't have enough time to make it professional, but it still looked great. The bruises looked real and the fake blood had smeared great. When we got to the location for the final shot, the camera wasn't getting any light, so we opted for an audio ending to the film. As we packed up the camera, my boyfriend turned and looked into the surrounding trees, and he froze. I looked in the direction he was staring at, and our friend did the same. Through the trees, we saw a tall, lanky figure walking around. From what we could tell, it had pale white skin and long, claw-like fingers. I haven't told my boyfriend or friend about this, but I saw its face. It had sunken pits in place of its eyes. It didn't seem to have lips either, but I could see teeth. They were sharp, and it appeared to be drooling. The moonlight reflected off of something dripping from its mouth. My boyfriend said we should get out of there and he gave me his pocket knife as we made our way back to the car carefully. As we neared the parking lot, I heard slow steps coming from behind us, like that thing was stalking us. We made it to the parking lot, and I heard it run deeper into the woods. I was the last to get into the car, and as I opened the door, I heard this blood-curdling shriek from the forest. It had an unnatural tone to it. I quickly got into the car, and we drove away. We didn't talk about it during the drive. My boyfriend was visibly shaken. We dropped our friend off at her house, and my boyfriend dropped me off at mine, then went home. I told my mom about what we saw, and she asked if I knew what it was. I said honestly, it looked like a Wendigo and not the deer skull faced kind. It looked like what the original legends described, like it had been human at one point. I wanted to go back to where we saw it, but I decided against that, knowing that I couldn't fight back if things took a turn for the worse, and I'm not a small guy, neither is my boyfriend. But if the legends are true, we wouldn't have been able to overpower it. I haven't been in the forest since, I still have the mask. I kept it as a reminder of my encounter with that Wendigo. And as for the title of the short film we'd made, I'd given it the title the first day of filming, not knowing we would even encounter that on the last day. It's titled, Wendigo Woods. I haven't seen the film, but I hope to see it at some point, just to see if we may have caught it on camera. I'll post an update on this when I watch the film and let you know if I see anything. The Wendigo That Followed Me Home From Austin C. This happened back in December 2020 in the Great Lakes region of western New York State. It was a snowy night when this event happened. I had just gotten off work and it was getting dark out already. There was a decent amount of snow on the ground, while it was still coming down pretty heavily. So I thought it'd be fun to take my snowmobile out for a ride, since I didn't have anything else going on. Little did I know that would be a mistake, a mistake I would soon regret. For some background, I'm a 23-year-old guy and live alone in a pretty wooded area. There are a few farm fields surrounded by woods just down the road from me. I'm good friends with my neighbors who owned that land, and they let me ride on it. I went outside and the snow was still coming down pretty heavily, but that didn't deter me, because I love the snow. I opened up the garage, uncovered my snowmobile, and fired it up, letting it warm up for a few minutes. I put on my riding gear and grabbed my high-powered LED spotlight for backup. 
Then I was on my way. As I pulled off the road and entered one of the fields, I spotted a herd of deer along the edge of the field. They took off back into the woods when I got too close for their comfort. I rode around for a few more minutes when out of nowhere I got this overwhelming urge to shine my spotlight into a patch of cedar trees. I was about 25 yards away from them. I turned off the snowmobile's engine and pulled my spotlight out of the riding bag behind me. I shined the super bright LED light into the trees. It took me a few seconds to see it, but peeking out from behind one of the cedar trees, I see what looked to be a buck with large antlers. At least, that's what I thought it was, until I realized whatever this deer was had no eye shine like a normal deer. I could see the eyes on this deer were solid black and just empty. A normal deer would also not blatantly watch a person on a snowmobile from such a close distance. They'd run away like the herd of deer from before, but this one was staring daggers at me. Another feature that really stood out about this deer was it looked taller than a normal deer. Along with being very skinny and malnourished with missing patches of hair. At first, I didn't feel any fear, as I was in a state of complete disbelief and confusion as to whatever this abomination was in front of me. Then I remembered I've heard the Native American folklore stories about the Wendigo. I always thought stories about the Wendigo were just a boogeyman fairy tale to scare kids from going into the woods. This next part is the reason I still have nightmares about this creature. As I was still face to face with it, I very stupidly had the idea to yell out a question to it while trying to hold back the urge to laugh. Hey, are you a Wendigo? Obviously, I wasn't expecting a reply. But then, I kid you not, this creature replied to my question in a deep demonic voice. It said, Yes. It then proceeded to laugh. That's when the immense fear and the urge to get out of there hit me like a freight train. I fired up the snowmobile, threw my spotlight in the riding bag behind me, and sped full throttle out of there. I almost wiped out a few times, getting back home from going so fast. I made it back in a few minutes, then scrambled into the garage. I parked the snowmobile and made sure every door and window was locked. I wish I could say this terrifying encounter ended here, but it didn't. Later that night after I'd gone to bed, I had a horrifying nightmare about that Wendigo. In it, I was being trapped in my house while this monstrosity was trying to break in to get me. It was speaking to me in that same voice. Austin, I can see you in there. I'm coming to get you. At that point, I woke up, startled in a cold sweat, and breathing heavily. I sat up in bed and looked around the dimly lit room. Peering in the window I hadn't shut the blinds to was that exact same monster that I'd seen on my snowmobile before, the one I'd seen in my nightmare, speaking those words that I thought were a dream. Except now, I was fully awake. But this time, while it was still staring daggers at me, it had a huge grin across its face, showing a row of razor-sharp teeth, and it was standing on two legs easily over seven feet tall, I could see even better now how much this monster looked like a rotting, decaying deer corpse. Needless to say, I screamed like a frightened child and started fearfully choking out the St. Michael the Archangel prayer, even though I'm not much of a religious person. As I was forcing myself to recite that prayer, the monster began emitting this otherworldly growl, and it laughed again. When I finished the prayer with the word Amen, the monster was just gone. I didn't sleep the rest of that night and dreadfully waited for it to come back. But it didn't. 
I went and stayed with my family until I could move out of that house, and I never told anyone the story until now, out of fear of sounding insane. Even though I'm doing better now and living in a more populated area, I'll still have haunting nightmares once in a while about that terrifying monstrosity. I avoided becoming a meal for a Wendigo. From Death Raptor. This pandemic has been really hard for me. As I can't see my friends outside of online classes, I'm an extreme extrovert. It was around 7.30 to 7.45, and it was winter, so it was already dark then. That's when I had my encounter. I was relaxing outside in my aunt and uncle's hot tub. They have a cabin up on Mount Hood in Oregon, with about one road that passes by the grounds. There's tall, medium, and small evergreen pines scattered about the landscape, with white snow on the ground from a fresh afternoon snowfall earlier in the day. I was sitting in the warm water, occasionally whistling out into the dark, since I enjoyed listening to the echo it made. I was making whistling sounds like the way you call your creatures an ark. So yeah, every so often I whistled, all the while I laid in the tub. I'd eventually realized I heard nothing except the light drizzle on the roof from the cold mountain rain. No birds, no other animals, and no people, except for my family. I whistled once more, but weirdly enough, I heard what sounded like a reply a second or two after the whistle I emitted. I made the horror movie mistake of whistling again, and I got another reply. I was getting incredibly nervous. With newfound paranoia, I began to look around. My thoughts weren't fully on the darkness of the forest. I was thinking about teenage boy stuff, mostly my girlfriend and overall missing her. The thing that really snapped me out of it was another whistle. I glanced around the forested expanse, and I noticed something that I didn't notice before. A set of yellow eyes staring at me from the woods, several feet off the ground. It seemed so unreal, as the only other experience I'd ever had like this was when I saw what appeared to be a Sasquatch with my older brother back in 2013 in Gaston. The eyes disappeared, and I didn't see them again. I somehow had the courage to be outside for about 10 minutes after that, until the smart side of my brain said, Dude, get back in the cabin. I realized I didn't hear to leave, whatever it was. I got out of the hot tub immediately and went back into the cabin, changing and coming into my room that I was staying in. That's actually when I typed this up. After looking through similar stories and researching on Wikipedia, I realized I may have just avoided becoming the mill of a Wendigo. I doubt it may have been one, but if it was, I would have just told it I was too sweet, and it probably wanted something saltier. But I think whatever it was decided I wasn't worth its time, and my family was inside and the cabin had large windows, so they would have seen it if it tried anything. But I really don't know what to think. When I told my aunt that I was uncomfortable being outside, she thought I meant I was uncomfortable being alone outside. So if you're out past dark in the northern Cascade mountain range, stay sharp and bring a friend. Stay safe out there, folks. Was it a Wendigo? From Parrots247. I'm 14 years old and from western North Carolina. This story takes place near Roan Mountain, Tennessee in December 2019. I believe I saw a Wendigo watching me. It all started late night a week before Christmas. I was sitting on my porch waiting for my mom to come stargazing with me. Yeah, I know it's weird, but it's something that my mother and I have always enjoyed doing. She was in her bedroom, which was adjacent to the porch, getting dressed. I was sitting on the porch waiting for her at around 10 o'clock at night. I heard some rustling by a large bush and looked over. There, I spotted two huge red eyes around four feet off the ground. I was staring at those eyes for what felt like forever. 
Then, all of a sudden, those eyes began to rise. I realized what they belonged to wasn't something small. It was huge. It walked out of the bush and seemed to be seven feet tall. I'm five foot ten, and I had to look up to it from about twenty-five feet away. It had pale skin, large claws, matted black hair and patches, and it was staring at me. Then it let out a low growl and took three steps towards me. I'm not sure if it was a he or she, because it had no genitalia, but it was built like a human man. I felt nothing but fear in that moment. For some unknown reason, it just turned away and walked in the opposite direction like nothing happened, and it was just going back home or something, or to the store or something else just as mundane. Then it walked behind my great uncle's barn, and it disappeared. The next day I went to where it was, and there were footprints bigger than my hand, but they just stopped at the barn. I still sit out at the porch at night, but haven't seen anything like it since. I'd always heard of the Wendigo, coming from Cherokee descent, although I never thought I would see one for myself. If you're ever near Roan Mountain, Tennessee, be wary of what's in those woods, because you never know what you may see. What followed me on that hike? From Jerry J. Location, Colorado. In 1994, I lived in northern Colorado. That winter was going to be a bad one, but I never let that keep me from enjoying a hike. I always hiked. On weekends, afternoons after work, vacations out of town, you name it. There was something about hiking that gave me a bit of a high, and that high kept me in pretty good shape too, so I wasn't complaining. But I will admit that that year, I should have stayed home. That blizzard was the worst I'd ever seen. It was much worse than the meteorologists on TV had forecast. Five layers of clothing wasn't nearly enough, but luckily I had brought a week's supply of thermal hand warmers and even some lighter fluid for an emergency fire if need be. I would be okay, but I'd have to be careful out there. Little did I know that it wouldn't be the blizzard that would make this hiking trip a memorable one for all the worst reasons. I started along the edge of the woods. There was a trail there that led upward into the mountains, and eventually over the other side, then back down ending the trail near a main road. Once there, Joseph, a friend of mine, would be waiting for me, and if he wasn't there at the same time I planned to be, I'd simply give him a call, and he'd arrive in about half an hour. Besides a cramp in my left leg, the hike was fun for a few hours. It was definitely colder than I wanted it to be, but when I settled down for a while, over a small fire that I'd made, snacking on some cliff bars, it was so peaceful and scenic that I didn't want to get up right away. But I had to meet Joseph on the other side at a certain time. I didn't want to have to wait for him once I got there. So I thoroughly stamped out the fire and covered the remaining embers in snow. It was time to go. I began to exit the clearing I'd been sitting in. As I breached the circular edge of trees to continue on the trail, I immediately saw them. There were deep footsteps in the snow. I'm talking huge and deep footprints. I was so amazed by them that I took a moment to compare my own footstep next to one of them. When I lifted my foot out of the snow to examine the difference, my own footprint didn't even sink to a third as deep as that one and the length of my foot was only half as long. You might be thinking this footprint was just some random mashup of indentations that simply looked like a larger one. I even thought like that myself, but there were dozens of these prints all around. All of them were the exact same shape, depth, and length. This wasn't a random shape in the snow. 
These had been made by a person or animal. But what was truly ominous was the fact that the freshest looking set of prints ended right at the edge of the trees and they were facing exactly where my now buried fire had been. That was the first time I'd ever been even slightly anxious while on a hike. Not once had I ever had a run-in with any dangerous wildlife. I never even had any slip-ups or accidents, but this, it had me wanting to jog the rest of the way and cut out any future breaks entirely. I kept walking, eventually laughing and convincing myself that I simply overreacted. Imagine talking yourself into ruining one of your favorite hobbies just because of some footprints. I slowed down and I started to savor the hike again, taking in the trees and enjoying the fact that the heavy snowfall had lightened up now, allowing me to see further than before and warming things up a bit. I could also hear things more clearly than I could an hour ago. That being said, I have no idea how long those footsteps had been following me, because as soon as I could hear better, I heard them. Heavy, slow, deliberate steps, about 20 or 30 yards to the north. I stopped, and when I stopped moving, the footsteps stopped as well. At first, it was a WTF moment, you know? But when I started walking again, and the footsteps continued along with me, I was officially horrified. I sprinted, causing those footsteps to speed up only slightly, yet they were still able to keep up with me. In fact, they outran me a bit, getting ahead of me before I stopped again to catch my breath. It was silent again, save for the calm breeze whistling overhead. I was both afraid to move and afraid to stay still. My mind was all over the place as I struggled to figure out which was the better option. Suddenly, the choice was made for me. A withered tree that had begun rotting a long time ago suddenly snapped from its trunk and came falling toward me. There was a brief glimpse of a tall shadow at the base of the tree as I turned quickly toward the snapping sound but that was all I could take in before I was jumping and tumbling out of the way of the falling tree for dear life. The thing had nearly crushed me. Furious now, I jumped up and screamed. What the hell is your problem? Who's out there? The only answer I received was more silence. I turned and continued to run, I was over the halfway point now, so it was all downhill from there. On a normal day, that would have been a good thing, but with the snow as thick as it was, I ended up tripping and falling a ways, busting up my arm pretty bad. When I pulled myself up, breathing in through my teeth due to the fierce pain in my forearm, I quickly looked around in a panic. Again, I saw that silhouette. It was only 15 yards from me now, but again, the moment I saw it, it darted back the other way and disappeared. Someone was definitely following me, stalking me. I was not safe in those woods. I ran, painfully holding on to my arm and praying that I didn't fall again. After about 45 minutes of nonstop running, I fell only a few yards away from the end of the trail where I could see Joseph's pickup truck idling. I watched him get out and run toward me. Joseph helped me up, begging to know if I was okay. I shook my head, spitting out snow, then whipping my head around, expecting to see a figure twice my height bearing down on me. But the forest was empty. Just snow, just trees, just my footprints. But wait, that wasn't all. Looking closer, there was another set of footprints. A familiar, larger set. They stood deep in the snow only inches away from where I'd fallen seconds before. 
how I hadn't heard that person or thing standing there, how Joseph hadn't seen them at all when he got out of the truck, I have no idea. But something tells me that I nearly didn't make it out of those mountains alive. And thank God I didn't have to call and wait for Joseph. Spirit on a Snowy Night from Black Dreams 3318 Location, the American Midwest. This story happened one December when I was around 10 years old. I was visiting my dad for the weekend in a large town, about three hours away from where we live. This took place during a snowstorm on a Friday night. The night started off normally. We got to town around eight o'clock and ordered some pizza and rented a couple of movies. When we got back to my dad's apartment, we put in one of the movies that we had rented and sat down to eat some pizza. My younger siblings, Ashlyn and Phoenix, were sitting at the kitchen table and my dad, with his girlfriend and I, were sitting on the couch in the living room. Everybody was having a good time. At around midnight, my younger siblings were both in bed, along with my dad's girlfriend, Lauren. My dad and I were in the living room still, I was playing Call of Duty or something like that, and he was on his phone texting friends. Lauren's cat, Speed, was sleeping on my lap when all of a sudden, his head perked up and stared at the bathroom door across the room, which was open now. My dad noticed that I was staring at the door and he asked me what was wrong. Nothing, I think Speed saw a bug or something, I replied. Oh, okay, just making sure you're all right, he said. I continued playing video games while the cat just stared at that door for a few minutes. Eventually, he went back to sleep. After a little while, I remember the power going out from the blizzard for a few minutes. The snow was getting pretty bad outside, but after the power came back on, nothing too major happened until later that night. My dad went to bed at around three in the morning and I stayed up for a while longer since I've always been a night owl and I love being alone at night. At around 3.30 a.m., I got bored and decided to watch a little YouTube on my phone for a while before going to bed. I was suddenly startled by this sound, a loud bang and a crashing sound. It was coming from the wall about 10 feet in front of me all four of our cats had been awoken by the noise, and two of them, Speed and Moo, were hissing very angrily at the wall. I jumped to my feet and stared at the wall for a good 10 seconds before carefully approaching it. Cautiously, I opened all the cupboards to see if anything had broken or fallen out, but nothing had been moved. I got up and went straight to bed. There was no way I was going to deal with ghosts slamming walls and standing in doorways during the early hours of the morning. The following day, I told my dad about the incident that happened that night, and he said nobody else heard anything, and it could have been a large ice chunk falling from a tree and hitting the window. I told him there was no way that it was an ice chunk. It shook the entire apartment. I told him about the cats hissing at the wall, and about Speed staring at that bathroom door earlier. He said it was weird, so he went to talk to his neighbor after a while to see if they had seen anything falling from the apartment or if he had hit the wall somehow. Before my dad came back from my neighbor's apartment, I saw Speed watching the bathroom door again. My dad's girlfriend, Lauren, noticed it as well, and she looked at me concerned. As soon as my dad walked in the apartment door, I bombarded him with questions. I still remembered his exact words when I asked if it was them. He said, They weren't even home last night. Nowadays, when the cats start staring, I pay attention, and I wait for a strange noise to come from somewhere. The White Wolf Creature From Prometheus Location, unknown.
I live in a cabin in the mountains, roughly two miles from the closest neighbor and eight miles away from town. It seemed that last year we had one of the worst winters I could remember in the area, and this story takes place during that time. We had already had several of these storms come through, but during the middle of a few of them, I would hear this bone-chilling howl. Now I've heard coyotes before, I've heard bobcats and mountain lions scream, but that sound I heard, it was unlike all of those, it was something entirely different. On one particular night, the wind was howling. The snow was coming down heavily, yet my dog was scratching at the door to be let out. I opened the door to let her out so she could go use the bathroom. About five minutes later, I heard her start barking and growling at something, but then I heard something else. And let me tell you, when you hear a growl coming from something else, a sort of primal fear wells up in you. This growl was deep and guttural. Before I had much of a chance to react, I heard my dog let out a painful yelp. I quickly threw on my shoes and coat, and I ran outside with a flashlight. As I walked in the general direction of the sounds I heard earlier, I could not find my dog. All I could see were red splotches in the snow. As I frantically looked around, I began hearing that growl again. I ran back to the house and I locked the door, praying that my poor dog was okay. Several minutes later, I started hearing something walking around outside. It walked onto the front porch. Whatever it was began to beat on the front door. I ran into my bedroom because that's where my 12 gauge was. Then I ran back to the main part of the house. I could see something moving around outside, just barely through the frost-covered windows. Never before have I ever been that afraid. After an hour, all of the movement and noises stop. I sat down on my couch, and I reflected on the experience. I wondered what it was. It sounded like it was walking around on two legs, especially if it could beat on the door like that with what sounded like hands. I stayed up for hours, but eventually I gave in to sleep and I began to doze off. I must have been asleep for about an hour or so when I'm jolted awake by this stench. It's like rotting flesh and it's a bit metallic. I opened my eyes and looked toward the window and there I saw it. A wolf-like creature standing on muscular hind legs, eyes like a glowing yellow with red fluid dripping from its mouth. Its fur was as white as the snow outside. I was frozen in fear, realizing that this thing had attacked my dog. All I could think to do was raise that 12 gauge and out of fear and anger, I aimed it toward the window and pulled the trigger. There was a painful scream as it turned and ran off the porch. I quickly got up and I ran over to barricade the door. I had to make sure that thing could not get in. That round from the 12 gauge wasn't enough because later I heard that same creature walking around my cabin, growling, occasionally howling. Only much later, did I hear it go back into the woods and finally everything went silent again. I did not sleep the following night. When the sun rose after that, I went outside to see a trail of red going around the cabin, then back into the forest. I haven't seen that thing again and the snowstorm has moved on, but I never got my dog back. Blizzard Cabin Creeper from Jace S. Location Unknown. This happened last year. I was 16 at the time. My parents own a pretty big cabin up in the mountains, and when winter break would hit, we would go to the cabin and stay there until January. 
I always loved going up to the cabin because there was just so much to do. Well, we headed up there that year like usual, and on the first weekend we were there, my parents decided to go out for dinner. This meant I would have the whole cabin to myself, and I was excited to say the least. After they left, I quickly got a bunch of junk food and turned on my PS4. It was ironic because I was playing a game that takes place at a winter lodge. It was called Until Dawn if you haven't heard of it. I had played for about an hour when something hit a window in the main room loudly. I jumped and my heart immediately began to pound. I calmed myself and headed over to the window to see what it was. There was a harsh blizzard outside, so I gave up on looking out there. All I could tell is that someone had thrown a snowball, apparently, at the window. But who would be all the way out here, in the middle of a blizzard? They'd have to be crazy. I tried to distract my mind by turning off all the lights and continuing to play the game. After another half hour, someone knocked on the front door loud enough for me to hear. Now, my parents weren't supposed to be home yet, and they wouldn't let me open the door for strangers at that age, but I figured I could still check through the window by the door to see who was there. I approach the window and use my fingers to pry open the blinds, and I peek outside, only to be met with a set of dark eyes. I couldn't help but let out a scream that cracked as I jumped. I immediately felt my heart skip a few beats as I tried to comprehend what was going on. Suddenly, a rock smashed through the window by the door, and I ran into the kitchen to grab a kitchen knife before ducking behind the counter. I heard the heavy footsteps of Boots and the man grunting as he walked. He headed toward the room with my PS4 and TV, looking for me if I had to guess. Once his outline was out of view, I headed into the basement. My dad had a rifle in there, but I didn't know where exactly it was. I tiptoed to the basement door and shut it behind me as I descended down the steps. At this point, I was more scared than I ever imagined, but I tried to focus. I eventually found an old flip phone and quickly dialed the police. I explained my situation, but it probably came out as rushed half words. They told me to grab a weapon and to remain calm as they weren't sure when anyone could show up due to the storm getting worse outside. The battery on the old phone then gave out and I was alone again. I placed the phone down on the counter. My chest hurt from my heart pounding against it. The man, probably hearing me, had smashed open the basement door and quickly ran down the steps. I hid behind an open door, and since the basement was large, I tried to form a plan with whatever thoughts I could muster. When you're that scared, it's hard enough just to think straight. It was a terrible idea, but I planned on waiting until he walked through the doorway to lock him in the room and run to the main floor, then outside. It was nearly impossible for me to hold my breath like that, and I couldn't help but breathe heavily. The only way he didn't hear me breathing was probably because he was breathing loudly himself, almost grunting. He didn't seem mentally stable, and better yet, he had grabbed our double-bladed axe from our shed. God knows what other things he could have taken from the shed and what he could do with them. I tried not to think about it. To my surprise, he didn't see me through the crack in the door as he walked by. He began to search through the room for me. I took two big steps and slammed the door shut behind him before going to lock it. Only problem was, I hadn't had the time to think clearly. There was no lock on that door. My memory gets foggy at this part, and I hate reliving it, but I'm pretty sure it went down something like this. I went to lock the door, finding that there was no lock, but before I could turn and run, he had already kicked the door, slamming it against me. I remember my nose oozing red as I stumbled up the stairs as quick as I could. My nose was definitely broken. I tried to get out as I opened the door and took off, Thanks to the blizzard, I was able to hide quickly, 
there was hardly any visibility outside. But because I was the one being pursued, I had the advantage, and I simply had to hide. I laid in the snow, burying myself from view. Probably due to the adrenaline, my body hadn't processed just how cold it was. After a few moments, I heard the grunts and breathing from the man, and I could soon see him. He hadn't noticed me yet, but he was following my footprints and an all too obvious trail of red drops. I got up and sprinted as fast as I could. There were woods nearby, and I had to get myself lost in them. I couldn't see much of anything and ended up tripping on something. I'm not entirely sure what it was. I fell forward, rolling down a small hill into snow and twigs and leaves. My face ached something fierce from that door, and now whatever I tripped over had scratched up my ankle pretty bad. I laid there for an unknown amount of time. Down there, time didn't feel like it was flowing normally, probably thanks to my shock and fear. I could hear the man's grunts somewhere in the middle, but I'm not sure. After I assumed it was safe, I began to slowly limp back to the cabin, hiding in my bedroom closet. I slumped down, holding on to that kitchen knife for dear life. There was no way I was going to trap myself in the basement just to look for a rifle that may or may not be there. I'm not sure when it happened, but I must have passed out, because what I remember next was waking up as the police shined a light in my face. I hadn't had any extreme injuries, otherwise I probably wouldn't have made it. I was taken to the hospital where my worried parents waited for me. They hadn't been able to make it home due to the worsening blizzard. This year, we're not planning on going up to the cabin, because I don't think me or my parents could handle being there. I just can't imagine what would have happened if I hadn't tripped and fallen down that small hill in the blizzard. I think it's that alone that caused that man to lose sight of me. From now on, I'll be staying close to my family and my switchblade, especially this Christmas. Only after recording the following story did I realize that I've already narrated it in a video I made last year about real-life haunted forests, but it suits this episode, so I hope you enjoy it if you haven't heard it before. Stalker or Possible Spirit from Robbie Location Unknown This is a story from my father, it happened on the night that the East Coast was hit by a blizzard, one year in mid-March. My father and I take turns each night, taking my dog for a walk in the dense woods area of the local park. It was my turn, but he decided to take the dog himself anyway. For context, the town we live in is a slightly more rural suburb of a larger city in America. Also, my dad is a huge and scary guy that no sane man would want to straight up mess with. So my dad goes and drives to the secluded part of the park late into the night during heavy snow, only because my dog loves walks and loves snow even more. When he makes it to the parking area, he sees a man leaning against a tree at the edge of the lot, rocking back and forth. But my father quickly dismisses it, thinking that he must be walking a dog of his own and just taking a break. For a while, nothing happens, but as he advances along the path, he notices a hooded man standing in the direct center of it. Seeing no reason to make a fuss of this weirdo, he walks right by him and keeps going, but notes that the dog has her tail between her legs and head down. Only moments after passing the figure, he turns around and sees absolutely nothing. This makes no sense whatsoever, because for the man to take off in that time, there would have been a lot of noise, even with the howling wind, and there was almost nowhere to go, as this part of the path only had small brush and decaying shrubs on the side, which would have made loads of noise if he were to jump into them. Feeling a bit weirded out, my dad continues on the path, but a few minutes later, 
he sees the same hooded figure, but now the hooded man is running at him. Before he can even spin around, the dog must have noticed because she flips over at breakneck speed to put herself between my dad and the figure, puffing up and beginning to growl deep and aggressively. She's a big dog with a wolf-like appearance, big enough to snap that lunatic into a sensical mind. The hooded guy stops in his tracks and extends his arms in which the only way I can describe was a T-pose, which is what an NPC looks like when they're spawned into a video game. My dad and the man stare at each other for a minute before he sidesteps away and continues walking, now realizing the man must no longer have the intention to try anything against a big dude and a dog like that. My dad is thinking of how he is going to pass this guy on the way back to the car, but when he reaches the spot where the man had been standing, he's no longer there. My dad curiously searches for his footprints to see where the madman ran off to, but he only finds confusion when he notices that the man left absolutely no trace of himself. Before you think the footprints may have been covered by the blizzard, keep in mind that my dad's and even the dog's footprints were still very much visible, and he knew this was the correct spot because of a fallen tree that served as a landmark right nearby. Nothing else happened for the rest of the walk, so they were able to finish up and head home without further incident, though my dad did feel a bit eerie about this whole thing. I know my dad is telling the truth. He doesn't like to tell stories like this, and I can see the rage and confusion in his face when he understands that the man, or whatever it was, that sprinted at him likely had intent to harm him and his dog. I do have to say, though, I'm really glad it was my dad who had this experience. Had it been me that walked the dog, I don't think I would have treated this incident nearly as well. It liked my yodel. From Nimin87, location, upstate California. To be frank with you, I don't honestly know with any certainty exactly what I saw that day, but the memory came to the top of my mind when I saw the snow coming outside, so bear with me. This happened to me when I was very young, very small and equally timid. I'm now 31, and I was seven at the time. It was an uncomfortable time in nearly every conceivable way. It was the third largest blizzard I'd ever experienced. It hit that winter, and in about two days it dropped a record three feet of deep snow, covering every inch of my sleepy mountain town and a good amount of the surrounding area. Having grown up the previous five years in the Mojave Desert, this was an absolute system shock for the record bucks. In the course of the day, my folks had repeatedly made us desert flower children leave the warm safe confines of our home for the harsh winter cold. Being more or less trapped in the winter outdoors of upstate rural California, which was still mostly alien to us all, added to the fact that the snow picked up in the latter half of the day and did not let up until the next afternoon, and my siblings and I had basically become the cold version of Lord of the Flies, feral popsicle children going wild in the snow. I was rather isolated among my siblings in those days, so I had ended up sculpting a half dome in the snow and settling into it to play around, trying to yodel and create cartoonish, ever-growing snowballs in the hill near our house, with no signs of success. As with most things I choose to take interest in, I got so wrapped up in this goofy nonsense that I lost track of my siblings and the time completely. Well, except for my torturous older brother, of course. Call it a phase or a sibling thing or early onset paranoia, but I never let him out of my sight when we were outside. Something about older brothers and terrifying siblings. Regardless, other than watching my brother climb the hill home and then myself return to my terrible yodeling, I paid seemingly no attention to the world around me. Before I knew it, apparently four hours had passed and a new wave of falling snow managed to break my childish revelry. 
In fact, suddenly it occurred to me just how cold it was getting outside and how little I'd been paying attention to things. So after letting myself have a bit of a panic attack and run about to warm up, I reviewed the situation as if I were trying to survive lost in the wild. The details as I knew them at this point were few, if any. I knew my older brother was in the house, probably freezing some snowballs in the freezer or using the facilities, but my baby brother was nowhere to be seen. Habit made me assume he had accompanied my older brother up to the house just to be indoors, so I wasn't too worried. I had some snacks in my pocket, but nothing to drink. But again, it wasn't a bother. That is, until things got serious. For real serious. Because something happened that made me scream in a bit of a short yip-like fashion. I snapped my attention up and to the side. I saw movement in the swaying wall of white that fell before me. Despite seeing movement, I was now looking at nothing more than the silhouette of trees across the river, far below the mountainside. Just as my mind began to relax again, I saw more movement from the edge of my vision, deeper in the woods across the visibly frozen river. After surveying the trees in that direction, I finally decided I was being silly about the movement, so I got up to get a better view of my surroundings. It was like something right out of the movie The Grey or The Thing. There were pine trees as far as the eye could see, all coated in frosty, solid snow icicles, and what I'll swear was the thickest wall of blizzard snow I've ever been in. That was also the point I realized how long I'd been standing still in that insane cold. My legs twinged with pain in every nerve, and I felt stiff like fossilized wood. As if on cue, a shadow in my far periphery snapped my attention to its movement. That's when an impulse ran through me, that sort of run kind of thing, to escape before something hurts you. I should mention here that I have a rare bone disease that had basically destroyed the integrity of my right hip bone and joint. Without any better thinking to consider my circumstances, my instincts took over and I began to run, but as soon as I moved my bad leg, I regretted it and toppled into the snow below me. Now on my face in a snowstorm and being alone as far as I knew, being stalked by something in the snowy forest, I rolled myself over after several tense moments and desperately surveyed my surroundings again. I needed to know if it was still there, and if so, if it was closer. I saw it, and I knew then that I wasn't just paranoid. I spotted a large, nearly hulking frame, a silhouette of some kind of person or animal skulking low in the cover of the trees of the mountainside, opposite our home. I watched it, this big shadow thing. It moved silently. The shadowy creature moved scarily fast in an impromptu serpentine pattern. It made its way through the countless trees in the most roundabout way toward our neighbor's fancy country home. This thing had my rapt attention until it decided to stop, then shift one side to the other as if thinking to investigate if it had its own observers. I knew at any moment it was going to look right at me. Inside my head, I was cursing myself, dozens of sailor's words no child my age should have known, before I began to scramble up the hill, making a mad dash for my house, the pain in my leg be damned. At that point, my stepfather and older brother came down from our back patio, worried that I had injured myself. They helped me back inside so I could recover and have some dinner but they never so much as glanced back at the mountain behind me at any point. Even after I tried to explain to them that there was some kind of monster, my rather ornery stepfather at the time dismissed it, saying, it's just a hiker, son. There's no such thing as monsters. This had always bothered me, always. I couldn't fathom someone choosing to wander about in a blizzard like that in the middle of the woods when they could be indoors near a hot side or heater. But that's just me. 
I love the snow, but I don't love the cold. The following story is another story from last year that suits this wintry theme of this episode. I hope you like it. Why I Won't Park in a Parking Garage Anymore From Anna G135135 Location, Western New York This happened back in January of 2017. At the time, I was 26 years old and eight months pregnant with my first child. I was going to one of my appointments to my OBGYN as I was required to go every week at this point. To help understand better, I live in a city in Western New York that has at least 100 inches of snow annually and it's used to having snowstorms in January and February of each year. I also suffered from hyperemesis gravitarum, which is known as severe morning sickness. I threw up almost every day of my pregnancy, up to eight times a day some days. I was required to be closely monitored by my doctor, and I needed to go weekly to visits in the last two months of my pregnancy. Usually I went with my husband or mother. However, this time, I had to leave work and go alone. My doctor's office is located downtown, near a busy area that borders doctor's offices and small buildings, as well as a few local dive bars. There was very little street parking available nearby, so instead I used the parking garage. There were four floors to it, half underground and half above, and the second floor from the ground has a bridge that connects the parking garage to the building where multiple doctor's offices were located. At this point in the day, there were about two to three inches of snow on the ground already, and even the parking garage had a bit of slush in it. And unfortunately, probably because of the snow, the parking garage was already full of vehicles. Even still, I tried to find a parking spot near the top. As I was driving around, I noticed a strange looking man standing near the staircase. He was scruffy looking, his hair was completely unkempt and his face was very dirty. I assumed he was homeless, since it's not uncommon to find them in parking garages in the city. By some miracle, I found a spot, so I parked my 2014 Corolla S Plus, a new vehicle at the time, which is important for the story later. Then I began to head toward the elevator nearby, which is situated next to the staircase where the man had been. I pushed the button and waited for the elevator to come. As I waited, I hear someone talking. Their words echoed through the garage as it was so large. I ignored it, thinking it was probably someone talking on their phone. Just standing at the elevator was making me much colder than I wanted to be. It was taking forever. So instead, I decided to endure the staircase. As I'm heading down from the fourth floor to the third, I spot the scruffy looking man. He sees me and begins to talk to me right away. Mm, yeah, uh, you need to be careful now. He says to me, never taking his eyes off of my pregnant belly. Feeling awkward and a little creeped out, I reply to him. I, yeah, thank you. I'm using the railing. I was assuming he was talking about the snow and slush inside the garage. Then he says to me, mm, you know, I love pretty pregnant women. They're the best kind of women to talk to. And that's when every single red flag I had went up. I quickened my pace while holding on to the railing and my bag but the man begins to follow me as I head down. He keeps asking me if he can walk me to the doctor's office and make sure I get my checkup because he doesn't want my pretty self to get hurt walking around. I quickly told him, no, no, thank you though, and head towards the bridge. I felt goosebumps all over me. This guy barely gave me a few inches to breathe. I could hear him behind me, extremely close, talking about escorting me and how it'd be his honor to do so. If I could just get across the bridge, it would lead me to a more populated lobby. 
Then out of nowhere, I feel a sharp pain on my arm. I look down and see his grubby, nasty fingers grabbing onto my arm, and he's squeezing tightly, hard enough to leave bruises. Then he mutters practically in my ear, you aren't being careful. You'll hurt the baby. I tried to pull my arm away, but he was stronger than me, and it hurt extremely bad when I did so. So I just yelled at him, let go of my arm. I practically hissed. I tried to pick up my pace as much as I could, but this far in the pregnancy, the weight and the nausea had greatly impacted my stamina. Luckily, at the end of the tunnel is a security desk. I finally reach it and find an older guard startled by my walking up and seeing this scruffy man next to me talking nonstop. He looks at me and then to the man, then asks me, is he bothering you, miss? I say yes, that I don't know this man and that he's been trying to escort me to the doctor's office, even though I don't need it. The man begins yelling that I need to be careful because the weather is getting worse and that I needed a guardian angel like him to watch over me. What the heck was wrong with this guy? The guard escorts him outside and I take it as my chance to head to the doctor's office and finally I'm calming down. I've been here regularly the past few months. I get to my OBGYN, finish up my hour long appointment and nervously head back out to the garage. It had started snowing again and many of the offices were shutting down since the lunch hour had arrived. Before I cross the bridge, I check in at the lobby and I don't see the security guard. I decided that I didn't have to have someone walk with me because I'm an independent pregnant woman with a sailor's mouth, but honestly, I wish he was there to escort me. I cross the bridge and I'm back in the garage. I'm alone in the garage so far. I walk over to the elevator, press the button and begin to wait. I was not about to go up the stairs this time. As usual, the elevator is slower than molasses. I swear it doesn't even work half the time. I'm waiting there, scrolling through my phone to pass the time, when I began to hear the talking again the same random mumbling echoing through the garage that I'd heard earlier. I hesitantly look to my right, and coming around the corner, about 50 feet away, is the scruffy man. He was hidden in a corner on the second floor where an SUV was parked. I couldn't have seen him coming out of the bridge, but I'd imagine he probably had a decent view looking through the vehicle windows to see me waiting at the elevator. I felt like prey. At this point, he's walking at a much faster pace, so I decide to forget the elevator. There's no time. I had to go up the stairs. The man is talking nonsense, and I'm freaking out, because as paranoid as I usually am, I never imagined a scenario of being this pregnant and in this slippery parking garage with snow and slush, trapped with some psycho of a man. I reach the third floor to glance back, and I see he has started up the stairs. Quickly, I continue up to the fourth floor. I reach the top and see my car in the distance. I'm about 15 feet away from my car when he makes the landing and starts to jog towards me. I move faster than I thought physically possible in that state. As I said before, my car is new meaning it has remote keyless entry and push button start. This vehicle specifically has it designed so that if I have my keys in my purse, I can put my hand on the driver's side door handle and that door will unlock only that door. No need to pull my keys out at all. But if I did that to the passenger side door, all the doors would unlock. So I get to my car as fast as possible and I have to circle around even quicker to the driver's side. I make it and I slam the door close and lock everything just to be sure. This man slams himself up against the passenger side door closest to him. He's banging at the window, screaming something that I can no longer hear, 
but I'm sure that it didn't even make sense in the first place. And I can hear him yanking at the door, trying to pull it open. I turn on my car and shift it into reverse. I yell at him to leave me alone. With the slush in the garage, there isn't much traction, so my car is barely moving along the unplowed garage. He's moving with the vehicle, continuing his rants and hitting my window. I start to move out to the fourth floor down to the third and able to get more traction. There's only one exit, and even though I don't have to pay for parking, I do have to submit a ticket into a machine to be able to exit the ramp. As I approach the exit, I no longer see the man, and there's no cars waiting ahead of me, so I pull up, put in my ticket, and take off putting plenty of distance between me and that psycho in the parking garage. I had to go back three more times before my son was born in February, but I went with someone each time after that, and I always refused to park in the garage again. I never encountered anyone else in my trips, but it still leaves a fear of parking garages deep inside of me. I'd rather have to walk further and find street parking than ever go back in that garage. So to the creepy parking garage guy, let's never meet again. A police case you won't hear about on TV or the internet. From Gordon, location, Gig Harbor, Washington. I worked as a police officer for a small town called Gig Harbor in the 80s. I'm in my 60s now, and as I have a bit too much free time on my hands these days, I wanted to get this experience off of my chest. This is a story you won't find on any newspaper. It's a cold case even still, as far as I know, and it's quite gruesome. Consider this your warning. I was called into work at around 5.30 one morning. The sun was just poking up over the horizon, and I was called out of a deep slumber. I took a quick shower, filled a thermos with coffee, then made my way to an apparent crime scene along a forest road near the harbor. It was about two or three miles from the shore, and it had begun snowing pretty hard. A blizzard would be rolling in that day, according to the report on the radio. When the other two police cruisers came into view down that old road, I slowed down as the chief himself waved me down. I pulled onto the side of the road with their cruisers, though there wasn't much room between the tree line and dirt road. Luckily, no one took that road, really, save for a couple of fishermen's families that only took this road around once a week. I got out of my cruiser and yawned before the chief started to fill me in. Right away, from the look on his face, I was nervous. That was an expression you didn't really see on the chief very often, and when you did, it was a very bad sign. He didn't really explain the situation, but rather gave me a warning, saying it would be best to prepare my stomach. I approached the small barricade they made with the police cruisers so that any passersby wouldn't see, at least not clearly. No matter what I did, I don't think I could have ever prepared for that scene. There were the remains of a couple that looked to be in their late twenties, one male, one female. They were staked to two separate trees upright with nails driven into their midsection. There were red puddles all over the ground. It was a disgusting and horrific scene, and I'll never forget it. We stayed on that case for a little over a year, and we never had so much as a lead on who did it. And what was more strange was we had no leads on who the victims were either. They had no identification on their bodies. The thumbprints and dental records turned nothing up, and not a single person we interviewed or interrogated knew them, or recognized them. It was the most disturbing case I ever had in that town, or in this country altogether. Believe it or not, it doesn't change the fact that it happened to that poor couple. 
and with no one ever paying for that crime, it means it could happen to any of you. Some very dangerous and startling things happen in this world. Snowstorm Nightmare from Jessica L. Location unknown. I only just passed my driving test about four months ago, and I was very proud of myself for doing so. I hated driving at night because I lived along the countryside and the roads around where I used to live were badly lit. They could be dangerous. About three or four weeks ago, it had been forecast that a snowstorm was expected, which was unusual for my country as it barely snowed here. My mom had been staying with a friend for a few nights before the heavy snow days came and she needed me to come pick her up. It was about eight o'clock at night and it was pretty much dark at the moment. I hesitantly agreed to pick her up and began driving over to my mom's friend's house. Unfortunately, the main road that I was planning to take was closed due to road construction so I had no other choice but to drive down those dangerous countryside roads that I hated driving down at night. Once I got to the countryside road that led straight to my mom's friend's house, it had surprisingly begun to snow heavily, but it was forecast to snow in the morning. I carried on driving down the road, a bit nervous, and the snow only got worse. At this point, I wanted to call my mom and tell her, that I would not be able to pick her up until the morning. Instead, however, I wasn't that far away, so I decided to carry on driving. This was a bad idea. I made it to the part of the road that was really badly lit, and all I could see were trees on either side of the road, with snow coming down in front of my car. I was happy that I had some form of light other than my headlights, because it made me feel a bit safer. That is, until I came across another car on the road. It was on the side of the road, with the emergency lights blinking. I pulled up beside the car and I rolled my window down. An elderly woman and a middle-aged man walked up to the window, and the man asked where the closest patrol station was. I gladly told him that the next patrol station was a good hour walk from there. I felt bad and offered to drive them so they could get some proper help, even if it would make me late picking up my mom. As I kept talking to the man, I looked at the elderly woman behind him, who didn't have a coat or jacket on to keep her warm. The man noticed that I was looking in her direction and bent down a little so that he was my height while I sat down. He had a serious yet creepy look on his face. I felt like at that moment that we had done enough talking and I needed to drive away. However, I didn't want to seem cruel and leave them there when the snow was getting worse. The man carried on talking, still at the same height as me, trying to block my view of the elderly woman. He came closer and was almost filling my whole window at that point. I could no longer see the elderly woman at all due to him blocking the window, and I tried to glance out the little gaps that the man didn't fill. Unfortunately, I couldn't see anything. The guy seemed to be getting fed up with me trying to look at the woman. Why he was getting so irritated, I don't know. There was something wrong with this situation. And when the man lunged at me through my window, grabbing at me with his large and calloused hands, while the elderly woman screamed behind him, I sped away, nearly sliding off of the now icy road and wrecking. Thankfully, I was able to get away the man's motionless figure soon disappearing in the falling snow, seen through my rearview mirror. My heart was pounding. I couldn't help but think that that scenario was a setup to lure someone like me into stopping. Once I made it to my mom's friend's place, I couldn't be happier to see my mother. I confided in her about my experience, after which she felt bad for not only making me drive in the unexpected blizzard, but also for putting me in that terrifying situation. Snowstorms and blizzards can be dangerous. If your news forecast is telling you one is coming, 
I would stay inside if I were you, and stay far away from the woods and roads. Not only might the temperature drop to a dangerous level, but your vision could be obscured, the thick snow blowing through the wind. Odds are you won't see them coming, the human and inhuman predators that wait just out of sight. So treat a snowstorm or blizzard with respect, or it could be the last thing you ever experience. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Don't forget, you can send us your stories at darknessprevails.org. Specifically, we're looking for scary dentist stories and terrifying experiences from delivery drivers. If you want to support this show, you can donate any amount at patreon.com slash darknessprevails. That unlocks ad-free MP3 downloads of future episodes, and you'll get your name in the credits at the end of our videos on YouTube for as long as you donate. Or you could get some creepy cool merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash darkness prevails, or just click that shop button below to start browsing now. Thank you. Now, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous video about six road trip horror stories. Leandro Hernandez says, finally first, now I get a free road trip with darkness. Sure thing, but the furthest we're going is to the gas station, cause I'm lazy. Wispryonic says, I'm right behind you. Well, I apologize, because that burrito hasn't been sitting well with me all morning. Brandon Maza says, I miss Glitch in the Matrix stories. Well, hey, you just reminded me of that theme, so now it should be a good time to put out another video on that topic. Thanks, Brandon. Sexy first name, by the way. Louise Phillips says, Been listening to your podcast. Now you've uploaded a new awesome video. Just keep in mind, Louise, my YouTube fans always get all the content and they get it early. Andrew Filkin says, Hi, darkness. Wonderful night for a drive. To McDonald's, am I right? But wait, their ice cream machine is always broken. We'll have to reschedule this night drive, Andrew. And Candace Perry says, People would go on road trips, but make sure you take a long nap. I'm not sure if you're telling people to fall asleep behind the wheel, which is hilarious and evil, or if you're trying to make sure people don't do that by sleeping beforehand. Either way, thanks, Candace. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. But don't get too worried, because more scary stories are coming soon, so stay tuned. In the meantime, here are the credits to my patrons who are amazing people. Remember, stay safe out there, and stay creepy, because this world is a strange one. Morning Snow Stalker from some random cat. I live in a small town in the mountains that's mostly popular and other people who enjoy sports in the snow. Other than that, there's nothing that really goes on here. I used to attend high school high up in the mountains. No idea why they decided to build it so high up out there. But there were rumors it used to be some sort of laboratory or something along those lines. But of course, I don't really have proof of that. As far as I know, no one does. My school being so high up meant walking there was a pain. You had to walk up a steep, empty street, surrounded with thick forests. This was about an hour walk for me. As often as I could, I would get my mom to drive me to school in the mornings. Only one day there was a huge snowfall, and my mom's little car couldn't make it up all the way. This meant I would have to walk up that mountain, in the snow, in the dark. As it was still around six when I started walking, I had to have a head start because the walk was already long. It would only take longer in the snow. So I started my hike up to the school, listening to that satisfying crunch of fresh snow under my feet. As I got deeper into the mountain, I began to feel more uncomfortable with my surroundings. Probably because I noticed I was completely alone, other than a lone car driving by every ten minutes or so. As I continued to listen to my footsteps, I noticed they were echoing, 
which was odd because they never did that before. I figured the crunching snow was causing enough sound to actually cause an echo. I continued to walk until I realized that the sound of that echo wasn't an echo at all. Rather, it was another pair of footsteps trying its best to hide behind my own. I stopped. I looked behind myself to see nothing there. I shrugged, hoping that it was just paranoia. When I began walking again, the echo was gone, only to begin again around a minute later. This really unsettled me. I again stopped to look behind me over my shoulder. But once more, there was nothing there. This pattern repeated about five more times. My confidence was almost entirely gone, and panic had replaced it. I had quickened my pace as much as I could. Any faster, and I'd probably just fall face first into the snow. Eventually, when I did look behind me again, I finally caught a glimpse of my stalker. They were way too tall. I only caught a glimpse of them before they hid behind a tree within the tree line. Seeing something that bizarre and extraordinary and realizing it's been following you for a while, it causes a deep kind of fear. I stood there frozen, staring at that tree for at least 10 minutes, waiting for that thing to come out, but completely unsure I even wanted to see it again. I then convinced myself that I had to run, even if I fell again and again. I turned around and bolted. I sprinted the remaining half hour, not daring to look back. That echo continued from the tree line all the way until I got to the lit portion in front of my school. And when I made it to school, it had been canceled due to the snow. Thankfully, this time, I was able to get a ride down to my house with a friend. After this incident, I refused to walk up the mountain alone ever again. A Horrifying Sight from Jory B. This happened when I was 13 years old. I was with my older brother and my father, playing with my dog in an empty parking lot at around 11 p.m. It was at an old church in Alberta, and it was snowing pretty hard outside. We walked our dog around here quite often, and used the empty lot to just sort of hang out in, and let the dog get some exercise. At that moment, we were running from the dog, trying to get him to chase us, so we could get out all of his energy before we headed back home. It was a dumb little game, but I was pretty slow. To be forward, I'm short. When I ran to the other side of the church to around the front entrance, waiting for my dog to continue running up to me, he never did. I was confused, so I looked around the corner of the building to see where my dog was, but he was just standing there, frozen in place. When he began to angrily growl and bark, he scared me a little bit. I had no idea why he was so mad or scared. That lasted for a few seconds until his sounds turned into whimpers. Then he ran off to find my dad. I was definitely freaked out back there. I was about to start walking back to dad too when I heard something like a growl coming from behind me. I was horrified, and I turned around to see what it was, only to be petrified to the spot. There was a humanoid figure standing there, but its features told me that it was no man. The dark figure was about seven feet tall. It had a large snout and legs that were inverted. Its back was heavily arched, with vertebrae popping up under the skin in a grotesque manner. And even weirder yet, it appeared to be wearing some sort of thin, weird cloth-looking material over its body. It didn't look like human clothes, per se, but more like skinned hide. My dad must have seen me frozen there, so he called my name and started walking towards me. 
the creature noticed his shadow approaching and began to scurry away toward the alley. My dad saw how distressed I was. He asked me what was wrong. I didn't hold back. I explained everything to him, but he laughed at me, telling me to grow up and that it was probably a deer. I said, fine, whatever. But as he was walking back to my brother, I glanced back to the alleyway and I saw it staring at me. I called for my dad to prove to him that it was still there. But by the time I got his attention, the creature was gone once more. Back in the lot, we started to play some catch with a baseball until we all heard this loud bang like a hammer hitting metal doors. It came from the back of the church. My brother was curious, so he walked around the church to see what it was, but I was too scared to go back there. And now I was scared for my brother. Luckily, he came back, having seen nothing around the area. But my eyes were darting around. I was paranoid. When I heard the snap of a twig, I glanced over to a small bundle of trees near the tiny metal fence, and there it was again, just watching me. For what purpose, I have no idea. I screamed for my brother and my dad. They ran over quickly enough this time to finally see the creature walking away. They believed me, so we went home immediately. To this day, I have not seen it again, but this moment will never escape my memory. Encounter with a Phantasm From Kim a Pseudonym I'm a private investigator living in the South. When people learn that about myself, it's usually met with a certain amount of interest, given that TV has cast private investigators in a very intriguing light. In reality, our lives are usually mundane. More unremarkable vehicles and peeing in bottles than Ferraris and beaches. I haven't seen too many noteworthy or exciting things in my line of work. I've been rushed by a few dogs, harassed by mentally unstable people, and busted plenty of times by an intended subject. But all in all, it's steady, boring work. But I do have one story that, for fear of sounding sensational, changed my life. It was January, a month that falls into what myself and my partners know as the dregs of the slow season. When I got the call to work a fairly easy assignment, about an hour and a half away from my home, I was pleased to have it. The assignment was just that, scraps. It was for a gypped and angry car lot owner who had spent way too much time and patience attempting to locate a woman who he believed had skipped town in a less than paid off SUV. She's gotta be in that area. That's where the GPS last hit before it died, I was told. It wasn't scandalous high profile work, but I was happy to have it. Snow began to fall as I loaded up my equipment bag into the car, stocked with spare camera batteries, snacks, and the like. I kissed my husband goodbye, zipped up my jacket, then plugged in a random address that fell within the last known latitude-longitude coordinates the client had provided from the last ping on the car's GPS. After nearly two hours of sipping coffee and half-heartedly dialing my radio back and forth, the channels crackled weakly as I drove further and further away from modern civilization and into sprawling pastures of the rural back country. Finally, I found myself within the target area. Houses slowly became fewer and further apart as I approached a long stretch of road. The roadway looked gloomy in the haze of the afternoon winter, its length dipped and craned painfully on for what seemed like miles through farmland. I knew as I proceeded down it, slowly, that it would be a difficult area to set up in. I observed the sides of the road, devoid of any shoulders and yielding abruptly from pavement to mucky, snow-soaked ditches. I quickly dismissed the idea of just pulling off into the grass. 
I checked my phone and saw that I had no signal too. This would be a terrible area to get stuck in with no reception, given that I'd seen no houses for miles and the snow only fell heavier by the hour. Turning around carefully, I drove back towards where I'd come from until a single faint bar appeared in the corner of my cell phone screen. Using the weak signal, I consulted my map and deduced that the long, desolate road I'd come from connected two main highways, and I guessed that the SUV I was looking for was sure to be using it as a throughway. Satisfied, but not convinced, I said goodbye to the idea of mindlessly browsing Facebook all evening and headed back to the area. The sleet sloshed beneath my tires as I slowed down outside of a small ranch-style home. It was a little ways off the road at the end of a gravel drive. The house was somber, but looked charming with fresh snow settling on its worn roof. I approached the house, the boards of the porch stoop moaning under my boots. I knocked carefully and smiled immediately so as to appear non-threatening to whomever answered the door. The latch on the other side of the door fell, and shortly after, the door opened. To my surprise, instead of being hit with the contrasting warm air of a home, I was enveloped by a musty, cool draft that seemed to belch up from deep inside the house. Inside the doorway stood a man I gauged to be in his 80s, his eyes were brown and sad, his face weathered, his wrinkles sat deep into his face as if he'd been carved out of the red clay soil that rested just inches below the snow outside. Even though he did not stand taller than myself, he still seemed to look down on me, his broad frame occupying most of the doorway. I smiled wider now as if to prompt his own sober countenance to do so but it didn't. Awkwardly, I spoke. I hate to bother you, but I've come all this way to look for a car I believe is in the area. I was wondering if you'd be okay with me sitting at the end of your driveway for a little while to keep a lookout. I had almost made an art out of playing up my innocent woman status for my own advantage, and I'd be lying if I said that wasn't what I was doing in the moment. He didn't answer right away. He looked at me, studying me, his face never warming and only serving to wear me down with silence. For a moment, I felt my damsel facade had finally fallen on unwilling ears. I prepared myself for swift denial, but he just stood there. That's when I took note of his clothing. A plaid shirt tucked into tan slacks ended in slick black dress shoes hardly what I'd expect a gentleman of his age to be wearing in this weather, especially since his home didn't seem to be much warmer than the air outside. He clinched a blue wooden pipe between his teeth, chewing the tip thoughtfully. He looked terribly faint, almost jaundice, as if my palm might pass right through him if I offered him my hand to shake. Just at that moment, he seemed satisfied with how long he'd studied me, and perhaps deciding I wasn't a threat or trouble, he looked past me to my car, back down to me, then nodded his head in approval. I thanked him, and I was eager to retreat back to my warm car. Crunching snow and gravel beneath my tires, I caught one last look of his door shutting before I found an unimposing spot near the end of the driveway and began my surveillance. As a woman in this line of work, I've come to be aware of my own environment. It's not my nature and only came out of habit. I often look into my rear and side view mirrors to check my surroundings. Doing so, I took note of the man's house. It was dark. Even as the sun began to set and darkness creeped into the valley, I never noticed any interior lights in the home. I suspected he may be entirely frugal, keeping as few lights on as possible. That also explained why his home would be so cold. I smirked, remembering how my own father would keep a watchful eye on the thermostat, 
so as to prevent us kids who refuse to put sweaters on from tinkering with the dial. Having seen only two sedans in the hours since I had arrived, I finally phoned it in and began my trek home. The next week passed by and I once again loaded up my car for another assignment, about an hour north of the man's home. I couldn't shake how sad he looked and wondered whether or not he had anyone to care for him. His absent demeanor and sad, faraway eyes still occupied my mind every now and then. I scratched out a thank you note, bought a box of cookies, and decided I'd leave a little earlier so I could stop by and deliver them to him. I felt compelled to show my appreciation for him letting me, a complete stranger, take refuge on his property to do some scummy repo spotting work. By this time, the snow had melted, and the roads were far more formidable, albeit cold and damp. I made the familiar turn off the lonely stretch of road and slowly crunched down the driveway. To my surprise, I found a new car parked near the home, as well as two utility trucks. A woman stood outside, speaking with a man who donned a tool belt and boots, making it easy to surmise his occupation. The woman motioned toward the house, speaking with her hands, and a worker appeared to consider whatever it was she was saying. She looked on at me, trying to place who I was as I stepped out. Calling out a greeting, I approached, the letter and cookies tucked under my arm. I explained who I was and how I was just wanting to say thank you to the man that lived here for his generosity, explaining that I would not have been able to do my job if not for him. I felt a twinge of embarrassment when I realized that I'd never gotten the man's name. This woman studied me with the same eyes as the old man had, only hers were livelier and more skeptical. She told me in an almost accusatory tone that nobody should have been there and that she had only just come up from the north to begin renovating the home to sell. She looked to the contractors with slight annoyance, to which they both denied being responsible without actually being asked any questions. She looked back to me and explained that her father built the home in 1942 and lived there up until his death four years ago, leaving the house unoccupied ever since. She felt completely violated that someone had been squatting in her childhood home. I apologized out of sympathy while stifling my own fear and bewilderment that I may have been speaking to a crazed man who was eyeing me, possibly deciding whether or not to do God knows what. She seemed reluctant to go on, so I offered up some feigned interest in the home's history in an effort to help her regain some of the autonomy she seemed to lose in light of finding out about the break-in. She walked me around the perimeter, telling me about an old sand pit she played in as a child and how she planned on making it into a garden. She continued through the tour, explaining how she planned to repurpose and restore certain things. The memories seemed to warm her from the inside out, as if I began to disappear while she reminisced. I opened up the box of cookies and offered them to her. I got one out and bit into it. I laughed as I offered her one. Here, that old crazy doesn't deserve these. She forced a half-genuine laugh and took a cookie. She then reached into her back jean pocket and pulled out an iPhone. She switched over to the gallery, opening an album of photos she had taken of old Polaroid pictures of the home and its former glory. She swiped as she explained each and pointed out their original locations. A photo of her as a child sitting in her sand pit with an old family dog named Baba. A large knockout rosebush that had stood near the entrance years ago, which had been her mother's pride and joy, and she'd spend hours each week pampering it. She swiped through more photos. An old pickup truck her mother holding her infant brother on the stoop that had previously moaned under my boots, a chicken coop surrounded by heritage chickens, and finally, a photo of her father. 
a broad, weathered man clutching a pipe in his teeth, grinning at the camera, wearing a plaid shirt tucked into tan pants, ending in slick black dress shoes. The Shadow Man Below, from Wicca Boo. As a little girl, I grew up in the backwoods of eastern Pennsylvania. All of my memories of the sticks are terrifying, but my most horrifyingly memorable experience. But this is my most horrifyingly memorable experience. Around the ages of 13 or 14, my best friend's house was always where I stayed. I spent years practically living in her little trailer for the entire summer. I remember winter that year was rough, and we got around six inches of snow during winter break. Of course, I was determined to spend the time off of school at my friend's place, so it wasn't surprising when I ended up stuck for a few days due to the amount of ice and snow covering the roads. The cold weather made for a day of cozy hot chocolate, movies, crafting, and the most important part, a wood-burning furnace. Me and my friend had just finished making some crafts. Night had begun to fall onto the sky. The trailer had around seven rooms. A bathroom, four bedrooms, a kitchen, and an extension they built into the back, which served as the living room. The room faced the woods that stretched for miles of untouched land which I knew because we frequently found ourselves exploring it. The extension had a couch, furnace, TV, stand, a chair, two glass sliding doors that pulled out onto a small deck where her dad kept the logs and her cats sat delicately as they ate. Beyond the porch and out of view of the glass doors by just a tad was her father's workshop where he often spent his days and nights, only coming inside to add another log on the flame. My friend and I spent a lot of time in the room because her bedroom was small and the couch in the extension could fold into a full-sized bed. We kept blankets inside the couch, so when it rolled out, we could immediately fall asleep. And with it being a freezing winter night, we passed out under many covers across from the burning wood stove. I found myself hazily awakened by the cold of the door opening as her father walked into the room illuminated by the light of the TV, which my friend finds necessary to fall asleep to. Not until he began walking across the floor did I realize that I was beginning to float. I could see my own body lying on my side, next to my friend. I knew that it was impossible to be awake because I could see myself sleeping. I stopped at the ceiling above the TV. I could smell the wood-burning smell, and see the sparks as her dad laid another few logs on the fire. The small bits of snow boot prints melted on the carpet before he stopped to say goodnight to our sleeping figures, then slid the door over to go back out into the shed for a night of work. I watched our still bodies and the fire crackling for what felt like an hour before my eyes shifted to new movement. The sight of something sliding into view of the glass doors from the side of the bed caught my gaze. The figure could only be described as a black mass like a shadow. Despite the vivid colors of the TV light that danced across the glass reflecting back, the figure was void of light. Somehow it looked like the spot sucked all the rays into a total darkness like a black hole that only existed there at one spot and one shape. It was a few minutes of complete silence as I stared at this mass before a shape began to appear, a hand sliding into my line of sight and moving the handle to the sliding door. A slow jerky movement turned the handle and a creak sounded across the walls as the door slid along its frame and cracked far enough open for the darkness to slide through. The familiar cold climate greeted me as my body below my eyes shivered under the covers. The creature had to duck down and bend in order to fit into the glass doorframe, which was well below the height of a person. Only as it moved past the reflecting glass did the mass begin to portray the figure 
of a man. The shape was similar to a human, still devoid of features, entirely black, and even the color in the room seemed to have been absorbed into the void of its body. The thing walked unsteadily, as if it was unable to control its body, like a man with slinkies as feet. With each step, its length seemed to stretch and bend, like it was unable to control the way it portioned itself out. It bent back and forth, closer and further, with every inch closer it stopped. I was soon able to see what appeared to be the dark shadow of a hat upon its head, which rocked back and forth. The figure abruptly stopped and vibrated as it straightened out and reached the edge of the bed, where I lay closest to the doors. He bent rigidly in the middle, but the segments of his body stayed perfectly straight. As he lowered the top part of his frame to face directly down, face to face, with my closed, sleeping eyes, the dark hand jerkily pulled up, as if it was shielding its face, which was non-existent, from the TV light to look at my features better. And just like that, it stayed for another hour, perhaps. I could see myself shaking below. It was as if my subconscious knew that this mass inflicted pure terror and stillness into my body, and yet I could do nothing but watch myself cold and shaking. I had no hands to pinch myself awake from this nightmare. All I could do was watch as this thing stared, not so much breathing or moving. It was just observing me silently in the night. I was confused and horrified how any of this could be real. It was insane, unrealistic. All of a sudden, the creature straightened and hurriedly stumbled toward the door. The frame moved, opened, and closed as he slid sideways out of view of the porch door. A slam echoed outside as the workshop door opened. Familiar bootsteps walked onto the porch, stepping in the ghosts of where the creature's feet had stepped. The sound of boots marched to the door, and then inside. My friend's dad, unbothered, went over to add another log to the wood stove. He left the room after completing his task, then headed toward his room to sleep the rest of the night. I watched as the familiar scene calmed my sleeping face, the snow once again melting into boot prints on the floor realizing that that thing had never left a mark in or on the carpet. I floated there for hours as the daylight lit the room, and the darkness faded before I slid back into my body below to wake. I set up in astonishment at how vivid my dream had been, as my friend was stirred awake. She said she had a terrible dream a few nights back, and she knew from my face that I may have seen the same thing too. My friend spoke of a man who peered out of her closet and was gone when she woke to check it out. I was baffled by this entire experience, but I've never had sleep paralysis like this before or after, and a mutual friend of ours had claimed to see the same shadow man in that very same friend's house. I know it seems crazy, but I'm convinced that that house, the extension that was built onto it, it rests somewhere it's not supposed to be. The creature was more than just an energy. It was full of dread and malice, filling me with dread as well. I just know that it didn't want me there. It's been many years since I've been to that house, and I don't talk to that friend as much anymore. I can only wonder if it ever came back. Wolf Thing From MM19 I live in Minnesota, and this past winter something weird happened to me. I never had anything paranormal or weird happen to me before, so this still has me in a bit of shock. One day after a big blizzard hit, I decided to go out and take my snowmobile out I was at least five miles away from my house, riding around in the fields. I began to notice a trail of blood in the snow. I didn't think too much on it. Coyotes were common around here, 
and they could have possibly been injured or had some prey. But then I saw where the blood was coming from. I found them, three dead coyotes, all torn apart. I'd never seen anything so gruesome in my life. In the distance, I heard a stick snap, and in that moment, I felt pure dread. I kept looking around to see what had made the noise, but I didn't see it at first. Not until I turned back to look straight in front of me, I saw the biggest black wolf with orangish yellow eyes at least a hundred feet away from me. I was already filled with terror, facing a predator that could quickly tear me apart like it had those coyotes. But then, something bizarre happened. The creature stood on two legs and howled. I was astounded. It went back to all fours, then ran towards me. I snapped back to reality. I pushed my snowbill throttle all the way and flew out of there as fast as I could. I made it home, alive, but a little disturbed. That night, I could not fall asleep. Because instead of the usual coyote screams and howls, that night was filled with one singular, lone, and deep howl, one that I had heard earlier that day, and it was coming from right next to the house. Luckily, I've never seen it again, and I couldn't be more thankful for that fact. <laughs>